Here we go then, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome along if you are listening and watching on the live stream. It's time for the Miata Trophy Super Pole session. We got 10 of the fastest drivers in the country ready to decide their grid spots for the action later on today. We are at Donington Park. We're on the national circuit, which is 1.9 miles long. That is 3.1 kilometers if you want to use your other metrics. We've got 10 corners. The most taxing ones go to the right and a lot of elevation change involved it as well. All the corners, iconic names. We're talking Redgate, Craner Curves, the Old Hairpin, McLean's, Cops, and of course, the Roberts Chicane. Fantastic action. Your drivers competing in this session go as follows. Steve Kite was quickest in the earlier qualifying session, but of course that all means naught now, ahead of John Langridge and Declan Lee. Alex Miller was fourth before you meet Daniel Perrin-Smith and Simon Fleet. Then you'll find Nicholas Stolt, Colin Wells, Alex Wilkinson Hughes and the final contender, Roan Lundy, out on circuit. This one should be very, very fun. The other factor, on top of everything else they normally contend with, is the weather. We've had showers coming in. We've got very, very high crosswinds, which in a very light Miata will be tricky to contend with. My name is Tom Davis. I'm joined in the commentary box by the fantastic Andy Webster. Andy, I don't know about you, but I'm very much looking forward to this. If we weren't looking forward to it before the pre-qualifying that went uh, went down a, f a few uh, a few moments uh, prior to this, then we certainly are now um, the uh, the gaps in, in particular were something um, in, across the in the top three were separated by less than three hundredths that's right three hundredths of a second between Steve Kite John Langridge and Declan Lee with Alex Miller and Dan Parent Smith um, very close to one another as well uh, fighting over that fourth position so um, if we if, if that's anything to go by now that the track is a little bit further spread out uh, for the for the drivers they will have a uh, better opportunity to, to find some space then Frankly, I think we're on for a, a real winner here in Super Bowl. The big surprise in the earlier qualifying session, you'll notice in the names not competing in Super Bowl, Liam Cochran. He sits in the top three in the championship. He could only fight 19th of 21 in qualifying, which means we will not see him out on circuit. He's got a lot of work to do come the later races. You top two in the championship, however, they're separated by two points. It's John Langridge ahead of Declan Lee. They're both in the session. They were separated by nine thousandths of a second in the initial session before second and third spots. It's all on the line. John was talking earlier to his team saying he thinks it's going to be a difficult weekend. He's not sure if he's got the pace. I think it's safe to say that 200s off of provisional pole earlier, I think John Langridge has the pace to compete. I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. And uh, they had a, uh, it wasn't just a, a battle on the timing sheets um, in Anglesey either. Language and Lee just wowed us with the most incredible display of, uh, of, cra of, of race craft between the two of them. Some nail biting racing. So if you do get the opportunity later on to re watch those, uh, those races from Anglesey, then do so. Uh, I won't spoil it for you, but um, they come into this race with honours even. And uh, that rivalry will continue. Um, it, so far, they've kept it um, very, very clean and uh, very, um, very sporting to this point. Declan Lee, though, has managed to get himself to the front of the uh, front of the queue here on the Melbourne Loop, heading towards to start. So he has ensured, Tom, that he's got a clear track right from the very first moments of this only 10 minute Super Pole session. It's an interesting decision as to where you want to be in the queue here because the track conditions when they went out for the first session, it just rained, it was drying. As you catch the instance now, it's just rained, it's drying, but of course it's inevitably going to be different. The track is greasy, it's a little bit damp off of line, but on line, I reckon you could push as hard as the car would allow you in the dry, actually, with the potential exception of the entrance to McLean's where the rear is always trying to let go. These drivers pull themselves into pit lane to prepare for this one. And before you know it, we'll have Super Pole underway. I don't know about you, but I'm, I cannot wait for this. I think it's going to be incredibly close. Expect two, three cars, maybe even four or five, separated by a tenth of a second? I think I think there's, that's definitely a, a possibility. Um, the weather is going to play a little bit of a mix. That crosswind going into the Craner Curves is going to make it 
what is already a tremendously challenging section of the racetrack, even more so. Um, we may see uh, throughout the course of today uh, cars both on the left and the right infield sections of the Craner curves, uh, and they've got some uh, you know fresh gravel um, that they might uh, might want to try and avoid exploring. Uh, a car went in there sideways um, yesterday in testing, so uh, it, uh, it is it is perilous out there. Um, it is a, a real challenge this racetrack, and it's just been made all the more so by the conditions today. Um, but yes, this is the inaugural season of the Miata Trophy. There was, there were, we did have an MX-5 uh, uh, Cup happening um, in the uh, in the similar track day series um, last year, uh, but they've actually inaugurated the, the Miata Trophy. And I know uh, from experience that these drivers, they would love to be the first Miata Trophy champion. They would indeed still they line up at the uh, end of pit lane. There's a little bit of uh, almost, <laughs> almost parading going on, trying to make sure that everybody's in position. The pictures you've got on the screen, if you're following along on this live stream, show just how hilly this circuit is. There is never a flat point. At the moment, you're looking at the pitch straight. Notice how there's a crest there. It looks relatively flat to us from our commentary box. It looks relatively flat to everybody else. When you're driving it, you notice that as we've got the first driver out on circuit to attempt a super pole lap. Uh, out comes uh, Dan Parent smith then first in the queue, and they've actually been reordered. Uh, they were instructed that way, uh, and I think that might be, is that Alex Miller um, in, the, in the number seven uh, entry? Um, who is out there. It is Alex Miller, who's second in the queue. Uh, Declan Lee, despite getting himself to the front of the queue on the uh, Melbourne Loop and, uh, and sitting in the rain in, in preparation for this, had to wait until third uh, spot. But um, they are guaranteeing space on the racetrack, and this is the fairest possible way to organise the cars, as Dan Parent smith already up towards McLean's. The countdown begins then. We have already passed an extra minute of this session. It's almost nine left to go as your overall sort of on-track leader, the number seven of Alex Miller, heads himself up towards the top of the circuit. And looks a little bit slidey, it must be said. Hooked up the curb. The car underneath just complained a little bit. Now, there wasn't a snap of the rear, but generally we saw pivoting around the middle point, which is almost uncharacteristic of a Mazda, but in the wet, showing that it just doesn't want to stick to the surface. The tail will come out on these Mazdas. Um, they have a perfect 50-50 weight distribution um, uh, when they leave the factory. But I was talking with uh, Ray Worley uh, yesterday, and he was saying that once they've done race prepping these cars, they basically uh, upset the balance of, uh, of that perfect 50-50 because they've stripped all the interior uh, equipment out, of course, as well. And Dan Parent smith then going into Redgate for the first time. He is indeed ready. Red gate slightly tighter than you would expect oh. already. That's John Langridge, championship leader, is off the road at Coppice, it must be said. So he's gone in far too deep on that one. There'll be yellow flags out there. There's a chance we need to pause the session because he looks well and truly stranded on the... Yeah. Oh, it's almost the entrance to Coppice there. That is a very, very bizarre one for John Langridge. Still laps happening then. Alex Miller is on his way down towards the old hairpin. A lot of lean on the front end of these cars, but grips up well, gets himself turned in, and carries the momentum through to the bottom of the hill. Yeah, and he's gone in forwards, um, and I know that these cars um, don't particularly like once race prep going into reverse. <laughs> they've been uh, they've been pushed around in reverse by um, by the mechanics um, earlier on uh, throughout the course of this weekend. So um, Dan Parent Smith is going to come upon this accident, and I'm sure it will be yellow flagged. It's actually been red flagged the session, red flagged. Um, so hopefully these drivers will get one shot um, to to try again. Uh, but it's worth noting actually that John language went off on a uh, warm-up lap. This was not uh, his flyer, I believe. Um, I don't think he'd actually started it uh, at that point. So uh, unfortunate for John, um, but hopefully we can get um, at least nine of our cars ready to uh, perform here in Super Bowl. Uh, but we shall see as uh, they are having to inspect the tow hook uh, uh, option here on the car to, uh, to pull it free of, uh, of the gravel trap. Here comes the big green lifting machine, actually, so hopefully this gets towed, but it doesn't look too great. It's a very, very odd place to end up that, because normally, if you go off there, it's either catastrophic because you've had a brake failure, or you find yourself a lot further around the corner because you actually got on the power a bit too early. It's not a huge braking zone. You've only just navigated McLean's. You've not had a chance to pick up much speed, and then you're slowing down again for Coppice. Unfortunately, it is going to be the toe for John Langridge. Rear wheels are moving, so it's not seized up. 
There's a chance this is just driver error, but it is a very unusual one, particularly from a championship leader. Yeah, we have no information at this stage, of course, um, as to whether there was a mechanical on the cart, uh, but he did seem to go straight in. Um, he wasn't sort of pitched sideways, uh, so um, either he felt it go and decided that going straight was the, the, the best way of, uh, of dealing with it, um, but a bit of a clear-up job as well will need to happen um, because these Mazdas do collect quite a lot of gravel uh, in the under tray and uh, 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 apparently also in the steering linkage, which is, uh, is, the, is the most critical part. So uh, down on your hands and knees and uh, poking, a, steering, uh, poking a, a screwdriver around to try and clear all of these sh small sharp stones from causing any mischief later on. In come the rest of the drivers then. That black car with the bright orange sponsorship is Steve Kite. He's another one we're expecting to see right up there. He was quickest of anybody in pole and uh, qualifying earlier rather. But of course that means absolutely nothing now <laughs> as they reset. The big issue for John Langridge is I'm not sure he'll be allowed to go again here because he caused the stoppage. So as such, he could find himself starting from 10th. We'll wait for confirmation of that. It does change from series to series, but it could be a very, very bad day for John Langridge, who's actually coming back to the pits under his own power yeah, now. Which is good news. It could, might have just been a front lockup. Couldn't get it turned in. How bizarre for a man of John Langridge's experience. He's been racing Mazda MX-5s for a long, long time as John. So that would be very unusual. Actually, there's something um, not quite right with the front right there. I, I, it might just be dirt on the tyres, um, but it did look like it might be something slightly awry. He's, uh, he's not exactly crabbing around particularly, and he's driven through towards the pit lane, uh, to, towards the queue at the end of the pit lane. Uh, he's passed his, um, his garage, which is quite near to our position um, here in the, um, in the, I think, around sort of uh, garage four to six. But no, he is going to go, he's lining up uh, uh, side by side with the other drivers. So it looks like he's going to be allowed to go, which he'll be very, very relieved about. There was a thumbs up from his team member as he came past, and I reckon that was the thumbs up, go and give it a go. Yeah. Marshalls are trying to show him to the right place in the queue, but he's now being pointed off towards the paddock, I fear. So John Langridge, he's very slow in heading off the circuit, actually. He obviously doesn't want to go that way, but he is headed towards the paddock area. I don't think we'll see John Langridge again. Of course, this isn't like the end of the world. He's not going to start from the back of the grid. It's still a top 10 start, namely 10th. But he'll have been hoping for pole because he was on the pace this morning. Yeah, two hundredths of a second away in the earlier session, so that has got to hurt. But I'm sure he will. Um, he, I'm sure he'll recover and move forward and uh, hope for a good uh, first race, but an even better second race. As Dan Brown Smith leaves the pit lane, we have a green flag for our drivers to begin, and the uh, time gaps start to open up once again. And the second driver is released, and uh, that's Alex Miller. So. Parent Smith and Miller, and then I think it's Declan Lee in that order. I'm not quite sure what has decided the order um, of the of the Super Bowl because it's um, it's not race order, uh, it's not qualifying order that, that we can see, and it's not championship order, Tom. So uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what how those decisions have been made. I believe, off the top of my head, it could be a random order actually. Okay. So <laughs> in amongst it all, that makes sense as to why we can make some sort of trend out of it. The session did get reset to the full 10 minutes as oh. well, notably. So, of course, a minute or so of that is chopped away whilst the drivers made their way out of pit lane. So in nine minutes, we have a full session. This is Alex Miller on his way towards McLean's. If we stay with this shot, you'll see exactly what happened to John Langridge, potentially, is that he did exactly what Alex is doing right now, made his way up this crest, and then potentially front lock up over the top of the hill, because if it was the rear, it would try and come round on you. So didn't get it stopped, found himself into the gravel very, very early on, having not even set a lap. Starting to wonder whether maybe he caught the inside curb. Possibly. Uh, and, and, and sent the car up into the air, um, because uh, clearly, he didn't suffer too much. Now, this is one of the NA class, the uh, the Mark One. Uh, we only have one in the field, and that they've been um, they, they they pick up their uh, their, their times uh, very. Um, very, very close to the NC, but they are in a different class of racing. So we can see then it's Parent Smith at the um, in, uh, in front on the circuit, uh, but he's showing a second at the moment. They haven't actually set times yet, though. So um, this is these this is the, the first laps, first flying laps now underway. And they'll be hoping we can uh, get round and at least get one lap in for this Super Pole as Alex Miller uh, takes the car downhill. 
Here we go then, a lap of Donington at flying speed. Navigate yourself and almost brave out the craner curves. Get the front end in to the old hairpin. And it's then the rear that tries to let go on you, which of course you don't want to do because you want to plant your foot. This right here is Mr. Kite. Right? Oh, no, it's not. It's Declan, it's Declan Lee. Lee. Yep. I do apologize. It's Declan Lee who's out there. He is trying to get on with it. He is right up there in the championship, and this presents a golden opportunity for him with John Langridge no longer partaking in the session. Yeah, um, he would. Uh, he will. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Declan Lee will will miss having uh, John Langridge around him after uh, the significant challenge they put each other through in Anglesey. But uh, for the sake of the championship, it's it's very very strong opportunity here for Declan Lee. Um, so as they go around, then that's the number 94, um, which is Liam Cochran. Um, sorry, yes, Liam Cochran. The reason that uh, he is in Super Bowl is because he's an NA class. Uh, uh, so he gets to partake in this. As Dan Parron Smith, 125.391, sets the first flying lap. Alex Miller goes a little bit quicker, a 25.186. Next up, Declan Lee, uh, championship contender right now. And he crosses the line and sets a 124.274, much faster. Tremendous uh, early lap there from Declan Lee. Nine tenths of a second faster than uh, Miller as Kite goes in to second place. Only two tenths of a second away on a 24.461, Tom. Parent Smith has a lot of work to do, it should be said. He is almost a second away from provisional pole, and he's currently on a cool lap. He'll get the chance to go again. Up to the line comes Liam Cochran in the NA class. Of course, we were expecting that to be slower, but I suppose he's leading his class in <laughs> fifth overall as the only driver in the class to have crossed the line thus far. That's right, exactly. So as we go through then, Cochran um, will start ahead of Langridge, um, and then it's Lee Kite, Miller, Parent Smith, uh, Cochrane and of course Langridge who will not set a time I don't believe um, unless they only deny him um, his first flyer but uh, it looks like he's been sent round to, to the garage uh, after causing that stoppage so that's why we're a little bit um, uh, in a low at the moment because the, uh, the drivers as you say cooling down to, to get ready to push again with five and a half minutes remaining of Super Bowl. That is the 72. That is Steve Kite. He was looking very quick earlier on. He actually has a couple of tenths to find before he's on par with Declan Lee overall. Loving the Ukrainian flag in the windscreen as well, making it clear where he stands with respect to all of that. And before you know it, he's coming round to the back straight. Now, the question of tyres is always an interesting one because there will be a peak performance window. You're trying to get them in that in one build lap before you go for a super pole lap, which is very, very difficult to do. It's almost the opposite of what you want from your car come the race, because come the race, you want it to heat the tires up slowly, make sure they stay in the correct window, but right here, you need to punch them out the pits to yep. obtain that maximum grip. And they are the same set of tires, of course, yes. as well. So um, you, you're actually, uh, what, you, what you steal from your tires in qualifying, will hurt you in the race to a certain uh, to a certain extent of course they're very hard compounds um, but they that does um, that does play into the into the the, cost, the constant um, balance between uh, risk and reward and how much you want to claim that that start position versus uh, how you want to um, try and, uh, and race forward as well so yes as you say very different skills to get the, the one fast lap out of the same set of tires that you need a whole race duration out of later on these drivers will file back around. I notice Parron Smith has taken a, a bit more of a roundabout route. He actually didn't head to the bottom of pit lane, he headed into his garage straight away. So we'll have a, a little bit of organizing to do on that front. But provisionally, your times look like this. It's Declan Lee ahead of Steve Kite as your front row, with Miller ahead of Parron Smith as your second row. And then you'll find Cochrane and eventually Langridge has your fifth and sixth place cars right now. We've still got four minutes or so left on the session, but that's that's that. It looks like that's that. Yes, indeed, the cars have been sent round, so it looks like you get one flyer. Um, and um, so, yes, it's it's uh, it's not going to get any quicker. It it would seem. So that is your provisional um, top five. Well, top six, I suppose, in total, but normally it would be top five from each class, of, of which we only have one in the uh, in the NA. The the guest cars don't don't qualify, but as you can see, a 124.274 for Declan Lee for Hills Motorsport, um, who uh, is currently second in the championship, but only uh, by the uh, two points from uh, from John Langridge himself. And Steve Kite is second um, on a 124.461. Uh, then next comes Miller, Alex Miller on a 120. 
125.186 and Dan Parron Smith on a 125.391 who's actually over a second away from provisional pole despite the fact that during qualifying uh, pre-qualifying earlier on um, they were much closer uh, so it's all about um, how much how, how hard you want to push on that flying lap and how quickly you can get those tires to, to activate for you. Now then, if you are listening along and watching along on the live stream, we're going to leave you for just a moment because we have one more qualifying session to cover, which you won't get to watch. But we'll be back at 1 p.m. for the BSRC Super Series. If you've not seen Supercarts before, you need to make sure you're online for that because it is going to be absolutely brilliant. So the stream will depart for a moment. We hope to see you back at 1 p.m. If you're listening elsewhere, such as on the MSVR website, TSL Timing, or of course here at Donington Park, we'll head into qualifying now, which should be absolutely brilliant, but we'll leave you in just a moment's peace before we get the rest of the day's action underway.
Here we go then, ladies and gentlemen. We are all set for racing to begin at Donington Park National Circuit. We've had the final qualifying session of the day. That was the Clubman Sports Prototypes. They're back with the race after lunch, but we get one before the race thing after lunch, and that is the Supercart Super Series 2023. If you've not seen these before, it is, and the name is exactly right, Super. It's due to be absolutely brilliant from start to finish. We are expecting action up and down the field. We've got four classes to contend with. It'll be a handful for us. It's a handful for the drivers out on track because they're in small carts with a lot of power. One man who's not a handful, he's in fact very, very charming, is Andy Webster. As the, I don't know about you, but I think this can be absolutely brilliant. Well, I'm looking forward to this. I think we're going to have chaos. Yes, Tom, thank you. Uh, and uh, some, of the, uh, some of the cars with the yellow um, number plate uh, are the Division 1s, and they will be topping 140 miles an hour, um, some two inches from the, uh, from the racing surface here. We have also very high uh, gusting crosswinds across Donington today as well um, and the drivers are uh, preparing themselves for this uh, for this supercar session um, and uh, they do look absolutely frightening uh, when you see onboard um, onboard footage from those carts but um, so it uh, more akin to uh, to bikers, really. Um, we were we were talking earlier on about how um, how frankly um, they're in racing leathers and they don't have seatbelts, Tom. So it's it's one for the brave. These ones. It is the leathers definitely help. It's uh, we were speaking earlier as well about people who get involved in this. Of course, some people come from short track karting onto almost the big stuff, if you like, and others actually come from motorbike racing because it's chain driven, similar engines, similar experience as well, where you can find yourself down the road at 100 miles an hour, which is I don't know most of the stuff we commentate on, I think, do you know what, I'd love to give that a go. This one, I'm a bit more tentative. One change I've just seen happen on circuit, actually, is that at the Robert Chicane, which is the final chicane here on the national layout at Donington, we've had one of the tyre barriers removed. So we're making sure there's room for error, if you like, with the supercarts who are queuing up behind us, ready to go. There's a little bit of cleanup going on. There's some tire marks. It's currently dry, but it feels as if it could rain at any moment, like it has in past. Yeah. It's all coming in from the south side of the circuit. It's blown across. If you look the other way, it's blue. It looks brilliant. Then we turn behind us, and there is somewhat <laughs> ominous clouds there, as you can see in the top of your pictures right now. Uh, keep an eye on those flags as well. That's the the big indicator, as as the, the, those crosswinds do uh, do come at us pretty uh, pretty strong, um, and the weather has been flying in. Um, keeping the pit lane generally fairly dry, um, so everybody in the pits tends to be uh, fairly um, fairly happy and dry. There are the tyre barriers just being lifted out by our, um, our excellent trackside um, support crew. As the uh, supercars line up on the Melbourne hairpin um, behind our commentary position, um, and there's the tyre barrier just to give um, the idea of, um, of, of flying towards one of those tyre barriers uh, out of control because you've hit a kerb, Tom, and uh, potentially hitting one in so, so low down and in s with such low lack of protection in front of you is uh, is pretty frightening prospect. Yes, we do everything we can to uh, to keep them safe here, despite these being absolute monsters. You mentioned the curbs as well. That is a factor that will come into play because, of course, the curbs at a race circuit for cars are designed for cars. They are appropriately sized relative to the wheel circumference. We get into a car, suddenly they feel really quite big. So as soon as the driver touches them, not only are they shaken and rattled to pieces and in need of a visit to the chiropractor, they'll also find that the front wheel will hook up around the curb and they end up in this really quite noticeable oversteer moment and suddenly exiting the corner completely different to where they thought they were because of that almost slingshot you can find yourself having experiencing. Absolutely, yeah. As, as, we've, as, we've, as we've mentioned, you know, bravery is going to be a, a big factor today. Um, but um, we're looking forward to seeing um, the, uh, the, the, the drivers um, tackling this one. I'm almost tempted to say riders, but they are definitely drivers um, here. Um, as Liam Morley heads the points in the Division 1 category. Um, he is the um, the 2020 club champion and the Grand, the Grand Prix winner at Donington last September. So we are um, we are intrigued to see um, if uh, Liam Morley can continue that, uh, that run uh, incredibly well. He came second in Cadwell Park um, but also, but then crashed in, um, in 
uh, crashed in April, uh, lapping a back marker. In the F250 Mono Super Series, we have the uh, five-time MSA British Supercar champion Paul Platt to look out for. Uh, Paul is uh, is in the zero-numbered uh, car cart in the F250 Mono. With those are the white uh, the white. Uh, badges, um, so one to watch for for that series. Um, then we have also uh, Nick Flint to look out for as well. Nick Flint uh, will be uh, very uh, very keen to, uh, to to show well today. Shane Stoney is the Grand Prix winner and heads uh, in 2022 here at this circuit and heads the F125 Open class. Uh, so again, another driver to uh, to keep a very, very close eye on. But I, I have a feeling that we're going to be um, suddenly joined by, uh, by an expert, Tom, who's going to help us uh, decode the mysteries of this uh, of this fascinating series. We are indeed. Your grid, however, looks as follows. Matt Robinson is on pole ahead of Liam Morley, Sam Moss and Carl Hume. Then you get back to fifth position, which is Tom Rushford ahead of Lee Harpham, Carl Kinsey and Jack Tritton. Row four is Carl Kinsey ahead of Jack Tritton and then row five is Andy Guilford and Sam Hempsell at the head of his class. Row six is where you find Ingvar Björk and row alongside Mark Edwards. Joining us in the commentary box now, we've got Gary James. Yes, yeah, so just picking up Samantha Hemshaw, quickest of the 250 Nationals sitting there on row five. Row seven, we see Lee Plain, another of the 250 Monos, and Michael Goff having his first run in a twin. Row eight, Paul Platt and uh, Kirk Catamol. Kirk a winner last time at Anglesey. Row nine, we've got the 36 of Tom Baldwin and 74 Will Lawrence. Row 10, another of the uh, twins all gridded on that uh, row 10. That's Mark Pask, the nine cart, and uh, the 20 of Johnny West. Row 11, the 21 of Luke Clemson, and he's joined by another of the American visitors, that's Johnny West and Anthony Williams, both coming across from uh, the States. Row 12, we've got uh, 52, Steve Burton, and another of the 250 monos, that's Tom Hatfield. Row 13, another of the Parker Motorsport drivers, that's Sean Lombardo and his teammates, but in the twin is the 33 of uh, Mark Newton. Row 14, the 66 of John Faulkner, and 32, Glenn Guest. Row 15, we've got the son of uh, Steve Burton, that's Luke Burton, the 51 cart on row 15. Joined by the quickest of the 450s, that's Ronan McClintock. Ronan actually had the engine apart, but uh, has got it fired up, so Ronan McClintock should be out in this race. Row 16, the uh, 185 of Aaron Powell and the 14 of Nathan Barton. Row 17, we see the first of the 125s, that's the 643 of Ollie Holmes. And he's joined by the S2, that's the Super Series Cup winner from Anglesey, Catherine Foster. Row 18, Rob Randall and Kevin Ridley. Row 19, Costa Caritzis and John Busby. Costa, another of the 450 drivers. Row 20, another of the 450 drivers, that's the 44 of Jason Thompson. And he's joined by Nick Flint. Row 21, the 67 of Daniel Thompson. And uh, Richard Connick, unusually a long way back for Richard Connick on the... Uh, 21st row, row 22, 83, Paul Ron Gerrard, also another driver long way back on the grid. And the 62 of Andy Power, row 23, the 117 of Luca Rourke. And the 450 driver, Alan Fluitt, number 40. Row 24, 75, Kevin Busby and John Reader that we saw stranded on the edge of the circuit down at uh, Old Hairpin, actually had the engine seized on that one. Row 25 is the 45 of Chris Mackey and another of the 125s, that's the 99 cart of Aston Baker. Row 26, the 76 of Alex Dudley and 58, Mary Howarth. Row 27, the 17 of Gary Popkins. And Ben Parkinson, another driver that's a little bit out of position in that Division 1 cart. Row 28, 144 of Chris Balderston also had some engine issues in qualifying. And the 153 of Martin Marks didn't set a time. Row 29, we see the 91 of George Benton that we saw circulating but very slowly. Daniel Gerrard joins him on row 29. Row 30 is Fletcher Hearn who had an ignition issue in qualifying. And uh, the last runner should have been on the grid, and that was the GP3 of uh, Shane Stone. Shane's not actually here this weekend. He blew an engine massively in testing on Thursday. So unfortunately, the GP3 cart of Shane Stone not taking part this weekend. It's a little bit windy here, it must be said. If you keep your eye on those flags just on the pit wall, you'll notice that they are 
blustering quite a bit. There's also one up on top of the building there, which shows that there's a crosswind all the way along the big street. Yeah, exactly, and then certainly the paddock, there's lots of rattling of awnings and bits and pieces being strapped down. So uh, I think the wind direction is probably the same. Well, actually, has it changed round? So no, it's the same as what it was in qualifying. So it's a very strong tailwind into uh, down kind of curves and into the old hairpin, but it's a headwind back up into uh, coppice at uh, the far end of the circuit. So uh, drivers for the supercars all glad that it's uh, dry. There's a few dark clouds in the distance, but so uh, this 15-minute race, we should uh, we should get everything done and dusted before we get the next uh, shower. The start of this one could be quite hectic as well because Redgate it invites you up the inside, and then before you know it, it's tightened and everybody else has swung in to meet you on that piece of tarmac. There, there's going to need to be a lot of respect shown in the early couple of corners. There, there is a bit of a pinch point, as you say, when you reach the uh, apex curve at Redgate, but uh, fingers crossed that everyone can get round in uh, one piece. The last thing we want is to see carts stranded out seat on the in the kitty litter. But uh, 60 carts, yes. Uh, it's going to be busy out there, certainly with uh, a considerable distance uh, in time between the front rows of the grid and the back. We could be seeing lapping after sort of three or four laps. So a 15 minute race, we're probably looking at about 13-ish laps for the length of this one. So uh, We'll be starting uh, side by side or in, or in uh, it's rows of three? No, two by two as it, two by two. Two, two by two as it appears, yeah. And, uh, they are kept in a fairly strict order, so they will have one lap behind the pace car. The pace car will pull off into pit lane, and it obviously acts up to the uh, pole position man, which is the 84 of Matt Robinson, to do take the pace coming up to the line and then the lights will go out and we will be racing and just to confirm for anybody who's listening in online maybe you've only watched the likes of formula one or touring cars before that means this will be a rolling start procedure so the cars will approach it if you imagine nascar like you've seen in those sorts of clips that's closer to what we'll be doing here as opposed to stopping on the grid and waiting for the lights yeah it's supposed to be a slow first gear rolling but um you know <laughs> When, when, the, when the red mist descends and, and you're <laughs> sitting in a car, you obviously want it to uh, go as quickly as possible. But, uh, yeah, they won't throw the lights until, obviously, everybody's happy that uh, the grid's formed up. Because, uh, unfortunately, with the chicane being so close to the, uh, the start gantry, and obviously with such a big grid, um, you would hope that the back of the grid are going to be fairly compact coming through, through the Robert chicane. Otherwise... We're going to be racing at the front, and they're still going to be coming through fairly slowly at the back. So, how many uh, gears are the, are the carts equipped with? The Division Ones, the, C, uh, the 250 Twins are six-speed, um, 100 brake horsepower. The 250 Monos are only five-speed. The 450s are five-speed, and the 125s are six-speed. So, um, right. average speed, I say, uh, 140 in a Division One, 120 in the slowest cars, which is a 125. Uh, we have a transponder timing clocked at about 143 through the Craner curves. And in fact, um, just trying to think how long ago it was, Darren Turner of Aston Martin fame did actually do a test drive here as part of the European Supercar Championship um, in a car on the Thursday. And I won't use the expletive, but basically once he got it running, and obviously he was in amongst guys that were testing for the European Championship, and he came in after about four laps and he took his crown crash helmet off and he said, F me, that's quick. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that's from a respectable man that's raced Le Mans and all sorts of uh, big formula. So, uh, yeah, going, nice, going away from it. So, the carts are being released onto the circuit. They're actually going to come down the pit lane because that's where the pace cart is waiting for them. And I think the reason behind this, as the clerk said at driver's briefing, is he wants to make sure that all the grid is compacted together rather than strung out. And Liam Morley, GP cart slightly offline going down the pit lane. So has the GP cart of Liam Morley got an issue? He's parked it to the left-hand side of the pit lane. And Matt Morell is there in attendance as is and Liam Morley out of the cart, so the GP cart that should have been on the front row of the grid has got an issue. And I think obviously once they're released from, and green, green light goes at the end of the pit lane, so if Morley is going to get out for this one, he's going to be starting from at the back of the grid. 
curious to wonder what's wrong with that one too because we can already see various bits of smoke from tires and engines yeah, and all yeah, that yeah. but there was none of that from his no, car no. it just came in and pulled to the side in a very controlled manner well he's being pushed off now so he may because obviously the front part of the grid have not yet done half a lap he yeah. may be able to get slotted into his grid slot um, it wasn't pulling away particularly quickly but it looks as if it's fired up now so perhaps it was wasn't running on both uh, both cylinders and they've made a quick uh, quick tweak but uh, yeah the safety car should be through old hairpin now so uh, We'll keep an eye open to see whether the GP cart, obviously Liam Morley now leading the championship, missed, uh, as, as Andy said, you know, got involved in the incident at uh, Cadwell Park at, uh, early on in the season, but picked up three wins last time out at Angus, and so now heads the series by, uh, what, uh, three points from from Carl Hume. So uh, Liam keen to extend his, uh, his lead in the series, and uh, speaking to uh, Matt Robinson, Matt, obviously, the 84 car on pole missed the last round. He was actually at the Isle of Man watching the TT. But um, the series is not his priority this year. In fact, unfortunately, he's got to miss uh, the next round at uh, Snetterton in August. So um, Matt, even though he was leading the start of the series, not going to be a serious contender. As we've got, obviously, in these races this weekend, he will be. But uh, the championship is obviously uh, already out of his hands. You can only drop three scores across the, the uh, season. And obviously, he's already dropped three. He'll drop another three at Snetterton, so uh, he'll be well out of the uh, scenario. We'll get an idea now just how packed this field is going to yes. be. Check out <laughs> this uh, this image now. Uh, it's uh, incredibly busy out there, but how soon will the class uh, differences start to pay? pay uh... You'll see, obviously, the, four, the one two fives will drop off the back fairly quickly, but uh, you've got quicker 250 single cylinders that will get in amongst the slower Division 1s. I mean, obviously, you've got Samantha Hemshaw already sitting there on the row five in amongst some of the twins. Um, so, yeah, within sort of a couple of laps, you'll see it spread out, but uh, hopefully we'll have some nice, close, safe racing. The safety car coming out of the uh, Robert Chicane, and it looks like he's going to take them around again. Oh, ooh, that was a late pull in. Oh, blown, right. OK, so we are going racing. Uh, red lights are on. Morley has got onto the front row slot that he was after. Lights go out and it's uh, Morley that does actually take the lead from Matt Robinson as they head down into Redgate for the first time. Is that the 19 cart of Carl Hume in looking for a move up the inside? The black and yellow looking further back and it looks like, yes, everybody has got through Redgate safely on this opening lap. There's 60 carts or 59 carts with the uh, Shane Stone not been here, but Sam Moss that slots into third place, the 31 cart ahead of uh, Carl Hume. I think Andy Gullicott was in there as well, the four cart, and saw Luke Jensen going through. That's uh, Mark Edwards, uh, no, that's 57, that's Anthony Williams, sorry, similar colour scheme, but it's Morley for Moss. Uh, Matt Robinson, Carl Hume is next through, looking further back to see if Samantha Hempshaw is still holding the lead in 250 Mono. Certainly Paul Platt was there but was behind uh, Lee Flame, there's Paul Black who pick up, in fact, he's in front of uh, Lee Flame with uh, Kurt Catamold on their tail. So look out for those three cars. That's the Zero, the 101, and the GP1, but it's Morley that comes through Roberts to complete the opening lap. It's uh, Morley from Moss, then it's Matt Robinson, Carl Hume next through, then it's the one car of Lee Harpham, side by side, Andy Galliford and Tom Rushforth as they head down to Redgate. Somebody's got to give on that one, and it's going to be... Uh, Rush forth as to give up the slot on the outside, but it gets the cut back as they go back down through uh, Craner Curve. So, uh, nice little scrap there between Andy Gully for the four cart and the 24 of Tom Rushforth. But uh, looking further back, you can see Kirk Cutting the room, 16th mark pass, and just trying to pick up the uh, leading 450. And that looks like it's Kevin Ridley, the 12 cart, so a former. Uh, Grand Prix winner Kevin Ridley as uh, the 17 of Gary Popkins arm in the air and uh, Ronan McLeansock, the quickest of the 450s, already into pit lane. Daddy ending apart after qualifying, but uh, Ronan McLeansock 
no longer participating in this uh, open race. Some side-by-side -side action here through Coppice then uh, between the 24 and the 4. Um, as the, we already see then the carts hopping over those oh, curtain moss and going wide out of the uh, rather chicane. But incredible save there from number Sam 31 moss. from yep. Sam Moss. Brilliant, brilliant control. And yellow flags being waved on the way down to uh, Redgate. And in fact, I think that's the 17 cart of Gary Potkins has pulled it off at the uh, exit of the pit lane. But uh, unfortunately, not far enough off the circuit. So uh, yellow flags, which is uh, being waved into the uh, what would be an ideal outbreaking spot into Redgate. But uh, Sam Moss, a great save, having got it on the grass. Lost one place to uh, Matt Robinson. So Moss down to third place. Carl Hughes do there in fourth ahead of... Uh, Rush fourth and uh, Lee Harper now. That's see up into uh, fifth place ahead of Gulliford. And through came the curves and we pick up further back. Is that the uh, 20 cart of Johnny West? Just ahead of Glenn Guest and the uh, Bennett's uh, Super Scholarship uh, winner. That was Luke Clemson. And there we pick up wow. with uh, Samantha Hempshaw and uh, Paul Platt and Lee Plain. But that's one of the Parker Motorsport guys leading the way there. Now is that Tom, uh, Tom Baldwin? I think the 36 cart could be leading the uh, 250 Nationals as Morley completes another lap and uh, into uh, Robert the fastest Chicane lap and it's uh, well there, isn't it's yeah, the top of the order. Platt Ooh, runs it over the curb but it is Tom Baldwin I think that he's leading the way. Yes it's the 36 cart of Tom Baldwin. It's Henschel Platt and Lee playing side by side with Kurt Catamol. The GP1 looking for a move, makes it three abreast into uh, Redgate, but uh, Catamol has to back off as Plain and Platt still run side by side and down through uh, Hollywood and uh, Craner Curve. So uh, the uh, protagonist in the uh, 250 monoclass, and it's Lee Plain that's now got ahead of Platt that's coming under pressure from the GP1 of Catamol, looks up the inside and gets the move done into Old Head. A brave move there from Kurt Catamol, just runs it a little bit wide out onto uh, the curbs, but uh, it's Hemschel there in second place giving chase to Tom Baldwin. Unfortunately, Tom uh, Anglesey had a brilliant run, was lying in third place until tyres uh, went off, and uh, in fact, he dropped it into the kitchen. It's a Tom Baldwin young driver that's moved up from the 125 category now uh, leading the 250 monos, but it's still Morley from Robinson and uh, Sam Austin there in third place. We have a cart off. Uh, into Coppice. Uh, I can't see at this at this stage exactly which one, but I did see John Faulkner uh, marching across the gravel as the it's 35 like hops onto Samantha that curve Hinchel, and so has a huge moment and has dislodged something. Arm up, raised straight away from the 35. So Samantha Henschel was running side by side with uh, an into pit lane. I think that was the 35 of Samantha Henschel. So uh, damage possibly to a side pod, but. Uh, Unfortunate that Sam was running there second in the 250 mono category, but uh, it's Tom Baldwin that leads the way there. But uh, in the twins, it's still Morley from Robinson Moss, Tom Rush from third in fourth, Carl Hume is fifth, and uh, Lee Harper, the British champion, the one cart in sixth place. Ollie Holmes crosses the line of 6 4 3 to uh, lead the uh, 125 category as Morley comes across the line to complete another lap. Nine and a half minutes on the clock, a 105 8. That time around for uh, Liam Morley and uh, Paul Von Gerard, the 83 cart, also off at the Robert Chicane. Not sure if that is an engine doing his own life snatch there, I think, as well. But we are seeing a, a <coughs> tremendous battle between Plain and Platt, uh, sorry, between Platt and Casamol. Well, safe, um, safety cars being uh, readied at the end of pit lane, and in fact, I think. So uh, the yellow flag for sure, yeah. Tom Ball. We'll wait to see. Yes. And there it is, the safety car. Has um, has been deployed for. We just have too many cars, yeah, I think, um, stranded at the moment. 76 car of Alex Dudley also in the kit. So that looks like at uh, McLean's, I think, uh, on the outside. So unfortunately, the, uh, the safety car has not picked up Liam Morley, who's leading the race. It's picked up obviously the first opportunity, which I think was possibly the uh, 36 cart of uh, Tom Baldwin. So the uh, two 450s of uh, Catherine Foster and Kevin Ridley, the 32 and 12 running together so uh, whether they can do a live snatch on Paul Von Gerard's 83 cart which uh, out of all of them that we've seen on screen looks to be in the most dangerous spot yeah it wasn't for lack of trying he did his best yeah. to prevent that safety car for well, us I think you, you've probably got um, 120 130 kilos of cart to try and <laughs> shift out of the way on your own so uh, 
it's a case of now Morley has gone past now Morley obviously has slowed up now whether he is trying to back it up we've had instances when I've covered some endurance races earlier on this year where the safety car's gone out and picked up the wrong one and you've got two groups you've got the lead group but yep. does the lead group catch up the tail enders or is the safety car trying to bring the rest of the snake back to the <laughs> to the front so I think in fact if Morley uh, it could be that in the end Morley's going to put a lap on, on the snake that's currently sitting behind the safety car we've got so what seven and a half minutes left on the clock at the moment Absolutely, yeah. I was just uh, wondering on the uh, on the. Um, I know it's a lot of weight to lift on your own, that amount of weight. But um, is there any control for driver weight, or is it is it a, is it a direct um, disadvantage the heavier you are? Uh, as it crosses the line, the Division One should weigh, including the driver fuel, everything else, 218 kilos. Okay. Um, not everybody reaches 218 kilos. There are some that are a bit heavier than 218 kilos. <laughs> Um, but obviously the advantage is that you need to get it as it crosses a line almost within 220 kilos ID because you would have finished with a couple of litres of fuel on board as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the, the weight that uh, one of those is, is coming around with. The 125s I think is about 195 kilos, so usually sort of you've got about 120 kilos of car and 70 odd kilos of a driver. So. Aston Baker is the first driver behind the safety car in the 125 category, but obviously he is running well down the order um, as the safety car. He's in 45th overall there, uh, second in class, but yeah, 45th overall. Okay, so uh, Morley has now brought effectively the front part of the group, of the grid, to the rear of the snake. So you've actually got the leaders theoretically on track about 30 carts behind the safety car which is going to make a restart uh, fairly interesting choice <laughs> yeah it's difficult to communicate to the drivers as well uh, about uh, about swapping around at all but uh, yeah the leader is still unmistakably the GP numbered Morley um, in uh, ahead of Robinson and, and a new lap record there for Liam Morley first driver under 1 minute 05 and 1 minute 04.384 so uh, 1.3 Three seconds, I think, inside the uh, yeah. It, it, it was previously held by Jason Dredge at one minute five yeah. point six five one. Well, the reason it's been such an old lap record, I think, it dates back to uh, twenty sixteen. I've got here. Yeah, twenty sixteen is because we don't often use the, na the national circuit, and the times that we have since twenty sixteen, it's been um, lashing down the rain. So uh, yeah. But uh, despite the fact that occasionally the, the the clock on your screen does freeze up. The clock does continue to tick here, um, Gary, and um, that is a big factor for the for the drivers. Of course, they want to make make the absolute most of the uh, green flag conditions, but we're done underneath five minutes now. Well, exactly, because the trouble is, as I say, with, with the restart of the fact that the leaders are halfway down the grid now, the safety car has pulled in, so we are going green again, but I'm just looking to see, well... Uh, okay. It looks like the 125's moving it to, to one side at least. Yeah, to let the get cookie, underway. Yeah, so Tom Baldwin leads across the line from uh, Plain, Platt and Catamol. So what you see at the front of the, uh, the, the track at the moment is the race for the 250 Mono class, which is easy to maintain. But uh, Morley, Robinson and Carl Hume, the twins, are trying to pick their way through some of the slower drivers down through Red Redgate and uh, Craner Curves at the moment. So the front... Uh, group of carts that are coming round on circuit is the uh, race for the 250 national category. It's a shame that we've lost uh, a third time. It's frantic stuff though as the, as, the, as the classes get overlapped and, and try to, uh, to, to bring themselves back into any kind of race order. It's a nice move down the inside uh, by the uh, white and blue livery uh, supercar uh, that time on the way through. And the five car of Carl Kinsey also making up ground into, uh, into the old hair as well. So. Uh, I'm going to pick out where Morley is in relation to the other carts on circuit, but it's the battle for the mono class that's heading in our direction, and it's still the 36 of Tom Baldwin that leads the way, and in fact has got quite a considerable lead now over Paul Platt there in second place, runs it onto the curb and allows Lee Plain to get through, so Lee Plain up into second place uh, with Kurt Catamore there in uh, 
fourth. Then we look for the twins coming through, and I can see Matt Robinson and Sam Moss have gone through. Yes, so Robinson and Moss still there, second and third. Morley there, uh, nine laps completed now. Oh, still contact there between and the 15. And that's uh, Luke Clemson, and was that 70? That's Steve Burton, I think, 52. Yes, it looks like Steve Burton um, yep. got caught on the curb on the way into Redgate, and unfortunately, um, it looked like uh, out of pass. There was a, a little touch there completely um, uh, a passenger really in that, that experience. There's the GP, there's your leader, uh, Morley, then trying to side through the field. Yeah, and Lee Plain has uh, pulled out quite a few gaps over uh, Paul Platt in the zero cart, but yeah, unfortunately Lee, Lee Clemson, uh, an innocent uh, bystander in that, the 15 cart going well in class up to that point, but uh, Stan Moss putting a move on Mark Pass to try and get through this traffic. Luke Clemson forlornly looks at the carts, which is off anything that's uh, still live on the cart and probably the dash but uh, it's Baldwin that uh, reappears with, uh, to complete his ninth lap so obviously these guys have just only completed nine laps as Morley now onto the back of Paul Platt yellow flags being waved on the way down to Redgate now Morley obviously passed Platt under yellow but uh, they did say at driver's briefing that if there was obviously a distinctive uh, speed uh, differential that they would allow that to go but obviously that's in the hands of the uh, stewards not us in commentary uh, so Morley now almost up to the head of the field passes uh, Lee Plain into the old hairpin so two minutes 16 left on the clock time for another couple of laps but it's still the GP cart of Liam Moy that leads away just about to put a lap onto the 36 cart of Tom Baldwin that's leading the uh, 250 mono Sam Moss uh, now lapping a uh, zero cart of Paul Platt. So it's unfortunate because the likes of Platt, Plain and Tom Baldwin would probably be in the top ten amongst the twins anyway, but because of obviously the safety car yeah. picking up the uh, the uh, half the grid, then these guys unfortunately have uh, ended up being lapped, whereas that wouldn't normally happen. OK, so Morley now leads the field across the line to complete, I think this is uh, ten laps, chased by uh, the 31 of uh, Sam Moss. And uh, Matt Robinson now passes Tom Baldwin. So uh, no back markers to come into play now between Morley and Robinson. So this is going to be a straight fight to the flag, I think, over the uh, the next two laps. And as Matt Robinson alluded to earlier on, this race, races this weekend, is all about how they're going to manage the traffic because with 60 parts out on the, uh, the grid, it's who can get the brakes and get through at the, uh, the right point on the circuit. Catamol enjoyed a, uh, a move past uh, the Division 1 uh, driver Lawrence on the previous lap that time, uh, gaining a place in the GP1. He's been very muscular already. I've seen him go side by side several times today. Yeah, well, Kurt Catamol, GP1 uh, signifies that he was the Grand Prix winner in the 250 Monos here last September and uh, didn't do much racing last year, but was determined to get the Grand Prix win under his belt. And uh, after lots of years of trying, and in fact, his dad also won the Grand Prix at Silverstone years and years ago. So. Kurt Catamol, a very uh, fast driver, but Morley completes another lap, and uh, Matt Robinson still there in second place, Sam Moss still there in third, Tom Baldwin still leads the uh, 250 monos as uh, Kurt Catamol, and I think is this, no we haven't got to last lap board yet, so I suspect uh, we've got this and uh, one more lap to go as uh, Carl Hume and, uh, gets a move done, but uh, Carl Hume now coming under pressure from the one cart of uh, Lee Harpham, the reigning British champion, uh, had a bit of a boot off at uh, Cadwell Park and uh, was flung out of the car early on this year and uh, bit battered and bruised. But it's uh, good to see that uh, Lee Harpham was back in action. And uh, Tritton got ahead of Kinsey on that previous uh, yeah, uh, circuit, circuit as well at uh, that time. So um, up to uh, eighth position is Tritton. So Jack Tritton, the rookie in the uh, 250 Division 1 category this year, came up for 125s, 125 British champion, but uh, Jack Trinier also put a lap on uh, the 57 there of uh, Anthony Williams, and Morley, I think, gets the checkered flag, so that was a race over, so Morley takes it from Robinson, from Sam Moss in third place, Tom Baldwin, arm in the air, gets the 250 mono victory from the 101 of uh, Lee Plain. Rushforth came in through in fourth and as well. Paul Platt gets uh, third in class. And we'll try and pick up the other. Lee Harpham slow across the line, but uh, Lee Harpham gets there in the seventh spot. Jack Tritton gets uh, eighth, just ahead of Carl Kinsey. And uh, Kevin Ridley just beats his partner. Um, 
Catherine Foster have lost the race for, I think that was uh, first and second in the 450. So, uh, yep, yeah, that's all the classes over. So I'm going to scribble some notes and try and get some words with the drivers downstairs. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that one. We will uh, we'll be joined, I'm sure, by Gary later on. Uh, and he will... Uh, he will uh, he'll be joining us back for the supercars uh, soon to come. Tom, we uh, we enjoyed a, um, a, a frantic race there, uh, interrupted by a safety car, which mixed the order of no end. Uh, but uh, several uh, several carts were, uh, were were left off into the uh, into the gravel, and we still have one uh, at the entry into Coppice. I did enjoy watching the drivers try and hold their own machinery out of the gravel <laughs> trap. It's not often you get the the self <laughs> executed uh, live snatch like you mentioned it. Um, a couple of them have ended in quite deep as well, it should be said, which is always quite tricky to deal with, particularly when they're as light as this. You'd have thought they'd be stopped quite early, but clearly bouncing over the gravel rather than sort of digging into it. Absolutely. We Gary will, be, um, will uh, <laughs> scamper down. It looks like scampering to me. Scamper down to the, <laughs> to the park two, permit two area. Two stairs at a time. Be careful, Gary. <laughs> that was at least two. It sounded like that was three or four. I think we're one, one millimeter away from it being a, an uncontrolled descent there. <laughs> I it was, but the, the carts, they enter their way into pit lane. Fantastic race from start to finish. We're hoping to get some Park Fermi interviews for you. If you're thinking about departing, make sure that you come back after lunch is the big one because it's racing from here till the end of the day. So at five past two, well, we'll probably be online from about two, if you like. So if you're following on the stream just after 2 p.m., we will be back. That will be the Miata Trophy, their first race of the day. And then we'll work through it from there. But a fantastic race here with the Supercarts. Most of them make their way down pit lane. It's like a swarm of angry bees, isn't it? They're almost just trying to <laughs> calm down and turn into ants, go single file. It, it down sounds the like pit a lane. swarm of angry bees as well at times, doesn't it? Uh, when they're all flowing through. But yeah, uh, tremendous to see uh, to see several uh, competitive battles across across uh, class as well. Uh, and of course, everybody uh, looking to be uh, well stopped by the um, by by the gravel. But I think we're going down to um, to the pit lane to join Gary. Uh, Gary's just getting ready. I can see we've got the mic on, but there is your winner. Uh, uh, for uh, it's it's Morley in the lead, and uh, he's going to take have an interview in a moment. You can see Gary there uh, just getting ready to uh, to talk with our podiums uh, across the classes, and we'll be handing over to him very shortly. But uh, okay, guys, very if happy. I could uh, just cut in, there was a bit of a confusion about bringing drivers in, but uh, fortunately enough, we've got uh, the top two in Division One. So. Liam Morley, uh, another win round uh, Donington, but wow, was that busy out there? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think they sent the safety car out at the wrong time because uh, we ended up having to battle through the entire grid for a lap, but um, yeah, certainly made it interesting and uh, a bit difficult. Yeah, it got a bit confusing because the safety car picked up half the grid, and obviously you were, I wasn't sure whether you were trying to slow it up so that they could catch you, or whether you suddenly decided, to, right, we need to get on the back of the snake. Well, I was just doing my best to see the lights on the safety car so I knew when I could go, and uh, as soon as the green lights came out, I just weaved through the traffic. So Matt was doing the same, and I think it was just going to be a case of who got through there the best. But a new lap record, uh, Liam, first driver under 1 minute 05, so I think it was a 1.046 or something like that, but a uh, quick lap out there. Yeah, I mean, um, we banged a new set of tyres on, and obviously we know traffic like there was in qualifying. Um, managed to put a few 104s together, so yeah, happy days. Looking good for later. Yeah, all being well. <laughs> Great stuff. Well done, Liam. Let's have a quick word with Matt. So. Uh, as I said to uh, Liam, a bit busy out there, and obviously once you've got traffic in between you, you can't really battle between you and Liam, can you? No, I think the safety car must have come out at the wrong time because it seemed to pick up the whole grid, and we were in front on the track, but at the back of the safety car. So I think as Liam was saying, it was a bit of a lottery around who could get through the traffic first. Um, I saw Liam weaving his way through, so I was kind of following his line. Um, and then, yeah, we managed to clear most of the grid in about, I'd say, three or four laps. Um, but I think by that time, Liam had already pulled maybe second, second and a half. Um, and we were on the same tyres from Quali. So kind of started going off at the end. So I thought, you know, let's set off a P2. I didn't really know what was going on behind me either. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll set off for that. Is that new tyres for the next race? Depends what the weather does. I think looking, looking up now, it's pretty black and, and dull. But um, yeah, let's see what the weather does. I think tomorrow might be dry, so we'll... We'll throw a new set of slicks on it and, and see what we can do. But yeah, let's uh, let's do a bit of a rain dance for the next one. Great stuff. Thanks, Matt. Right, let's have a quick word with uh, 
Kevin Ridley. So, uh, Kevin, uh, class winner in the 450s, but um, uh, Catherine was right on your tail at the end. Yes, I had a very lovely race. Uh, I let Catherine get in front of me so I could see the back of a cart. I've not seen the back of a cart for a very long time, uh, and everything was good. I take the win. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> and uh, just slightly changing the subject, um, you were here, no, Brands recently working on an old uh, superhero. Yeah, I, back in the day in my youth I used to look after some lovely touring cars, some very special cars and, and fortunately they came over, the guys from New Zealand shipped them over, massive expense uh, and we had a lovely time, a really lovely time. Back to the old days? Yeah, yeah, 30 years ago. <laughs> I haven't got another 30 years in me. <laughs> but a good race with Catherine and, you know, look forward to the next one. Yeah, it was good. I, I, I must apologise for Sam. I got in Sam's way. He did hit me and nearly put me off, but, but it's only fair because at Anglesey he went off on my oil, so one all. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Right, let's have a quick word with uh, Ollie. So, uh, now, Ollie, uh, it's your turn in the uh, Anderson AK, and we said before it looks a beautiful machine, but what's it like to drive? Oh, it's mega. Got no rear grip whatsoever, but it slides everywhere. We're going to keep it buzzing. It's mint. And is this just a one-off for you, or is this going to be uh, another chance later on in the year as well? Because, I mean, normally you obviously run in 250 National, so what's the score? It depends how this meeting goes, really, and see what I can afford, and that'll tell the story. And try and keep it in one piece, because it looks beautiful. Yeah, looks mega, doesn't it? <laughs> Great stuff. Well done, Ollie. OK, that's uh, three of your class winners. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to speak to uh, Tom Baldwin, but uh, hopefully we'll catch Tom at the next race. Thanks. That rounds it up for this race then. These guys are back out on track at quarter past three this afternoon. In the meantime, however, we're going to take a short lunch break. We'll be back with action on the other side at 2.05. All of this being broadcast on the live stream here on the MSVR, YouTube, and I'm sure all the various other places you've no doubt managed to find it around the internet. So thank you very much for joining us for this first bit. We will be back at 2.05 with further action, this time from the Miata Trophy.
fits into yours. Right, I'm going to give them the thumbs up and then do this. Right, boys, so I'm going to give you the thumbs up. You can just look at the camera and do a boy David Vine thing. Check one, two, three, channel A. And checking the other channel, this is Andy.
Well, welcome everybody to this afternoon's uh, race coverage, starting with the Miata Trophy Series uh, and it's round three. Uh, so it, it will be the race number uh, five and six of the championship. My name is Andy Webster, here to uh, take you through uh, today's uh, coverage on the Miata Trophy, as I was at Anglesey, and what a thrill ride we had, but joined uh, by the expert Tom Davis. Tom, uh, great to be here. Great to be here at this fabulous circuit such as Donington, and uh, we can't wait to get underway in racing today. No, it should be a fantastic event. The championship is as tight as you would like it. Two points separate those at the top. We had some drama in Super Pole earlier. And to just top it off, we've had quite a significant rain shower come through, which means the circuit is thoroughly soaked from top to bottom. Absolutely, yes. It seems to be what's happening with the Miatas today is every time they come and get ready to race, uh, a, a downpour comes out. But it, ha it was pretty torrential during our lunch break here. Um, where there's plenty of rain on the sides of our commentary box. Uh, it's not currently raining right now, but the winds are gusting from the south uh, to cross the two straights, the uh, start-finish straight, the, the uh, the wheat cross straight and at the back of the circuit here on the way to the final chicane the exhibition straight so it really is um, going to be a massive challenge for the drivers they do have um, they do have treads on that cut into their uh, their slick tires um, but it, it is by no means are they actually racing on uh, full wet conditions uh, Tom it's a, it, we're, we're racing here on the national circuit length so we're not using the Melbourne loop um, but that is 1.957 miles or 3.149 kilometers for for anyone who's not uh, American or, uh, or, or English <laughs> watching with us, um, so f pretty much the rest of the world. Um, but welcome to everyone who is uh, who is tuning in uh, to the to the stream. Um, we uh, we're, we're really looking forward to this. Uh, it has been phenomenally tight um, in the uh, in the championship uh, and in the uh, qualifying action. The pre-qualifying was was. Uh, uh, incredibly close. Um, Super Pole did seem to separate the drivers by, by a fairly surprising amount, Tom. It did. We uh, saw a notable event right at the very start, if you like, which was John Langridge, championship leader, off on an out, yeah. which was remarkable. We were looking for signs of damage or mechanical failure, and put simply, we couldn't see any. So there was a good chance that, that ended up just being driver error. Then we saw the session develop, and initially it looked as if lap times were going to be quite close, but we ended up seeing compared to less than a tenth in qualifying, rather big gaps at the front. Don't expect that to carry through to the race. There'll be slip streaming, there'll be moves thrown up the inside, there'll be all that sort of stuff. And as you can see on the shot right now, a lot of water in certain breaking zones. This one is the old hairpin. Round at turn one, we're expecting that to be chaos too. So here is your grid then for the first race of today's action. It's Declan Lee, second in the championship. Won a race in the, in the previous uh, run from Steve Kite. Next up, Alex Miller and Dan Parron-Smith. John Langridge, our championship leader, starts from the, ro the third row in fifth place alongside Simon Fleet in the uh, uh, striking Chiffy Winks car in the 55. Then comes Nicholas Stott and Alex Wilkinson-Hughes on row four, followed by Xavier Brook and Raymond Worley, uh, who is driving one of the many Boreham Motorsport cars here. Raymond is the, uh, is the team manager, effectively, of that Boreham Motorsport. Then is Drew Fletcher on row six, followed by Reese Warwick um, in uh, the number 11. And then Martin Heath and Roan Lundy are on row seven. Uh, then we have on row eight, Alistair Eason and Jack Hargreaves. Uh, all of these drivers so far in the NC Mark III class, uh, as is Chun Chong Ip and Chaz Allen on a row nine who are next, and then Steve Rollison uh, will start alongside Liam Cochran, who did take part in Super Bowl because he is the solo NA Mark I class um, entrant. And with them, we have a guest class in the purple number there, number six, Brian Chandler Motorsport, who appropriately is numbered as, uh, as, as uh, in purple because that is the, number, the color of his uh, Mark IV ND class um, vehicle. Um, and uh, that is purple and, uh, and silver. Uh, but the, uh, the drivers, Tom, getting ready to uh, start their green flag lap. 
They are indeed. They actually start this from round in the Melbourne Loop, which of course we're not using today. So where you can see there, that corner, that is not part of the race. That's simply to get it ready to go. And this is going to be a very, very important sighting lap. Crucially, where well, you've just seen your lead car, Declan, go across there. There's well, yesterday, points. I must just interject as he as he goes into that red gate corner. Yesterday, in similar conditions, that's exactly where Declan they ended up in the gravel. <laughs> Various points on the circuit where the standing water level increases suddenly and dramatically, yeah. which of course leads to aquaplaning, and then you really do have to be careful about getting off the brakes and off the steering, despite the fact you're headed straight for a gravel trap. It's quite a counterintuitive experience. And a lot of spray too down the Craner curves. It does look like it's going to be a significant challenge for our Miata Trophy. We, we enjoyed, back in Anglesey, we enjoyed um, idyllic um, coastal. It was, it was calm winds, it was bakingly hot. The drivers uh, were, were prepared for the worst going out to Anglesey and, uh, and actually got tremendous, uh, tremendous conditions. But here, a completely different um, kind of championship order upsetting kind of uh, set of conditions. And there you have championship leader uh, John Langridge uh, with the white bonnet and uh, kind of uh, gunmetal um, car. He is um, he's out of position um, and down uh, into uh, further back than he would like. It's interesting, him and his team were expecting a difficult weekend. Then they came into qualifying. They were immediately within a tenth of the pace. They looked brilliant. Yep. And we were all going, oh, they were lying, you know, putting down the expectations, all that sort of stuff. Where does he start? Down in the midfield. <laughs> and it's immediately gone closer to what he was expecting it to be again. Notably, not too much weaving going on either. Drivers being very, very <laughs> cautious, even on what is an outlap to the grid. Yeah, you saw a lot. Of, there's a little compression in the middle of the rubber chicane there to finish the lap. And you saw the amount of uh, spray that... Uh, that uh, Declan Lee kicked up just going into that compression and back out again. And the drivers have actually been given a second green flam flag lap here, presumably to uh, test the conditions and, and indicate to uh, to the clerk of the course that uh, that this race is 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 fit enough to run uh, and and that at least they can um, they can try and shed some water off the racing line. Indeed, this isn't an issue whereby the track maybe is too wet or anything like this. It's a motorsport UK standard whereby if the conditions are significantly different from the previous session. We we give two green flag laps and it just helps smooth out some of the sort of otherwise inevitable accidents that you see on the first lap by allowing the drivers to go, do you know what, I can be really careful on the first green flag lap and start to find where I think the grip is going to be on the second one rather than having to jump straight to it when in theory you should be being nice and careful on your way to the grid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, completely uh, agree. You'll, you'll notice some, some very striking liveries here, which uh, as, a, as, as a commentary team, we, we really appreciate and give our, uh, give our full support behind. Um, it makes a, a world of difference. There is our championship leader, John Langridge. He's got the metallic green headlights as well. Um, and then you've got a lot of pink and blue, kind of Miami uh, kind of colors schemes predominate. Um, the, um, you will see the sun visor strip um, is different apart, uh, for, between the different classes of cars, but um, for the vast majority of the cars today, it, is, it does have the, the blue uh, sides to the uh, to the sun visor strip indicating that they're running the Mark III or NC class uh, of MX-5 model. Onto the grid, they will come in just a moment then. This is the view towards the last chicane. Expect to see plenty of overtaking here once we get into the, the first lap of the race. It's a big braking zone, but it also tempts you down to the inside because before you know it, the door has been closed because you're trying to set up the exit all the way through. So if you arrive too late, you will end up having contact. So you've got to commit to that overtake, which almost makes it even more exciting to watch because they're diving in on the brakes, forcing both players wide. And before you know it, we'll be seeing that for 20 minutes. 20 minutes of racing for the first race uh, for this uh, this group today. They will be back again later on. I think they are, in fact, the last race we have on our coverage today. So um, we're topping and tailing uh, our, uh, our afternoon's coverage with the Miata Trophy. Um, as there you see, the, the NA or Mark 1 and the Mark 4 starting at the back of the grid because uh, we, we stagger the classes. However, car number 94 did qualify in Super Bowl um, because uh, he was the leader of his own class. Uh, so almost all of the cars are ready to go, Tom, and we, uh, we're, we're ready to get under starters' orders. We are. We'll have the last sort of three or four rows here pull up onto the grid. The marshal's doing a fantastic job at ever as getting everybody lined up into the correct spot for what is a very, very dense grid. We've got them lined up in sort of pairs of two all the way along, and then the rows are incredibly close to each other as well. 
They are, absolutely, they're, and they're staggered slightly as well. So um, everyone is looking at at least a, a few metres of, uh, of clear tarmac in front of them. Um, but uh, I do expect things to get a little bit dicey into Redgate the first time. Green flag at the back, and now we'll turn our eyes to the gantry to get this one underway. So Declan Lee will lead us um, away from the grid. Uh, alongside with him, Steve Kite, and they are on their uh, on. They are go, and uh, Declan Lee with a good um, good initial bite away from the car, but he has got the uh, the slightly wetter line on the way, but it's the inside right line into Redgate as Dan Parent smith goes around the outside in the white and orange um, uh, MX-5, but uh, Steve Kite just about holding on, and Alex Miller into that third position will now be more challenging Steve Kite as they head down um, the... Uh, down towards the hill through Hollywood, and it's Declan Lee who's got ahead and opened up quite a nice gap already. And that is the, uh, the it looks like we've got uh, Dan Parent Smith just following up behind in the second white car and John Langridge side by side. That is uh, John who is leading the championship, making an early move here. Down they go, but it's not quite going to go through because it's got better grip on the outside there, Tom. John Langridge was very cautious into the pinch point that is Redgate on the first lap. He's now trying to make some progress, but at the front it is Declan Lee who's made a very good start. He's initially put a couple of car lengths into it. He's trying to extend that even further now from Steve Kite and in turn Alex Miller who runs third. Good battle developing then for pretty much all the positions down from that fourth onwards. Absolutely. Plenty of side-by-side -side action starting um, as they head up then the hill to turn right and someone was very far offline at that point. It looks like Aaron Smith is uh, following behind the similar livery predominantly white car of Simon Fleet who has moved up um, a good amount of places at least two from his start position but this is then your race leader Declan Lee just uh, just skirting those tire walls uh, tire barriers as he comes through away from uh, Kite and then we have Miller and then Dan Parent Smith chasing down super close behind Simon Fleet as they head towards Redgate. I don't know if Dan Parent Smith will go for a move here. But there's plenty of side by side uh, attempts on, on, on their way in, but Fleet moves to the inside. Parent Smith on the racing line where it is a slightly drier, and John Langridge going down the inside of car number four and uh, making the move stick. That was um, Stott, I think. Yeah, Stott was uh, was just uh, just passed then by Langridge up to sixth place already. That was actually almost defensive driving for Langridge because he was mugged on the way out of the chicane, had to regain that place on the brakes, and all of that means that a gap has opened up between himself and Parron Smith ahead. Just behind that, there's a lovely little trio battling, and that's where you see the defensive line coming into it. It is possible to make the move down at the old hairpin, but you've got to have it set up. As soon as it's covered off, you cannot force it. That's right, Parron Smith did get past in that, uh, just out of shot, he got past uh, uh, Stott, uh, sorry, Fleet into uh, into that old hairpin. So he uh, he shaped up the move all the way through the craners and committed to the inside early on and managed to commit the uh, complete the move up to fifth place now for Parent Smith. But Declan Lee still leads by 1.4 seconds. That 26 car is Drew Fletcher, who's been trying to make progress up the way and is actually in a couple of positions on that last. Here is Nick Stott. Stott tucked into the wheel tracks of John Langridge, who's now trying to make progress and traverse the gap towards what would be fifth and sixth positions for Parent Smith and st Stott up ahead of him. Here is Declan Lee. He still leads from a big margin now over Steve Kite, who in turn has Alex Miller right in tow. Fastest lap of the race for Declan Lee. Absolutely. And a big sideways moment there coming on out of the Robert chicane. It is very, very loose on the way through as John Langridge has got caught up behind Fleet now as well and is looking to make a, a, an attempted move in the, on the way into Redgate. John Langridge down on the inside. He's managed to capture the apex slightly, but it looks like Fleet holds on around the outside, taking it the long way but on screen we also then have a battle between the 55 and the 101 and this is uh, competing here for that 10th position just uh, just down in the midfield but kite holds on from miller in second place towards the bottom of the hill they go then you're not going to believe this but the rain just starting to fall once again so as it was drying the weather gods say oh no you don't and they make the track nice and slippery again there is your class leader in na doing a very good job in the midfield but the battle is all developing for second place kite is becoming more and more defensive from alex miller behind miller he looks towards the inside here actually on entrance to coppice it would be brave to go up on the brakes there there's no room he'll have to wait and play the game on traction yeah and uh, as you say traction coming out he's uh, got a slightly friendlier line going through the corner and, and cuts in for uh, for a second opportunity and he'll 
tuck in for that slipstream. Uh, we we'll cut over to Declan Lee here, our leader, and you'll see a wicked puddle kick up as he goes through this chicane uh, on the curbs here. And uh, you're not really done until you're well past the exit curves here. It's, you're not out of the woods uh, when it comes to, uh, to grip levels. But there is Kite and we have Alex Miller who successfully got through, presumably on the entry into, into the chicane. It's the move we were talking about just moments before the race started, actually. Get alongside on the brakes before you know it, your rival cannot turn in because you're already filling the space. Next target for Miller at the front then is to see what he can do on this lap and whether he can make any indents into the 3.8 second lead that Declan Lee has. Meanwhile, Steve Kite, he's just lost a position. He has to be careful that he doesn't lose any more because he's actually losing time to the likes of Parent Smith and Langridge behind. Absolutely. Now, um, this is Fleet still on the defensive. He's slipped down the order. He had a tr tremendous start, but unfortunately, um, he's uh, settling into what was roughly his qualifying pace, which is not quite with the leaders as the 88 tries to, uh, tries to make a move past here. This is Rowan Lundy uh, battling with, with Fleet. Um, and uh, soon to be joined by a third car behind as well. Rowan Lundy looking for that opportunity. Will the door open? It will not, <laughs> going into the old hairpin there. Lundy looking for that pass then. He is almost alongside, and he is alongside. He has the overlap on the run towards Coppice. The issue is going to be he's going to be pinned all the way, the long way round here at the oh, wow, ever-lengthening right-hander on the curb, on the traction. He's on the wet stuff. He doesn't care. Rowan Lundy up a position. Fantastic overtake. Yeah, best, uh, best overtake so far we've witnessed anyway um, going around the outside that, that time. Uh, so Declan Lee's gap. Uh, we shall monitor as it comes through, but it looks like actually um, Alex Miller hasn't been able to um, to put much of a gap. <laughs> Another massive slide for the 88 for uh, for Rowan Lundy coming out of the Robert Chicane. That's the second time he's been that way, that sideways. Still 13 minutes left to go in this one, actually. So plenty of action yet to come. This is the four car of Nicholas Stott trying to make some progress now. Be forced to go the long way around. Tried to get back past the number 70, but there's no opportunity there. Swings it out. We'll try and carry all the momentum through Redgate. Now through Hollywood. And before you know it, you're dropping down the hill, plummeting as you go. It will be across to the right. Now it's all about sticking tight to the left here because you want to try and carry the momentum at the bottom. This is the most important bit, old hairpin, on the brakes, off the brakes, nose in, normally you'd be riding a lot of curb there, but of course in the wet it's far too slippery to even consider doing so. I see the different drivers are trying out different lines, and uh, that was another sideways moment for the number 15, I think it was, who uh, just had, uh, that was Chun, who went through there, um, who uh, managed to hold on to the car, but it was, uh, it was a real struggle going through the craners. Good to see that Liam Cochran is actually trying to make progress through some cars in <laughs> positions oh, further the up himself, the but that NA is Liam Cochran, yeah. who has found himself off the road. And it's the classic commentator's cars. We've said he's doing well, he's attacking fast the cars before you know, he finds himself actually on an escape road there, so he should be able to get going I was going to say, again. he managed to manage get the car stopped on the tarmac, so hopefully uh, it will be a temporary yellow flag for, uh, for our only uh, NA. As Declan Lee picks up the new fastest lap, a 131.0, uh, as the track is drying out slightly, that, um, that tiny little shower that we had um, has passed and Fleet is still on the defensive once again. And it looks like the 88 um, of, um, of Lundy has lost out in this battle to these two cars at the moment as they go side by side, almost wing mirrors touching Tom going into Redgate. It's going to be Brooke has to try and find a way to cover it off, which is what he's done. Then Stott would swap back, try and get to the inside, but there's no opportunity there because Rowan Lundy is now carrying the momentum on the pair of them. It'll be Rowan Lundy around the outside. Here is John Langridge. Langridge finding himself up ahead of Parent Smith, he actually. So he's two. made a position yeah. up into fourth. But here is the battle that is the most exciting on track road. Oh. Lundy breaks on the curb. Around he goes into the gravel trap. He'll try and keep it going, but to no, no avail. Stranded. That could be yellow flags or even a safety car with 11 minutes and 20 seconds on the clock. Yeah, he has obviously been struggling no end with the rear end of, of, of that uh, MX-5 NC. Uh, it's been a real difficulty for him to keep the tail under control, and it just let go of him there under braking. Still the battle develops between the other two that were in that fight, however, it should be said. Brooke and Stott trying to get going. Marshalls, I tell you what, they'll need to go to the gym a bit more to try and get that car moving. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely no chance of that. But to the inside now, on the cutback, Stott in the black, pink and blue car, the number four. Brilliant run. Was able to get off the steering earlier, which means he can get on the power more aggressively. And that should be job done in towards the chicane. Yeah, just needs to break um, safely here into the Robert chicane. Uh, fleet on the outside. Uh, sorry. Uh, 
Stott on the outside just holding on at the moment, but Brooke did complete the move fully, uh, going through the Robert chicane uh, at the end of the lap, but uh, we are expecting to see yellow flags waved uh, where, that, um, where that car was beached. As Lundy, of course. Yes, yeah, so that's Stott up through. Brooke will try to the outside. There's not going to be an opportunity there, but Redgate tightens all the way. So if you can get off the steering, maybe you can find a cut back to sides instead to try and hang it out around the outside. But it ends up on the damp curbing, which of course doesn't dry as quickly and has to back out of the throttle for that one. Here is John Langridge. John Langridge is your championship leader in that dark green and white car. He's made up the position on the previously positioned number 73 car and he's up into fourth now his issue is it is a long way until he sees the next guy some four seconds before he would be attacking for the podium absolutely but there's uh, there's no need to give up at this stage as there's the number four who has uh, gone off on the almost exact same position as the 88 did, did manage to as well and uh, i'm not sure the momentum's going to quite stay with them as they're going to uh, end up uh, beached again and uh, you just saw the uh, the two axles dip down as the momentum was lost going through the gravel so it will be um, for sure we'll have double we'll have yellows through the old heaven that uh yeah not what we, he would have been hoping for so close to getting it out yellows on the start finish straight it's as well car, and unfortunately for the safety yeah. car we have now with two cars um, parked up on the gravel and that is a, a safety car so Declan Lee's lead uh, intriguingly, his lead is going to be cut uh, to, uh, to virtually nothing. He had extended that out to over six seconds, uh, which is no mean feat in these uh, very, very equalized performance MX-5s here that are all race prepped uh, and ready to go. Um, very, um, very, very uh, nice, tight uh, championship so far. Uh, but John Langridge, I'm assuming, will be smiling at the idea of a safety car at this stage. He is benefiting massively from this, it should be said. We just commented on how he had the pace, but it had taken him so long to get through the traffic that the job ahead of him was going to be absolutely massive. Now, it is done for him. He closes up. He's going to be sat right on the back of the leaders, minus one of the lapped cars in there, actually. So hopefully that one gets cleared from the field ahead. That'll be Allen, I believe, in the 48 machine. But so far, your order looks like this. Declan Lee is ahead of Alex Miller. Then you'll find Steve Kite in third and, crucially, John Langer, championship leader, in fourth position. Then you'll find Daniel Parron-Smith and everybody else follows in behind with currently Brooke getting the advantage. That's Xavier Brooke in that incredible squabble for sixth position. Absolutely, yeah. We've um, we've been, had a thrill ride already here. There are under eight minutes to go um, once the cars have been cleared from the uh, from the gravel, um, but I'm not quite sure how long that's going to take because we've got two to clear. Um, the marshals uh, work tremendously hard to to get us racing as quickly as possible, but we're just slightly unsighted from the scene of uh, both those stranded cars at this stage. So um, we're trying to, uh, to, to to get a a good look at uh, how the recovery operation is happening. Um, but uh, they're staying on the racing line, of course, to, uh, to maintain that grippy surface and make sure that, uh, that their cars remain. It's, it, they want to make sure that the tyres remain up to temperature, but I'm not sure that weaving is going to do them much favours because you're just going to pick up pedal puddles at this point. Nicholas Stott is a long way into the gravel trap. He was in that blue and plink car that we saw ending himself by uh, almost getting on the throttle to try and carry the momentum through the gravel trap and then digging himself into a hole, which was rather unfortunate. He's a long way in. There's a chance we don't even have to recover that one because of how deep into that he is. He might be in not such a dangerous position. So it'll be all about getting the initially stranded car of, I believe it was Ruin Lundy, out of the way. And then we should be able to get racing again. We do actually have just under seven minutes on the clock still, which is encouraging. That, for reference, that tyre barrier, this is uh, Nicholas Stott, and we were just speaking about him. It's a long, long way to get there. So he's been on the throttle for some time, so I wouldn't be too worried about the recovery of that one. It's just the Lundy machine that we'll want to get off the circuit. Absolutely. Well, we're just um, just sorting out the order here, of course, um, and uh, further down outside of the, the order that we already uh, went through. Uh, you will find Fleet in 7th, Fletcher in 8th, followed by Wells and Warwick, Eason and Chun, followed by Heath and Worley, Hargreaves, Wilkinson Hughes and Cochran, uh, who managed, I think, to get, get, get going again um, after having that, uh, that moment uh, sideways. So uh, he did manage to park on the, uh, on the escape road and, and would find a, an easy way back onto the racetrack. Rollison um, in 18th, 
Allen in 19th and then having stopped uh, for various reasons, Stott, Lundy, Cooper and Smith uh, so far. So um, the, guest, uh, the guest class um, of the Mark IV is in 9th. That's Wells driving that one, the number six. Um, and uh, then we have the NA of Cochrane, who is clearly obviously leading his own class because he's the only one here. We are going to uh, recover the Nicholas Stock car as well, actually. We just saw the big green grabber machine pulling up to not grab. It's going to try and tow. So into the gravel trap it goes. And actually, there is a little gap in the yeah. tyre wall there. So should be able to get this one sorted nice and quickly. Brilliant line in reverse, showing us how it's done. Is <laughs> Nicholas Stock as he is hauled out of the gravel. He was very, very deep in that. I reckon there's going to be quite a bit of a... Well, you could always make a new gravel trap in the pit lane afterwards with the, with the state of that We've one. had that a few times already over this racing weekend where uh, the clear-out operation has begun. And, and uh, I remember Ray Worley remarking yesterday to one of his drivers, uh, we can start a rockery with what we've managed to collect out of, uh, out of your bumpers. So uh, it is... Um, these Mazdas, unfortunately, do pick up quite a lot of, of, uh, of detritus once they, uh, once they get it wrong and get onto that gravel. Light's still on on the safety car, which means we'll be going around for at least one more tour. When we are ready to go racing, you'll see those lights go off. So if you're new to this sort of stuff or you've just not noticed it before, we've got the lights on the top of the safety car. They flash, 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 flash. And at some stage, generally with about half a lap, sometimes a little bit less to go, they will turn off the safety car, will speed off into the distance. And that is when the pace will be handed over to Declan Lee to dictate how he chooses to restart. Absolutely, yeah. Uh I do think John Langridge has got the pace under these race conditions to move forward and potentially um, get into um, at least a podium, if not start to challenge. But the time is ticking down. We have about four minutes remaining, um, four minutes exactly as I speak right now, uh, remaining of the race. So it is, it is certainly going to be a significant challenge to move forward uh, and to get back onto um, you know, the race pace after running at this, at this slower, reduced pace for now. It'll be a two-lap sprint if if you like come the finish because by the time we get back round we're lapping just around about one minute 30 if you like yeah that is three minutes if you like for two laps which of course we won't have time for however we will complete the lap we're on we will have more than one minute 30 left to go so two lap sprint to the finish whole pack closed up john langridge back into intention one part of his brain will be telling him this is already a good salvage job you don't need anymore. And another part, we'll see Declan Lee and think, I can have him here. <laughs> so there will be the, the angel and the demon on either shoulder. Absolutely. The only, the only slight spanner in the works here is going to be this lapped car out of, of position. Of um, This is the, was it the 43? It's the 48, 48 of Chaz Allen. Of Allen, of Allen. yeah. I'm uh, misreading my, my second numeral there. But uh, yeah, Chaz Allen who um, hopefully will move aside before they enter Redgate and let at least a few of these cars through. Um, but he's in his own race, of course, but uh, he's a long way away from, uh, from the rest of, uh, of, of the competitive order. From, uh, he's in 19th, but uh, he'll hope to uh, pick up uh, a place or two from attrition. Um, but I'm expecting things to get a little bit uh, tasty. And there are the lights out on the top of the safety car. So that will come in. And Declan Lee has uh, appear apparently already bolted. He's already gone. He's kept every he's caught everybody else napping. He's not going to let go of his, uh, his gap that he already built up here. And that is the problem of having the lap car in amongst the, the leaders as Declan Lee screams away from the start uh, from the start line and uh, opens the gap to four seconds already. Uh, Alex Miller, John Langridge uh, is having a little look on the back of Kite there as who in turn is looking um, for an opportunity on John Langridge's teammate, Miller. So John Langridge going for that uh, coat back uh, Dan Parra Smith following uh, behind and paying a watching brief at this stage. But here is Declan Lee, the leader, as they go down the hill and through the craners. We've got side by side between Kite and between John Langridge, who braves it out on the outside and completes the move before they even dare touch the brakes on the way into the old hairpin. Fantastic from Langridge. He's now got to try and move up towards Alex Miller because the leader is long gone. That was the 48 car. I think he was trying to get out of the way before the line. Nobody else was allowed to pass him. And actually, I wonder if Alex Miller did pass him before the line here because he simply had no other choice so there's a conversation to be had after this one but for now John Langridge up to third he's still not quite done with Kite who's trying to apply pressure behind in that black car with the bright orange lettering on the side however Langridge he's eyes forward he's on the attack he'll have one to go this time through it's an interesting uh, interesting uh, teammate decision here Miller uh, owns the team um, but he's third in the championship uh, but some distance away from both Declan Lee and John Langridge. And now he's got John behind him. So it's going to be a very interesting call. And it's going to be basically on Miller's shoulders as to whether he cooperates with John or whether they fancy a race together. 
It'll be, uh, as you say, an interesting one. I reckon they'll probably allow them to get on with it. New fastest speed trap from Deck only that time through, which is very, very impressive. Here he comes. This will be his last lap, we reckon. He's into Redgate. John Langridge almost has to defend there, but crests himself on the brakes, is able to get the car stopped and turned in. Kite's not done with this one yet. He fancies a little lunch up the inside. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone uh, raises their game to fight with the, the leaders of the championship, and that's just, just part of being a uh, champion elect, as it were. We're only halfway through the season, not even just yet. Uh, this is round three of six here at, uh, at Donington this weekend, but um, certainly the uh, the cream is already rising to the top. John Language has now got himself that gap he, he, that's all important, but he's uh, he's some distance away from Alex Miller um, in the uh, in the second position and uh, if he if he continues to drag a uh, kite along with him tom i don't think alex will be uh, of a mind to try and let him through no the question will be how much does kite fancy a lunge up the inside into the chicane i reckon rather than the other way around your leader is long gone this is from second down the way i tell you what alex miller is actually being reeled in here but it will probably be just a little bit too little too late at this stage as they're already headed towards the last couple of corners yeah definitely well declan lee is approaching the robert chicane uh, and uh, he won uh, one of the races in anglesey and uh, today he's been completely untouchable declan lee wins uh, the Donington uh, race one, the race five of the championship from Alex Miller, who crosses the line in second, ahead of his teammate John Langridge in third. Dan Parron-Smith got, uh, got Kite at the end. Um, and so Dan Parron-Smith into fourth, uh, Kite in fifth, and then Brooks and Fletcher in sixth and seventh. Fastest lap of the race on the last lap from John Langridge as well, which is absolutely <laughs> stunning. He was giving it some to try and get there, just not quite enough time left on the clock. Last few cars coming across the line, notably number 94, which is of course your class NA Victor, I suppose, despite him not having any competition. So Liam Cochran getting it to the end in that one. But worth saying, of course, Cochran started on the last row of the grid and got himself up to 14th and was off track at one point. So he's certainly no slouch in that NA. No, and the yeah. NAs aren't slow either, it's no. worth remembering. They are a little bit lighter. But here's your race leader, Declan Lee. Fantastic. Averaging 68.86 miles an hour around a circuit with a safety car period. Uh, I tremendous. think that's very, very impressive. It really was. Uh, it was all, um, all consolidated in that, um, in that safety car in period in the restart when the lapped driver of Chaz Allen um, went, it wasn't on the tail of the leader effectively but Declan Lee waving to everybody he's, uh, he's obviously very very well pleased with that I might pop down and see if I might uh, get a chat with them with one or two of our podium sitters. Perfect in the meantime then we shall confirm your order it was Declan Lee from Alex Miller with John Langridge rounding out your podium and also taking the honours of fastest lap with the 130.373 just behind that you'll find Daniel Parent Smith in fourth ahead of Steve Kite who was nicked at the line Xavier Brook finished in sixth ahead of Simon Fleet and Drew Fletcher your top ten rounded out by Rhys Warwick and Chung Cheong Ip down towards the fringes of the top ten Top 10 only separated by 17 and a half seconds or so, which is really quite remarkable. Just beyond that, you'll find Martin Heath ahead of Raymond Worley. Jack Hargreaves found himself up to 13th, a good recovery drive from him ahead of 14th place. Liam Cochran, who was able to uh, fight his way through the field, back down and back up again. Non-finishers towards the back, Rowan Lundy dropped it at the bottom of the hill, Rich Cooper and Gary Smith not able to reach the finish. Another fantastic race then. These guys, don't worry, they will be back as we proceed through the day's action. They are set to be out as the last race of the day, actually, at around about 10 to 6. So if you've enjoyed the Miata Trophy, make sure you are around at 5.50. And I reckon we might even be ahead of schedule by then because the guys here at Donington are doing such an amazing job. So leave yourself a bit of margin before that one. And also, whilst we scamper down there for some Bitlane interviews, remember that we are just live now. We're streaming all of the races over on the MSVR YouTube channel. We've got Sports 2000s, their historic class up next. We've got some super carts again, Track Day Trophy, and of course the Clubman Sports prototypes coming up all over the course of the day. Down in pit lane, however, cars recover, they come back in. We've got most of the pieces for most of the cars. <laughs> well, There's a few cars where we are recovering most of the pieces from out on circuit, including the 101, actually, of Alex Wilkinson Hughes, who is stranded at McLean. So we'll wait and see for him to come back. Most of the cars will wind their way around into the paddock. 
Hopefully, they're not running away too much from Andy Webster, who's down there trying to catch a couple of words first. He's got microphone in hand, and I'm sure he's got some speedy legs underneath him as he tries to shackle some drivers into some interviews. I can assure you it's always like herding kites. Uh, kites? Well, I suppose on this occasion it's not, actually, because he fell off the podium, but like herding cats down there as you try and uh, assemble the appropriate drivers looking for uh, overall top three and potentially class winner, actually, as well in the form of Liam Cochran. Marshall's making sure the naughty bit of the track is uh, kicked back into order there. <laughs> Not where uh, travel, gravel has been dragged on, of course, and we get the brooms out. Everybody working very hard, as usual, and it gives us a good chance to say thank you to the Marshalls. The 101 car of Alex Wilkinson Hughes initially looked as if it had gotten lost on the way out of the circuit, but now we can see on our sort of uh, CCTV-style cameras that actually we've got the bonnet up on that one, so not everything as it would seem to be appropriate on the 101 of Wilkinson Hughes. And this shot gives you a good chance, actually, to grasp just how windy it is here at Donington today. All the flags on view and all of them looking very, very blustery indeed, as they'll uh, no doubt be causing issues for the drivers. The wind, of course, not the flags themselves. The flags, if anything, give you a little bit of a help because it means if the wind changes direction, you've got a chance to see it if, of course, you're on the uh, mental capacity to do so. <laughs> but it's with so much going on all the time in these particular cars. Down at McLean's, uh, we actually have the big green grabber machine out there to recover some cars so that should be happening before too long as well and I'm sure language will be eyeing up his chances for the later races actually here as well because he was almost there on competition pace he was almost there to the lead of the race as well if he hadn't been unfortunate with that strange situation due to the back marker at the head of the safety car field Still, we'll wait for these interviews in amongst all of this then. Some more <laughs> stamping of the track from the marshals on them as well, which is um, most of the time it appears to be kicking to, of course, get gravel off. But every now and again, there is a, a firm stomp down on the track, which is always a bit more <laughs> of a, an interesting approach for this one. In, it is drying up, though, of course. You'll remember the shot, that very same shot at the beginning of the race showed grey and bleak and flat lighting with a little bit of rain and moisture in the air, whereas now we've got some sun peeking through the clouds. The contrary is this shot, of course, which looks back where the rain has just passed through, and that shows what was overhead at the very beginning of this race, although we're hoping it'll stay dry for some time now. There is some more showers scheduled towards the end of the day, but a chance, or at least a, an apparent chance, that it remains on the sunnier side for a little while. Still the cleanup operation goes on then. There was quite a few, although we didn't end up with too many cars off circuit, so to speak, as, <laughs> as I say that, I turn and look at the camera of one of the recoveries, but there was quite a number who found themselves bringing some gravel back onto the track, if you like, and able to continue with their race, but giving our fantastic Marshall team a little bit of work to do here. Three or four people there seem to be putting in quite a lot of effort, it should be said. One is uh, <laughs> not, not quite so involved in that recovery. Um, I suppose there are only two brushes to go around, it should be said, so there's only so much can be done. All right, she comes.
So, in amongst all of this one then, we will not be having podium interviews. I'm joined back up in the commentary box by Andy Webster. Andy, I think it's safe to say there's a little bit of controversy. We commented that we'd seen somebody get very close to overtaking behind the safety car on the restart. There's a chance that there was at least one instance of overtaking behind the safety car a long time before the said restart as well. So, there's discussions, inquiries, debates, you name it, it's all happening down the stairs from us. Yep, and they all drove past me as well. So, um, <laughs> I'm not wearing bright enough colours, I think, to get anybody's attention, but perhaps they'd already received instruction to, uh, to uh, not attend. Uh, and any, any podium ceremonies. I will be trying to be a quick quicker down the stairs, but I think if I reach, uh, if I overstep my, uh, my grip ratio down those stairs, I think I'm, I'll come into trouble. So I'm going to still leave a margin for error going down them, uh, but uh, I will try and get hold of our drivers uh, at the end of the sessions um, uh, with a little bit more speed. But um, so the provisional results there, of course, from the Miata Trophy, um, but um, we still were entertained thoroughly despite a safety car. And now you can see it's glorious sunshine once once again, nothing is going to surprise me today because on my eight-minute drive into the circuit, the weather changed three times. So uh, <laughs> this is um, it's, it's absolutely uh, just one of those highly changeable days today, not least because of these big gusting crosswinds that we are suffering today. Recovery operation still going on for the 101 car. Interesting that that one managed to pull off the road but now won't tow back to the pit lane. So it's going to require a flatbed lift and presumably quite a long look once it is returned. This is the last piece of recovery, however. So once we've got that one, we actually already have our next race out behind us, ready to ready to get going and underway. So we should be able to keep the action flowing, starting with the Sports 2000 Championship and hopefully beyond that once we've got this, well, what's left of a car? <laughs> because something's not quite right. Once we've got the, uh, the stationary car <laughs> that has no option to be anything other than stationary back off of the circuit. There's a plenty of time though, because the Miata Trophy is the final race of today. Uh, so not until a scheduled start time of um, 10 to 6 this evening, our UK time, if you're watching with us here internationally, as that's UK time, um, that um, we, um, we'll, we will see them. So they've got a fair amount of time here to get, uh, get themselves organised and, uh, and try and action any repairs on the 101. Uh, but uh, as you say, coming up next is the Sports 2000 Championship on the historic race. Yes, these guys were absolutely brilliant earlier, and I can't wait to get into this, actually. As usual, we'll do all the build-up and all that sort of stuff when it comes round to it. But, for now, we stay calm, we think about the rest of the day. Of course, tomorrow is totally different as well, because we get the wonderful arrival of the Enduro car set up. Now, if you have something to do tomorrow, if you're sat there and you're thinking, oh, I've got some paperwork to do, I've got some life admin to catch up on, got a phone and sit on hold with somebody from the gas company, the <laughs> electricity company, for hours and hours and hours, the Enduro car is going to be perfect for you, because what we've got is cars on track, a little bit of racing, and then almost cricket and podcast and comedy shows and all that sort of stuff thrown in for tomorrow's setup, which will be absolutely brilliant. So you might see five hours of a Duraca and get worried, but don't do it at all. Here, however, is your grid for the Sports 2000 Championship up next. Nick Johnson on pole ahead of Charlie Hyatt. And the second row is where you'll find Paul Street and Mike Fry. All of these top couple of rows filled with the sort of people we're used to seeing contend for victory. Row three, that's David Williams in the 92 ahead of Chris Snowden in the 32. David Williams' Lola is beautiful in the almost lotus colours. Charlie Beasley and Ross Hyatt go in 7th and 8th respectively. Your top 10 completed by Clive Steeper, another championship stalwart, ahead of Patrick Egan in the number 90. Andreas Floth goes from 11th place in the 79 car, ahead of Richard Cook in the 16. With row 7 being David Muse and Nick Bailey. Row 8 is John Dean Bowers and Mark Hobbs in his Tiger, another wonderful car. And before you know it, the grid is complete. They're headed out on circuit right now, a lot of weaving, looking to try and get a gauge on which tires we're on here as well, because it is no longer raining, it's definitely greasy. I would want to be on slicks, but of course they've been sat around the back of the circuit for a little while, so they've not had the most recent information to prepare with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm sure that uh, their engineers are, are, are tuning in to the various uh, streams and, and, and commentary that we're dealing with and have been trying to gauge it. There's a definite dry line all, all the way down this, the Wheatcroft Strait here and into it, into Redgate. Um, the sun is out, the wind is blowing, as it, as it I think will do for the weekend, um, but um, yeah, so far 
Um, it, it, this is this is slick running, quite frankly. Um, uh, apart from maybe down at the old hairpin, but even down there, the cars are looking. Um, the, the line is looking pretty dry. Fantastic shot just a moment ago at the back of the pack. The number two all yellow Shrike. Absolutely fantastic car. We don't see many of these at all anymore, and yet when you do, you wonder why, because they are fantastic, and it's a perfect example of that tail overhang at the back. These are the historic cars, and you'll see some that hark forwards, if you like, that almost resemble early versions of current prototype style shapes, where you've got downforce centric, quite stocky bodies, but not draggy, so in a sense. And then you've also got some that hark backwards towards sort of the golden age, if you like, where everything is forming this dart through the air that is designed to be as slippery as possible in a straight line and the driver can just cope with it when he reaches a corner absolutely yeah um, but they uh, you know they do look glorious um, and this uh, this color scheme is uh, is very very nice as well um, the drivers just uh, getting through into the Robert chicane then at the uh, end of the lap and getting prepared here I think they'll be going for their second lap it looks like because uh, because our marshals are not um, standing in, in the way the green flag is waving so through they go once again um, and you see a, a, a big mix then of, of whether the, the front wheels, the, the rear wheels are covered um, and uh, whether we have a, a continual uh, teardrop shape on the bodywork or it's more interrupted for, uh, for, for, for key cooling or, or airflow reasons uh, as they go through, uh, through, the, through the air, of course. Um, and you can see various cutouts and, uh, and uh, you know, fascinating different, uh, different shapes on the on the racetrack even the roll roll hoops are different shapes here everything about every single one of these cars you can see the concept if you like and the development of the concept but no two cars are the same it's absolutely fantastic to see out there so we'll get them round to the grid we're expecting them to uh, to get on with it this time through if you like we're deciding that the track conditions are still significantly slippery to require that second green flag lap but after that we will be underway as mentioned at the front of the grid you're looking at the usual suspects Charlie Hyatt is right up there keeping an eye on a clean row ahead and possibly his mirrors down towards turn one because there's been a couple of races this year where Charlie hasn't quite gotten the getaway that he would like to have. That doesn't mean that he's not going to do it this time. In fact, arguably, it means he's had more practice than anybody else. But his form book shows that there's there's a couple blotches in there. There's a little weakness away from the start, but we'll, we'll keep keep our eyes peeled. Of course, you do get the slight advantage of being on the inside approach into Redgate, however. It's about 50-50 at the actual at the front of the grid as to whether you're on or off the racing line. By the time you get to Redgate, of course, the inside is not the racing line, and there may be more grip on the outside. But you've got to be brave on the first uh, approach into that corner because um, it is a bit of an unknown as to what those grip levels are going to be. Through the Robert Chicane they come then. Very wide, I'll say, in that one, actually, for Charlie Hyatt just behind in the 10 car. So... Keep an eye on whether he is all set up and ready to go. He went wide and then has actually had to come back across to the other side of the circuit to get prepared for the race. So maybe maybe scouting out that overtake line. Right. He wants yeah. to make sure he knows what <laughs> the grip what is say. like across <laughs> the surface. That's that's the racing driver's excuse. But on pole and towards the head of the field is the 62 of Nick Johnson. Nick Johnson in the red, Charlie Hyatt in the silver and blue is what you're keeping your eye on. And everybody else will follow through behind. Cars pulling up on the grid. I am very, very excited for this one. Yeah, possibly, in my personal opinion, the best looking cars at the rear of the field. So, <laughs> <laughs> the 12 and the 2 uh, in the golf and the bright yellow uh, colour schemes. But um, we, shall, um, we shall obviously uh, be able to keep our close eye on them and their progress through or at the back of the field. But, of course, we will focus m uh, predominantly on the battle at the front where the big points are being paid. Bright yellow with flames to give it the credit it's due, I think, is the, the appropriate description there. All of the cars are lined up on the grid. We've got 16 of them ready to race. Green flag is waved at the back and we'll turn our eyes to the gantry. The lights will come on when they go out. We race here at Donington Park. All five are illuminated. The engine notes rise and we race. A good start initially from Nick Johnson in the red car. He's got the jump, he's got the lead and he's got his whole car ahead of Charlie 
Charlie Hyatt on the run down towards Redgate for the first time I'm asking. Charlie thinks about the dive. He's pointing his car towards the inside. He's got his nose on the inside. Ooh. He might be through on the inside here as David Williams is mugged further down the order as well. So it's Charlie Hyatt who hits the front after turn number one. Wow. Didn't get the jump, but did have the confidence on the brake. Johnson might have an issue here because he's wide at the next couple of corners as well and looks a sitting duck to the pack behind. Yeah, he's causing a bit of a, uh, of a blockage on the racetrack as through goes uh, the 33 and sneaking down the inside goes the 10 as well and we're trying to, uh, to see if, if there's a move there. It might be actually um, Hyatt in the 70 uh, car who uh, managed to get through that time but uh, it is Hyatt at, at the front of the field in the number 10 who managed to, uh, to secure that lead uh, early doors and uh, the 33 of Fry who's uh, followed him through. So then, halfway through this first lap of racing at this stage, it is going to be quite a big gap at the front. Contact for the back, the 32 car and the 14 come together. That was Chris Snowden and Charlie Beasley. They started near each other on the grid. They're still near each other by the time they come round to complete the first lap of racing. Hands out the car, whether that was anger or admittance, we'll have to wait and see after the race. But the lap one is off the clock, and it's Charlie Hyatt who is at the front. He got the lead in turn number one, and he's happy to lead all all the way across the line on the first occasion. Then it's going to be Paul Street in second place as it stands, and you'll find Mike Fry, former supercar driver. There's a good link into the rest of today's proceedings. He is in third position. Yeah, so clearly um, clearly the supercars um, helping with uh, with these prototypes uh, and in, their, uh, in, in the journey through and into larger engine, faster cars, more downforce kind of journey on these long circuits. But uh, fantastic start there from Charlie Hyde, but he is being caught by Street uh, very quickly already, the, the gap reducing significantly, and we have, uh, we still then have, is that, um, sorry, excuse me, that's Johnson, who is uh, still slowing in the 62 and letting cars by, maybe missing a gear or, or, or something, because uh, he's not super slow, he's not I imminently retiring, but... Uh, but he is moving down the order. Is it possible he's on a wet tyre, maybe, is the only thing I can think of here, because he's not pulling off the road, he's not got any obvious issues stopping the car or accelerating the car, it's just he's slow, for lack of any better imagination of it. He's about to be passed by Dave Muse now, in that wonderful strike with the yellow and fiery livery towards the back of the field, but it is definitely the back of the field. Here comes Muse, and he's gonna get that pass, I reckon, by the time they're at the Robert Chicane. Here are your leaders, passing through that right now. It's still Charlie Hyatt from Paul Street and in turn Mike Fry runs in third. Fry is sort of the start of the rest of the field, if you like. The top two have broken away, and Mike Fry at the head of the battle on screen right now. He's got a couple of squabbles behind him, namely David Williams, who goes all the way around the outside past Ross Hyatt. Fantastic yeah, very, move. Very, very nice move, yeah, indeed. Really, really good. Uh, but it was Besley who was um, looked stronger on the way through the Robert Chicane. He's now defending uh, from the... Uh, the White car on the inside, and there's contact down into the craners. That was a bit speculative, and th yeah, the offender manages to uh, escape unscathed, but the number 70, that was Hyatt. Um, that was Ross Hyatt, who uh, was spun, and uh, part of his um, his fairings have come off and uh, has been dislodged, so I don't know if he's able to get running again. Uh, we haven't seen him uh, running the car number 70 we're looking for to see if he has managed to get back. He did do a full 360. Now he's getting out of the car uh, there, Tom. So uh, it's bad news for him. And honestly, it didn't look like that move was on. It didn't at all. Ross Hyatt was completely within his right to try and take a line. And before you know it, Charlie Beasley was alongside and not giving way. Safety car deployed, as you would very much anticipate. Yeah, there it is, indeed. Uh, so, safety car on its way out, because a driver climbing out of the car um, on the racetrack and on the racing line, such as it is, going through the craners. <laughs> There's multiple lines through there, but a full yellow flag. So, we're two for two so far uh, this afternoon in terms of safety car intervention, but uh, with a few more minutes left on the clock and a much easier recovery job, I think, uh, for the uh, for the uh, our track side um, operatives who uh, do such a great job to recover these cars. Um, but it will condense that field once again. Into the pits this time through actually comes the 32 and the 62. That's going to be Chris Snowden in the 32. And in the 62, your pole sitter, Nick Johnson, in. Keep an eye on this one because we reckon Nick could have been on the wrong tyre. Is he going to be able to change that or is he going to be stranded and simply have to call it a day? 
Oh, yeah, we will be. Uh, we will keep our, uh, a close watch as the as the um, cars are, are catching and passing our stricken uh, st stricken racer. Unfortunately, um, he's just being attended to by the marshals. They're keeping him safe, and the safety car is obviously uh, slowing the rest of the pack down to create a nice large gap for the recovery vehicle to come on and 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 get our uh, race back underway. Of course, uh, but yeah, no real sign of any. There's no jacks going on under the car, but they are attending to the left front um, of, uh, of Johnson. So maybe there might be some something broken or, or misplaced in there, but he uh, didn't seem to come under any contact uh, in the battle into turn one. No, there was no contact at all. He stayed out of everybody's way, and unfortunately, he then just appeared to turn in and not have the grip, which is maybe invocative of a suspension issue, like you say. So something not quite right. It seems to be on that left front corner. The big winners and losers in this one, I think Charlie Hyatt will be okay. He, sh he does appear to have the pace on the field, and similarly, Paul Street looks pretty pacey in second place. The question is going to be that battle for third, because David Williams managed to pass Mike Fry. Mike Fry qualified ahead, and to be honest, in most of the races this year, finishes ahead of David Williams. So there's going to be a brilliant squabble when we get this one back underway for the edge of the podium. Of course, as soon as those guys are fighting, the cars behind in the form of Beasley and Steeper and potentially even Floth can try and get involved ahead of them and find themselves not necessarily fighting for the podium directly, but in that train that starts from third place backwards. Absolutely, yeah, we should, um, we should we'll certainly have a very condensed field here for the remaining minutes of the race, because we started here um, for a 20 minute race and it has been interrupted fairly early. So we're on to about 13 minutes to go. Um, there, should be, there should be time um, for a less, a less than frantic mini sprint to the end of the race. We should actually get some, some, uh, some sensible racing, should we say, um, after the cars are released. Um, but uh, there you have a tractor who's had to come right from outside of the circuit to, uh, to, to tow and, and pick up uh, the car. It's, um, it's taking its time. It's, it's, it's a, it looks like a slightly difficult recovery. It's possible that's not going to be towed. My initial impression of the damage was that it was only external, if you like, because you'll see in the paddock, we take all the bodywork off these cars whenever we want to work on them. The bodywork is purely there for aerodynamic purposes. It's not associated structurally at all. So as much as you'd rather keep it in one piece, it's not the end of the world. If it gets torn apart, you can always just fix it or get a new one. The issue is going to be, I think, that he might have stalled it potentially and getting cars like this started again, particularly when the engine's hot, can be somewhat of a nightmare. So hopefully that's all it is. Of course, whenever you have car-to-car -car contact, there's also a chance that you've had some suspension damage, a tow link's failed, all that sort of stuff. And before you know it, you're looking at more difficult fixes. But we, we always cross our fingers and hope for the best for our drivers. Absolutely. Yeah, hopefully, um, of course, we will. Um, I think, are we seeing these, these drivers again tomorrow? I think we are. We yes. are, yes. So tomorrow after lunch will be the historic. Uh, we'll, we will see the historics once again. So, so there's a there's a fairly large pause um, for for these uh, drivers to try and uh, action any repairs that might be necessary uh, to try and get um, get them back running. Um, but no sign there of our pole sitter uh, coming out of the pits. Uh, does look sadly as if this might be a terminal issue. Very very strange for Nick. He was so quick in qualifying. It was so quick in qualifying, so to have had something like that go wrong, when in theory you've not done anything to the car, is the, the particularly hot bit, because he ran to the end of qualifying, so it's not like he pulled off with an issue and then happened to stay at the top. He ran to the end of qualifying, came in, supposedly nothing's happened to that car, and yet somehow, by the first quarter of the race, it's obviously wounded, and then just drops further and further in terms of the pace over the opening couple of laps. Safety car is across the line, and we'll go around at least one more time. It may only be one more time, depending on how we can get Ross's, Ross Hyatt's car off of the Corona curves. It is lifted. We are suspending it all the way through now across the gravel trap and the grass and associated bits of uh, scenery. The issue is that it seems to be quite wobbly, so there's, there's a bloke there standing there trying to cantilever it all the time to make sure that Ross Hyatt's car doesn't shake itself to pieces. Just confirm that retirement, yeah, from uh, from uh, Johnson, who has um, toured around and gone back towards the paddock. Um, he was driving the car without his helmet, so there was, <laughs> it was clearly not going to compete again. But yes, as you can see, this teeter-totter situation that we've got going on with the 70. Um, uh, I presume that the um, that the lifting point should be the exact center of um, center of gravity on the car, and it and it shouldn't be moving up and down so, quite so violently. But um, it's clearly not quite there because 
this car wants to dip its nose in the gravel, it seems. The, the lifting point on these will be from the roll bar. So, whereas often if you're mounting a lifting hook, if you like, you can, you well, you should find the 50-50 point, although it's easier said than done. With these, it can be, it will be there or thereabouts, but it often requires just that little bit of support. Safety car's going very, very slow towards McLean's, I reckon, in an attempt to try and get yeah. us going again this lap, but it will be extremely marginal as to whether Ross Hyatt's car is off. The tractor is almost through the barrier, which means the car can't be far to follow, but with the queue already at Coppice, it's got to be one more safety car lap. Let's see what happens. Um, I think it's doing its level best, our safety car driver, to, uh, to give that opportunity. Um, the drivers would prefer a um, short-notice safety car restart from a, a further lap. Uh, around, I'm sure, but uh, it's certainly going to be difficult. And there you saw one of the, one of the cars had a central pillar-mounted rear-view mirror um, rather than um, rather than wing mirrors. Uh, so that variance in the uh, in in the structure of the cars and the design uh, is, is is very very apparent and quite dramatic. One of the things we've spotted with those central mirrors as well is that they do sometimes need to be adjusted back towards facing the direction you'd like them. So you'll occasionally see a driver's hand reach out of the cockpit and readjust the central mirror in all of this one. We're expecting this to be the final lap behind the safety car. Couldn't quite get ourselves going again for this time through, but we should be able to get some racing underway with around about six and a half minutes on the clock by the time we've done one more tour behind the BMW. Little uh, bit of information there, so gratefully received from uh, from someone who's just uh, popped up to talk to me, uh, is that uh, Nick Johnson was the only car out on slicks. So everyone else has uh, gone for the intermediates at least, uh, and a wheel nut um, came off, and uh, so he was um, he was protecting the car. It was loose apparently, so it didn't it didn't fully come off, um, but uh, it was enough to uh, upset the balance and handling of the car to the, such an extent, and that explains why he was not fully slow and not fully fast at the same time. But um, you know, great to have that information uh, to to bring to you, um, but um, unfortunate for uh, for Johnson. So obviously going for a braver decision to go for those slicks. I think the correct decision as well. Now that we see the circuit, it is bone dry. We're looking at these pictures and there is not a glimmer, not a sheen. Offline, of course, it looked quite damp, but if you were there, you made the passage, you got the traction at the corner, breeze by on a straight, and before you know it, you're in the lead. Nick would have checked out from this one, I reckon, on slicks, and it's such a shame for him. Yeah, you can see shadows passing over the over the circuit as the wind blows the clouds across the sun, um, and uh, yeah, I think these um, these flags are doing a sterling job for staying on um, their flagpoles today. It's um, it's very very strong uh, gusting winds, uh, which I think of all of our cars that we operate today, these um, these prototypes it will affect them the most. Safety car disappears into the distance then. Hard breaking from the safety car driver. Brilliant line through the first apex. Clips the second one as well. And before you know it, he'll be in the pits, which means that we can get racing once more. It will be Charlie Hyatt at the head of the field, and he's gone just before the chicane. It's a popular choice because you can often catch people a little bit unawares when you accelerate in what's normally a breaking zone. And that's exactly what Charlie Hyatt has done. He powers his way down towards turn one. He's got a maybe one or two car length lead over Paul Street just behind. Do it, trying to go with them, actually is Mike Fry, who sits in second place, uh, in third place rather, in that 92 car. Gets a good run through that one, does Mike Fry. Mike's been known to compete upwards. Of course, if we're worried about tire temperatures, now it's dry and we think people are on inters or wets, you never know. Yeah, six minutes then we will have of racing action for you uh, for these historic uh, Sports 2000s uh, as they, uh, they keep them down. And it's, it looks like um, our number two, who's getting very, very racy uh, from the restart, he's uh, tucked up right up behind the uh, number 79 of Floth. So Muse moving forward because he started on the back row. Brilliant race so far from Muse then. Here comes David Williams. I thought that was something a little bit different. David Williams has finally popped up onto the diamond screen and he's going to be trying to attack. I'm not sure that is David actually. I'm pretty convinced it's, uh, it's going to be Mike Fry who's either gone missing somewhere, but David Williams in third. He is approaching second place. He's got a good run out of coppice. He loses a little bit on the straight relative to Paul Street up ahead, but every time they get to a quarter, every time they get to a breaking zone, oh. Williams just looks a little bit more alive. And in the background, a shot, you saw they were side by side. Williams challenging on the outside of the chicane couldn't make that work, but showing his intent. Yeah, so uh, clearly managed to uh, to get the 
benefit the slipstream if he's lacking power down the uh, down the exhibition straight he managed to uh, to, to tuck right in and, and catch up so that looks to be one of our closest battles as there's a big gap between the front of the field and the rear of the field at the moment Mike Fry looked very uncomfortable there. He's fourth place on his own, but that car was moving around underneath him under braking and not in a good way, in a very lively and unpredictable manner. Here is your battle for second place. It is still Paul Street in that white car with the red stripe ahead of David Williams in the green car. They are battling this slipstream in it. They're finding their way all the way up towards at the top of the circus as it stands. And David Williams not quite close enough, is he? Oh, he is. He's trying to lunge down the inside as Williams. They will touch as they get towards the exit of the corner. Bodywork bends, but it does not give way. Still Williams stuck in third, pushing more and more to try and find a way up into second. Yeah, no defense into Coppice, so they can run their, uh, their, their preferred line through here. Uh, but um, yeah, David Williams getting super close now and he does appear to be inching closer and closer as they head down towards the chicane for the last time for the uh, for the end of the lap this is your race leader in the 10 car oh! that is david williams he's late on the brakes he's up the inside can he carry wow. the momentum out the answer is yes but only just now paul street he's at a slight straight line speed advantage he needs to make it work for him here he's going to be on the outside dragging closer 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 still not brave enough however williams consolidates <laughs> that but will he that is incredible from street street lets off the brake lines it slide down in towards the apex he's sighted his way up the inside but Williams is coming back. Williams has now got his nose on the inside. That'll become the outside when they reach Craner Curves. And he doesn't care at all. He swoops back across, takes the apex, sets himself. He's in second place once more. Williams second, street third. Wow, uh, some huge dives from both drivers and uh, escaping contact as well. Tremendous stuff from both of them. Williams, though, currently in the lead of, uh, of street here into second position. But uh, Charlie Hyatt is uh, two and a half seconds up the road. Street was wide there coming out of McLean's. He knows that he's got to stick close because this end of the lap is where he should be quick. He's got the advantage on the straights and there's two big ones coming up now. Paul Street sets it up, gets off the steering much, much earlier than David Williams was able to do. David Williams actually on the curb kicking up a little bit of spray. Street will close all the way towards the chicane. Here's your race leader once more. Still Charlie High in control. He's got two and a half seconds. Williams is so late on the brakes. This could be fastest lap of the race coming in from David Williams and it wouldn't surprise me. The gap between first and second, it was two and a half seconds. What is it at the line? It's two and a half seconds, but of course there was overtakes no, on that last lap. It's now down to 1.4 seconds actually. So that, that was just a bit slow the transponders to catch up with our timing but uh, it wasn't quite there on the fastest lap that's still held by Charlie Hyatt but it was one tenth of a second away brilliant then from David Williams who may not be done with this one yet he took a second out on the last lap he does that again he'll be right <laughs> with the race leader at the end of this one here's a good battle slightly further down the order from the 17 car that is the battle on the fringes of the top 10 actually between steeper Andreas Floth and Dave Muse in seventh and eighth respectively Muse trying to apply the pressure. His car looks fantastic, so low to the ground. I've had, I've heard it compared to a lawnmower on previously comment, previous commentary it's sets. The best looking lawnmower I've ever seen. It, it is the is. best looking lawnmower <laughs> we've ever seen. Cut back to the front, however, and the lead gap is coming down all the time. Absolutely, uh, it's looking very good for David Williams now. Finally managed to unlock some pace uh, on the back of um, of Charlie Hyatt after finally freeing himself from Street uh, as, as, as much as Street put up a, a staunch defence and uh, he does look so hot and so quick going through this final chicane, Tom. Onto the pit straight they come then. 1 minute 18 on the clock. A lap is at least 119. So this <laughs> should be the last lap of the race. David Williams has 10 corners to try and find his way up to the head of the field. It's going to be all defense from Charlie Hyatt. The 10 car leads through Redgate. He should still leave by the time they reach Hollywood. But beyond that, it is anybody's guess as to which order they're in as they descend the hill. Still, Hyatt has it under control. The 10 car, the silver and blue machine. He flicks it to the right. He brings it back to the left he's not as late on the brakes as David Williams behind but Williams of course he's closing he's closing I, I think this is going to be final corner this one because he's so hot into there uh, he's going to have massive confidence and he will have had at least one lap of, uh, of education as to how uh, how Hyatt manages to take that final corner as they as they come out uh, over the uh, over the hill now and uh, head down 
through towards Coppice this time and uh, David Williams just uh, biding his time here I think that he needs to close that gap a little bit more as he gets a better apex slightly better line perhaps going through Coppice and now it's the run down towards the finish here we go then for the lead of the race one last attempt to do it it'll have to be on the brakes from Williams but that's where he's done it every single other overtake he's closing closing but I don't think he's close enough Hyatt's in a little bit deep but Williams can quite get there Charlie Hyatt will take the checkered flag to win a fantastic race from David Williams who to give him credit is his class victor as well Paul Street competes your overall podium and then we wait a long long time before you eventually see the 33 of Mike Fry cross the line there's a little bit of a squabble happening further back but I don't quite think there's going to be a change for position they'll drag to the line and it will be the 17 of Steeper who takes sixth place ahead of Andreas Floth we'll give them a moment to cross the line and we'll, then we'll give you a confirmed final order Andy Webster is uh, bolting it down once more. We'll try to come up with a different adjective each time. I think he looks slightly more controlled on this occasion. It's one step at a time, albeit taking them in a, a continuous swoop as he attempts to get down there and find some drivers to interview. We're not expecting any controversy in this one either, so hopefully he will get the order and we can confirm it. For now, however, it looks as follows. Charlie Hyatt wins Class A and oh, the overall victory goes with it. He's ahead of David Williams in second overall, who in turn wins Class C and Paul Street, who finishes your overall podium second in Class A. Mike Fry finishes fourth, but takes second in Class C, ahead of third in Class C, Beasley, who is fifth overall. In turn, you'll find Clive Steeper, Andreas Floth, David Muse, Nick Bailey, and Richard Cook completing your top 10. In 11th, you'll find Patrick Egan. Egan wins Class B ahead of. Chris Snowden, Nick Johnson didn't make the finish, neither did Ross Hyatt, who was, of course, let's say he was tagged down the Craner Curves. A great race, then. We're hoping for a great performance down there from Andy Webster. He's been doing the cardio, getting ready for this meet. He's got several sets up and down the stairs. I'd like to know the sort of the total altitude gained, if you like, on the end of this one. As into Park Fermi comes the magnificent Charlie Hyatt. I reckon he'll have been sweating a bit more towards the back end of that one. And we shall pass down in pit lane to Andy Webster. Thank you very much. We're uh, really pleased to see Charlie Hyatt just uh, hop out of the car. We just made sure that our cameraman didn't get run over as he, uh, as he put, the, uh, put the park brake on. Charlie Hyatt, uh, helmet off um, very shortly, but uh, congratulations for that. That was a uh, very strong performance. Looks like you had it all your own way, but except for maybe the last lap, it got a little bit hairy on you. Yeah, that was uh, tricky when I saw David Williams just behind closing in and um, I was like, oh my God, please just put the checkered flag out now. <laughs> How was it through the safety car period? Did, did you lose a lot of temperature? Were you, were you worried about the grip on the car? Do you know what? When we were about to go out in the assembly area, I was a little bit nervous because I could see the, dra dry the track drying in the distance and we'd all had wets on. Um, and, and, you know, if you take wets on a dry track, they just turn to mush. So when the safety car came out, it was a bit of a godsend, really. <laughs> were, you, were you calling the tyres then through that period to try and, try and keep them under control or you were fairly confident on them? Yeah, well, I think a few people on the grid also had wet tyres on. So uh, as you go around the track, there are still some damp patches off the racing line. So as you were going around, it was kind of seeking where they are uh, to cool the tyres down as you go along. Yeah, we, well, we, we actually lost Johnson uh, early on because he was the only one who fitted slicks. Uh, so he, he made what was probably the right con uh, call on the conditions, but apparently a loose wheel nut co cost him the race here today. But uh, congratulations to you, Charlie, and uh, great race today. And hopefully we'll see some more tomorrow. Thank you very much. Cheers. Fantastic to see uh, from Charlie. We'll go over and uh, have a chat here with David Williams, who uh, probably had uh, had some amazing pace through there. Uh, and uh, David, you look so, so good going through that final chicane. Uh, you look like the class of the field today. Yeah, I think that's always been a favourite corner of mine for years and years. And I think I yeah, made mistakes there in the past, but wasn't quite enough time. Another lap, and I think Charlie would have been under more, more pressure than he was. Did you think it was going to be easier to get past Paul Street today because he came straight back at you, didn't he? He did. Um, it's, it's about trust with other people as well. And to be honest, the, the brakes on this car are phenomenal. And i just got to say a thank you to this man here that's been on his own looking after me. So, well done, Andy. Well, thanks, the, thanks to Andy on that count. Congratulations and see if you can go one step better next time. We'll try indeed. Thank you. Thanks a lot for David, uh, David that time. I'm hoping to see if we can uh, maybe get a chat here with Paul Street. Paul, congratulations on the podium. How, do you, how are you feeling? I'm really pleased for Charlie. 
Honestly, he's deserved to win all season. He's been brilliant. I'm really pleased to see him get there. Um, and David was right he was uh, right with him. So I think one more lap, it might be more difficult. But yeah, no, it's great to see. Oh, fantastic. You had a good battle as well with David. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was just quicker. Though I wasn't keeping him behind me. So uh, yeah, once he was by, it was a chaos of, well, I'm not going to go any faster than this. So just sit back and relax and watch them. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, it's great to see um, three happy drivers on a podium uh, for a change. So we'll hand back up now up to the commentary box to, uh, to Tom. But uh, for, for that was your podium from uh, the uh, Sports 2000s. Thank you very much, Andy. Brilliant work as ever. We'll sit and prepare for the next one. It's not just me in the commentary box now either. I'm joined once again by the, the fantastic, the, the incredible, he's, he's taken steps back and he's almost rich his headphones out of the box, the, the wonderful Gary James. Gary, supercar, it's always exciting. The track's dry now. It should be a lot of fun. Well, we were lucky because obviously they had a dry run earlier on. We had that horrible shower, which obviously kept us all in the uh, comms box. I wasn't certainly going to venture out into the paddock and get news. <laughs> uh, and then we've got a nice dry one again. So, uh, yeah, someone's looking down on us nicely. But, um, yeah, that record went in the earlier race to uh, Liam Morley. And uh, I don't know, is there more time to come? Certainly the fact that he had to battle through the snake up behind the safety car probably... I'm not sure what lap he set his um, lap record on in that one. Yeah, oh, well, actually, yeah, uh, lap 12. So once he'd broken clear of the uh, the safety car queue, so obviously clear bit of track. But uh, I suspect that there's a bit more time to come from Liam Morley. But looking at, it's quite a strong wind now. And uh, it's been the strongest we think we've seen it uh, all day. So we'll get to the, go through the grid. It's based on the practice time, sorry, the times from... Um, the earlier race of front row is GP Liam Morley and 84 uh, Matt Robinson. Row two is a 31 Sam Moss, 24 Tom Rushworth. Row three, Lee Harpham and Carl Hume. Row four is the 87 of Jack Tritton and the four of Andy Galliford. Row five, the five of Carl Kinsey and 93 Ingvar Berger. Row six, the first of the 250 monos, that's the 101 of Lee Plain and the 68 of Mark Edwards. Row seven, the zero of Paul Platt and GP1 Kirk Catamol. Then we move on to row eight. We see the 74 of Will Lawrence and 29 Tom Hatfield. Row nine is the 43 of Sean Lombardo and Samantha Hempshaw, she had a front tyre blowout, so that was uh, the cause of Samantha's uh, non-finish in the earlier race. Row 10 is the nine cart of Mark Pask and 32 Glenn Guest. Row 11, the 52 of Steve Burton that ended up in the uh, gravel trap at Redgate and the 20 cart of Johnny West. Row 12, we see the 57 of Anthony Williams and the 153 of Martin Marks. Row 13, Luke Clemson, who joined uh, Steve Burton in the uh, kitty litter at Redgate, but uh, gets a spot on row 13, and he's joined by the 14 of Nathan Barton. Row 14 is the S2, that's the Super Cup winner in the 450 class of Catherine Foster. She's joined by Kevin Ridley, another of the 450s. Row 15 is the 56 of Michael Goff and 66 John Faulkner. Row 16 is the 185 of Aaron Powell and 139 Rob Randall. Row 17, the 50 of John Busby, and 44 Jason Thompson, it's another of the 450s. Row 18, Paul Von Gerald that we saw trying to drag his cart out of the uh, Roberts uh, chicane, and he's joined on row 18 by the 161 of Richard Connick. Row 19, the 69 of Costa Caritzis, British champion in the 450 category, and he's joined by 67, Daniel Thompson. Row 20, the winner in the 125 category, that's the 643 of Ollie Holmes. He's joined by the 450 driver, Nick Flint. Row 21, 62 of Andy Powell and 117, Luke O'Rourke. Row 22, the 143 of John Reader and 45, Chris Mackey. Row 23, we see another of the 450s, that's the 40 cart of Alan Fluitt and he's joined by the 58 of Mary Howarth. Row 24, another of the 125s, that's the 99 cart of Aston Baker, and the 76 cart of Alex Dudley. Row 25, 51 Luke Burton, and the 22 of Ben Parkinson. And row 26 is the 144 of Chris Balderson, and 34 of Daniel Gerrard. They were early retirements in that uh, first race. Row 27 is the 17 cart of Gary Potkins, 
and the 26 of Ronan McClintock came into pit lane and I think had an engine issue so I'm not sure if we're going to see Ronan out in this one. Row 28, the 33 of Mark Newton and 91 George Benton. Row 29, the 41 of Fletcher Hearn and 75 Kevin Dudley. And the 30th and final row, we should, it shows Shane Stoney, but Shane Stoney blew up an engine in testing on, uh, on Thursday, so he's not participating. And the 36th cart of Tom Baldwin. And you might say, well, hang on, Tom Baldwin won the class in 250 monos. What's he doing on the back of the grid? Well, unfortunately, Tom got excluded for being underweight. Oof. So drama in the uh, 250. And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to chat to him after the race either. So uh, a, a what was a, originally a good win for Tom Baldwin has been dashed and he's now starting at the back of the grid. So with uh, 59 carts in front of him, it's just a question of how far up the order is Tom Baldwin going to be able to make it. Uh, as we all say, you can't win it on the first corner, but you can certainly lose it on the first corner. So. Absolutely. If, uh, any any stories from in between the races that you were that you caught on well, to? Uh, I say because it was raining up here, Andy. I, did, I <laughs> was frantically sending uh, Facebook messages to people <laughs> saying what happened, what happened. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we lost obviously Luke Clemson and Steve Burton that we saw on screen into the uh, Red Gate yep. travel travel um, travel trap. Uh, unfortunately, Samantha Hemshaw she had a front right ro front right tire blue, just as she was lying nicely in second place in. Uh, the 250 mono category and as she said you know what she got to do to get a decent result she was uh, up at the sharp end at Anglesey and once again had uh, three non finishes there so uh, look out for the 35 cart of Samantha Hempshaw so she'll be starting on uh, what's that the ninth row of the grid so hopefully she'll be up and battling with the likes of uh, Luke Plain and Paul Platt. Um, John Faulkner had an engine vibration not quite sure the exact reason of the issue but uh, that was the news I got back and uh, Ronan McClintock, who was the pole sitter for the 450s, um, he came into the pit lane with an engine issue. Now, there's somebody at who would have been originally He's at just the a front <laughs> of the grid. Just uh, doing his own push start, it, it seems, at well, the moment, and yeah, frantically uh, trying to get going. And I can't see from assistance. here who that is. It's quite a, quite a job to try and get uh, this push started by yourself and well, slightly uphill. fired up. It has fired up. Now, I hope that's not the 84 cart of Matt Robinson, who should have been on the front row of the grid. Let's have a look on the screen. Now, Matt Robinson is there. So it's certainly somebody that I think should have been in the front few rows. But, uh, yeah, safety car brings them round Schwantz Curve and into McLean. So uh, looking on the screen, we can see the 84 of Matt Robinson alongside the GP cart of Liam Morley. Why has G Liam Morley got GP? Well, he was the Grand Prix winner here last September, and that was in the Division 1 category, and uh, Kirk Catterbow, oh, excuse me, has GP1 on his cart because he was the Grand Prix winner in the 250 mono category. Just to confuse everyone. <laughs> and is that, a, is that a badge that they wear for the whole year or just on the anniversary of their no, visit? It, it's a badge that they own and they can run it for 12 months. Right. And what distinguishes a Grand Prix from a regular race? Is it twice as long? Is it's, it? it's sanctioned by Motorsport UK, so right. there is a Grand Prix. Unfortunately, there isn't one this year for, I won't go into various reasons, but so there's been a Grand Prix going back to 1978 was the first one. And the winner of the Grand Prix in 78, Paul Elmore, is actually helping out uh, the 101 of Lee Plain. So Paul Elmore reinvigorated with karting, having had a long break, and now decided, oh, I want to come and watch all of this again. And uh, so he was one of the early Grand Prix winners from 78. But uh, it is an annual event, and, and like with the Zero Plate, which used to be called the, the, the UK Cup, that's a one-off event. And any of the special, we, we call the special plates the GP, the One, and the Zero. They're the three Triple Crown titles to get and uh, not many drivers have managed to secure all three in one season but there are a few so uh, they'd have to arrange uh, arrange well, quite a, a that, list that of they can decide um, <laughs> now once again that say the safety car pulls off very late into yep. pit lane so red lights on red lights off and it's Morley that gets one. the jump Robinson tucks into his slipstream but it's Sam Moss that chops across the front of uh, Robinson for a late and, move down the inside goes, as well yep. very very brave on the brakes yeah, so Sam Moss, the 31 cart, leads them through uh, Redgate for the first time, chased by Morley and Robinson as they head down through Crane no. Curves, and Morley gets round the outside, so <laughs> it's Morley that uh, decides, oh, this is going to be my race again, and leads them through the old hairpin as the rest of the field spring through, I can see the 15 of Luke Clemson and the zero 
of Paul Platt as they all seem through and uh, the 12 cart of Kevin Ridley well up ahead of uh, Catherine Foster but it's Morley from Moss and that's uh, Tom Rushforth now up into third place. So Tom poor, Rushforth. Poor start for Robinson it seems dropping down the order outside of the top four. Yeah so whether there's issues perhaps with the, the new tyres that they sometimes have put on where he's got new tyres on for this uh, this race and it uh, takes a bit of time for him um, to come in and uh, a few people off. We've got a big That's problem at McLean's on the exit of McLean's here. It looks like the GP1 cart of Kirk Catamol involved with that off at uh, McLean's as the leaders cross the line but um, there goes the 93, the Swedish visitor of Ingvar Berger but it's Morley from Moss, Rushforth and Robinson then it's Carl Hume then uh, we have the five cart of Carl Kinsey. It's the GP1, it's the GP1 and yep. um, yeah he is, uh, he's uh, walking away uh, but a little bit gingerly, and possibly Hemshaw winded as from well. there. So, so yeah. Yep. Samantha Hempshaw and uh, the GP1 of uh, and Paul Platt, so all three of those front runners wow. in the 250 mono class have been coming together on that uh, opening lap. So three star drivers from the mono class out before the race has even really started. Yeah, so that, that confirms a full safety car will come out and the safety car is at the end of the pit lane waiting. Uh, we hope all our drivers are, uh, are, are fine. They have all climbed out of their, their cars, um, so some a little more gingerly than others, but it did look like possibly we had a fairly hefty impact um, and uh, they've, they've scored quite a furrow in that gravel trap. Yeah, and I think it's is that also that's not dented the tire wall. I think that's a no. previous one. But yeah. the safety car obviously has let all the field go past. So unlike the earlier race, he will pick up the leaders. So we would expect him to pick up the GP of Liam Boy when uh, he comes out of Robert Chicane. Obviously, all the track uh, signage is out, so the drivers will probably be backing off fairly significantly, waiting to. Uh, Come on to we'll get you pictures early on, as, as soon as possible, um, of what's happened. But it looks like the front, the front wing, possibly, um, yeah, well is nose, dislodged. The nose cone has dug in, and it's just ripped it off, Andy. So, yeah. uh, as, you, as I said, you know that the, the um, they're fairly low to the to the ground. Yeah. So uh, anything like a gravel trap is going to rip it off. But uh, yeah, unusual to see. Uh, three top drivers all off there obviously all fighting for that same bit of track on the uh, opening lap and uh, certainly now, with uh, we've got we've got a string of drivers <laughs> setting fastest laps um, while under um, at least a safety car instruction so there would have been um, there would have been we've got a red flag we have a red flag I'm sorry to say um, as the GP1 car is off you can see the zero car as well um, is, um, is is off but we have three cars in the same uh, gravel trap and we have had a red flag I'm afraid Gary yeah that's unfortunate because obviously while uh, the the carts are fairly well off of the uh, circuit it only needs another cart to uh, yeah go in the same direction and uh, they could be an innocent uh, innocent party so the carts being uh, slowed up and Catamol Ketam uh, was super aggressive in our first race today he was and I say um, Kurt Catamol very quick very driver yeah, yeah. And, and won uh, one of the races at Anglesey last weekend and in fact the engine that he's using is what we call one of the old spec TM engines it's not one of the new generation engines so it's, a, it's an engine that I think is at least 15 years old okay it's had a few upgrades over, over the time, but uh, whereas the likes of Paul Platt and Hempshaw were running on what we call new gen generation mono engines, um, Kirk Catamore running an old spec, and what that means is that he's eligible to score points in the mono cup, because mm. uh, everybody else in the mono cup is running Honda engines, the old motocross single cylinder 250 uh, motocross engines, because a lot of them say, well yeah, but he's a lot quicker than us, you know, can't we sort of, um, you know, give him some success ballast? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's not going to be scoring points in this one. So obviously with only what we had two laps, I think. So yeah. it will be a decision now as to whether we are going to have a full restart. Obviously, as I spoke to the timekeepers earlier on about curfew time, I think seven o'clock today. So uh, we'll see if we can get these gridded. I mean, obviously the cars are already gridded to go out for their next race. So uh, depending on how quickly they can uh, move those three carts out of the gravel trap at uh, McLean's or we'll determine whether we're going for a restart or whether that could be it for the carts unless they can push it to the end of the day. That's normally a decision, isn't it, that if you cause a red flag, we'll try and run it at the end of the day if time allows, I believe. 
Yeah, we, we shall see. It was obviously very early in to the race, as you say, and uh, only two laps completed, and one of those, half half of one of those, let's say, was was completed under the safety car. So, do we have a pause right now? Do we um, do we just restart with the with the minutes remaining um, uh, as as they were when we stopped, um, or or in fact, do we do we reschedule? Um, we will obviously as soon as we hear from race control, we will let you know. Um, but uh, for now. Um, it, our, gu our guess is as good as anybody else's, I'm afraid, and we, we could actually end up seeing a change of conditions um, well, <laughs> over the course of this p point between the same race, as, as actually the next race is already lining up on the Melbourne loop behind us. Um, I'm not quite sure how, how best this will get organised, but into the pits comes all of our runners. I was to say, a change of conditions will be a real kick in the teeth <laughs> for some of these guys, because obviously they're all out there on slick tyres at the moment, so the worst case scenario is that... Uh, we suddenly have a shower of rain and everyone's got to then start rushing around changing tyres. So I know we have Tom Davis who's uh, stepped down to the, uh, to the uh, pit lane um, and uh, if, uh, if, if during this stoppage he manages to, uh, to get a chat with anyone, I'm sure he'll let us know. We'd, we'd love to, uh, to hear from some of our drivers uh, in this pause uh, until we get some clarity on, uh, on the next course of action. Uh, but he'll, uh, he'll, he'll, be, uh, he'll be frantically working to try and, uh, to try and do just that for us uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see, uh, as we can see, the uh, recovery operation underway. Um, lots of discussion happening um, at the sides of the cars. Uh, drivers coming back onto the gravel uh, there, Gary, to put their helmets with the car. Um, is that to make sure that their car is handled nicely and, and gently, or what's the reasoning behind uh, behind them coming back into to, to, well, to well their cars? You, there? you can't abandon your your machine, uh, and obviously, kart drivers know how to lift these things. Possibly, I mean, no disrespect to the marshals because they do a fantastic job, but uh, there is a knack of lifting these, and if you can get four people, one on each corner, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Now. If they can, I mean, obviously some of the carts are a fair way off into the uh, the gravel trap. Um, if they can get them dragged onto the circuit, there's every chance that they could actually fire up the engines and drive them back to pit lane. Um, yes. It depends, obviously, how much damage there is to uh, uh, wheels and, and bits and pieces and steering and things like that. But um, I suspect, can't see, yes, there is a flatbed going out to... Uh, through Schwantz Curve and out to McLean's at the moment, so I think it's going to be a case of uh, the grab putting as many of the carts onto the uh, the rear as possible. Paul Platts pushed his back onto the circuit. That's his crash helmet, but I can't think that's Paul sitting in the cart. So I was going to say, if he's uh, if he's able to get it pushed start, at least that's one less that... Um Gary, I'm down here in pit lane. We are tr inevitably getting a little bit of chaos in amongst all this one, because we're <laughs> trying to get everybody lined up at the end. Liam, fortunately you've got some useful people to help you out, which means you can stand by, prepare yourself for the restart. How are you feeling? Yeah, I've got a good team behind me, so I can just stand here while they push the car about, but uh, yeah, I'm feeling confident, you know, we had a, a very good first race, and um, hoping to replicate that in the second one. I mean, we got a good start there and got into the lead, but, um, you know, there's some fast lads here today, so I'm sure a couple of them will push me to the end. There's a little bit of a, let's call it a kerfuffle in the pack, something along those lines. Of course, you were clear of that. Did you have any sign of it at all, or was it just flags out and you were thinking, right, kill down, prepare for a restart? Yeah, that was it. I didn't know what had gone on at the time, so um, yeah, I just saw the safety car board, but luckily it picked me up first this time rather than halfway through. But um, yeah, I mean, single file restart now, I think, so uh, we'll see what we can do. Perfect. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Good luck on the restart. No problem. Thank you very much. That Liam Morley, he's at the head of the field. He's looking very quick. I'll let you know if I find anybody else, oh, but there's catch. a lot of organisation going on down here. Well, L Liam Morley, a 10 times Grand Prix winner uh, in the course of uh, his supercar career in 125s and Division 1s. And Hence why he's got a good team behind him, I guess. Well, exactly. <laughs> and, and in fact, he, 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 he got the 10th win, say, here last September, and, and uh, he's what we'd call one of the winningest drivers within the uh, supercar category, but also raced in Europe as part of the European Championship. Didn't quite get the win in that. Uh, I think the best place in the Euro Series was about second or third, but uh, a very good driver that people uh, respect. Ah, tremendous. Well, yes, uh, he's obviously prepared, I think, uh, for a restart. Um, I, I'm guessing he's got better information than we have here, Gary. So um, potentially we could be we could see some laps uh, to, to finish this one and, and maybe a restart rather than he, he mentioned a single file restart rather than a cold complete complete reset. So it looks like it would be as uh, positions as they were on the previous lap. 
It should be, yeah. We are lining up essentially to the last time we had a complete timing list, which will be the previous lap. Yep. And then in turn, that line is in fact single fire. So yeah, we'll yeah. get going with effectively what is a safety car restart as opposed to a, a race start. Yeah, it won't be a two by two grid formation behind the safety car. It will be a single file. So uh, the snake's going to be quite long actually, yeah. 60 cars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, bad, it's bad enough having 30 rows, but uh, with 60, 60 in line, that's going to be, uh, well, in fact, it's a few, it's like a few, few, down, few less, yeah, yeah. Probably down to <laughs> 50, 55 now, but uh, even so. But uh, obviously, it's allowing um, the mechanics to do a quick check over in pit lane, so we're not, uh, we're not necessarily under park Fermi rules that uh, people can't uh, make some adjustments, but obviously some of the drivers will be chatting to the crews just to let them know that... Uh, Oh, but the handling's okay, or this, that, or anything else. So, um, while we wait, they're still being collected over at. Uh, I was just going to um, confirm our five retirees, but um, our timing screens have just gone blank on us at that moment. So, I can tell you that so we had three of the F250s it was the Catamol, it was uh, Paul, Platt. Paul Platt, and, and, and Sam Hemshaw. And Hemshaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, they're the three that I think, I don't think there was any <laughs> others. And obviously, I say, when I said 55, obviously, I include the fact that uh, Shane Stoney didn't start. Yep. And I don't think Fletcher Hearn, who was the 41 car in the 125 category, I don't think he started either. So, uh, but it's uh, it's amazing, yes, that um, three of the top runners in one class have all been taken out on one corner. And, and I didn't actually spot to see how far up the order that the 36 of uh, Tom Baldwin had managed to uh, come. Obviously, st with him starting on the back row of the grid, so uh, be interesting to see. Uh, yeah, when we when we get our timing um, reorganised, because obviously everything's had to be cleared so that we can reset back to the end of lap one rather than the uh, end of lap two as things finished for us. Um, but when we when we get that, of course, we'll have a um, a safety car lap to uh, to take you back through the, the revised order and catch up with with movements up and down the grid uh, at that point. But there's a lot of uh, work going on on the track just to uh, to clear up uh, from the scene of that accident and the uh, subsequent recovery. Uh, a lot of drivers still standing as far as I can yeah, see. Yeah, and one of them with me actually. I've got uh, Dan, Daniel, whatever you would prefer. We've decided either is fine. We've gone for both. Daniel, Derrick, you got the 34 cart. You saw maybe the aftermath of all of that, but before we get to that, how was your restart? Was it going well? Are you happy about the restart, or would you rather it kept going? I'll be honest, I'm happy with the restart, because one of the carts was close to the circuit, so like I say, safety reasons, better off stopping it, getting it all cleared out of the way, and have a, have a decent restart, and fingers crossed it'll, it'll go nicely from there on in, so. And the cars around you, are you looking at making up positions? Are you aware of those behind you, or is it somewhere in between? Somewhere in between, as long as I can get this race finished, because the first race I didn't finish because clutch cable, uh, throttle cable went or just coming out of Redgate. But so, like I say, it's just a case of for me finishing the race, getting some points in the bag, and going from there. So, if there's people ahead of me, I'll try and catch them. If there's people behind me, I'll try and keep them behind me. Perfect. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Good luck with the restart. Thanks, Tom. Yes, because I didn't get a chance to speak to Daniel after the first race to find out why he retired. So I can now scribble that on my notes as a broken throttle cable. So <laughs> you're doing a grand job. You're doing a job for me. Um, well, before you catch somebody else or just ch chip in as soon as you get hold of someone, I mean, I can quickly go through the points yeah. as they stand after that first race. So another 30 points for Liam Morley in the Division 1 class, um, extending his lead now 145 points. Uh, he's got a 15-point lead now over the 19 cart of Carl Hume. Uh, tight for third place now. Jack Tritton only picked up 12 points in that early race. Scott 117. But uh, second place for Matt Robinson, the 84 cart, and uh, 25 points for him puts him onto 115 in uh, fourth place. In the 250 monos, um, the 25 points for Paul Platt keeps him in the lead. Uh, on 170, but obviously he's not going to be participating anymore in this race. And he had a 10-point advantage over the 101 of Lee Plain. Uh, Lee picking up that uh, win in the earlier race. And then we had on 153 points Tom Hatfield and 150 for Kurt Catamol. Now that could all change obviously in this race because with Platt and Catamol not scoring, this gives a chance for um, Lee Plain to possibly go to the top of the mono points standings. In amongst all this, I've managed to find Sean Lombardo. Sean, you did see the accident. Talk us through a little bit of what happened and if you're aware of any of it and maybe worried. Uh, no, not worried, but um, just 
three in uh, one corner don't go, does it, side by side? So that's really all that happened, really. Everyone fighting for the same bit of track and there weren't enough room. So someone had to give, didn't it? And are you looking to sort of apply that theory when we get to the restart or is it a case of make up positions, take advantage of potentially a good chance to score some points? Yeah, just take your time and see how it goes, really, and see where we end up. Gran, thank you very much for speaking to us. Enjoy the rest of the race. Thank you. Cheers. OK, so yes, the 43 cart of Sean Lombardo and uh, lying in fifth place in the championship at the moment on 120 points. So um, he has got every chance of uh, improving his score in the uh, next race with, the, say, the, the uh, demise of Platt and uh, Catamol. So uh, Sean Lombardo, part of the uh, Parker Motorsport team. Um, I've lost count, actually, how many carts they've got on track this weekend. I think it's probably five or six because you've got Tom Hatfield you've got Tom Baldwin Sean Lombardo they're the three in 250 nationals Mark Newton runs out of the team in the division one or Chris Mackey is also in uh, 250 mono so Parker Motorsport uh, provide a lot of cart to uh, compete in the uh, championships uh, yes okay so um, our, our, our drivers still um uh, I can't quite see if we've got any drivers still standing outside the car. I think we have, yeah, we've certainly got plenty of people with helmets still standing up. So they haven't been given um, a restart time just yet. Um, as you say, we, we need to get all our racing done um, by um, by the uh, the end of play today on our, on our cutout. And now now we are seeing some drivers have uh, got in uh, got, got in there, Gary, and um, yeah, so just we getting, can see we can get nice close-ups to the, to the liveries as yeah, well. Yeah, we can see the 15 car of Luke Clemson, the winner of the Bennett Supercar scholarship last year, the 14 cart of uh, Nathan Barton, one of the Division 1 drivers um, running under the Barker racing team. Then we see the two 450s. Now the S2 is the uh, uh, cart of Catherine Foster that finished second in the uh, earlier race in the 450. She's leading the championship at the moment and behind her is her partner in crime, um, Kevin Ridley. Now Kevin Ridley is the designer and manufacturer of that uh, Silverstone chassis, so they're both running the Silverstone chassis. Kevin Ridley's using a Yamaha engine in his, whereas Catherine's got a KTM. But uh, What does the S2 signify? The S2, she won the Super Cup got it. in the 450 category at Anglesey mm -hmm. last month. Um, what would have been the O plate for the class, but, it, but unfortunately we can't run the O plate, it's now the S S1, S2, S3. So Kevin Ridley, yes, as he alluded to us earlier on in the commentary, was uh, uh, working on Paul Radicic's, um Super Tour car at Brands a couple of weeks ago. We see the 66 of John Faulkner, non-finisher in the early race, an engine vibration for John, but uh, looking okay in this race. One of the uh, Division One drivers in the Division One Cup because he's using the slightly older spec uh, John, John didn't, hasn't had the easiest of days, has he? He's, he he, he no. came off early in, in qualifying, qualifying and in the yep. previous race as well. Yep. I saw him marching disconsolately across the gravel. That's right, yeah. And uh, 56 is Michael Goff having his first run out in a Division 1 cart. He's previously raced in the 250 Nationals. And I chatted to him earlier on today. He said he was quite pleased the fact that he'd finished uh, well up in uh, qualifying and uh, looking to obviously make progress further forward. You can see the 83 cart there of Paul Von Gerard. He was unfortunately... Uh, ditched into the uh, Robert Chicane uh, gravel trap when uh, the tyre shredded and he sent me a picture on uh, Facebook and <laughs> well, there wasn't much left of the tyre that uh, shredded obviously on the exhibition straight and uh, when he tried to turn into the uh, Robert Chicane. If you look closely at the uh, the figure configuration of that cart, he's actually got two 125cc engines either side of the driver. Um, which this is the uh, Ross Allen Championship winning car. So obviously the total engine capacity is 250cc, which then puts it into the Division 1 class. But uh, Ross Allen and uh, his dad, Mark... Good for balance, I imagine. Well, yeah, uh, of Jade carts. They make uh, Jade chassis, and uh, they uh, ran, have run that cart for the last few years, but uh, they've now got a newer cart for this season, and uh, Paul Von Gerard effectively got hold of the championship winning cart, and... Uh, Got a good result at uh, Anglesey last time out, but uh, obviously a non-finisher in that uh, earlier race. We've talked about the weight um, of the carts. What other restrictions are there? Because it looks like there's quite a lot of variance when it comes to mouldings and, and fairings and things. Um, I can't remember what the actual ruling says about ride height. Um, I know most of the drivers tend to run the nose cone at about 
30 mil, something like that, because they do actually have diffusers on the rear end nice. to <laughs> assist with ground uh, downfalls and things like that. So, you know, they're picking up various tricks from other formula, you know, and uh, there was a team a few years ago that actually had um, a DRS system no. built into the, oh yeah, and it was very successful, to Toby Davis and Ben Davis, and they actually ran it at Thruxton, on, oh, they actually they tested it at Thruxton, one of the guys ran without a rear wing, and one of them ran with the diffuse, uh, with the um, DRS system, and it worked. But the only trouble was that it got banned by, by Motorsport UK because they were worried that it would, if it failed, it would fail in the Open. up position yep. and it wasn't going to happen because they designed it that if it failed, it would always drop to giving, you know, yeah. uh, you know, less less drag sort of thing. So unfortunately, a good design. I mean, it worked perfect. So no f uh, or anything, uh, you know. Um <laughs> 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 no, I mean, there's, uh, there's certain restrictions, obviously, on the size of the chassis, the length, the width, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Most of the guys out there are obviously on six-inch tyres, you know, six-inch rims. So there's a maximum width of tyre, which I think is 8.1 on the rear. Um, I think it's 4.5 on the front. There's a big difference between the front and the rear axles. things like that. Yes, you can tune bits and pieces within the engines. I mean, most of it's got to be sort of standard um, con rods, etc., etc. But you can play around with some of the internals, more so in the Division One category because that's more of a European category. Yeah. Um, so we're recovering a little bit of time. We've gone down to a 10-minute race. So um, as things finished at the end of lap one. Uh, they, the cars will do a single file restart. As far as our information is, uh, is uh, we've received from Liam Morley at least. Um, so we'll have a single file restart under safety car conditions for 10 minutes. Um, that's going to make the drivers, uh, if, if they weren't already feeling a little bit frustrated and pent up, it's going to make them all the more so in, in the end uh, for, for this sh uh, foreshortened race, Gary. Yes, yeah, so it's probably going to be uh, what we had 13 laps in 15 minutes. This is probably going to be about an eight lap dash um, for. Uh, top guys at the front but um, looking through I can see most of the drivers out I did see one getting pushed into um, the Park Fermi area so I'm not quite sure whether there is somebody that's missing from the grid but to Morley Robinson and uh, Moss go through all in single files behind the There's nobody left in the pit lane either there's a lot of um, engineers and, and there, there are yes but just in case around, just in case they should happen to get called in again for some weird reason but obviously as you know motorsport you can't stand on the pit wall at, at the start of a race yeah. so um, yeah I can That's remember years ago at Brands Hatch, we always used to stand on the pit wall and then run through the garages to get to the other side to watch them come through South Bank. And there used to be a charge of mechanics across the <laughs> across the pit lane, which I don't think you could get. Lights are off then. Lights are off the safety car. We're ready to get underway again, once again. Okay, so it's Morley that will be leading them through. The GP car, 10-time winner of the Grand Prix here. Oh, he's put his indicator on this time, so the drivers know he's pulling in. So Morley will be dictating the pace. And uh, Matt Robinson pull it alongside and the lights go out now and it's Morley from Robinson. Sam Moss, well placed, pushes out to the right hand side of Robinson. Oh, and it's almost four abreast down into uh, Redgate. But it's Moss that uh, nicks up the inside of Robinson as they stream through. Carl Kinsey got uh, lost a few places down uh, through there. But it's Morley that leads through uh, Craner curves and uh, Moss looking racy oh. with and up the inside. <laughs> Tremendous stuff on oh, the inside uh, through the caners and he's just <laughs> wiggling the front axle <laughs> into the old hairpin and just hangs on to it. Brilliant. Yeah, Sam Moss, a very underrated driver. He doesn't really worry a bit too much about championships, but he's a quick driver and, and they all three of the top three have raced against one, one another in the 125 category a few years ago. So what you're seeing is a replication mm -hmm. of what they did in a much smaller capacity. Tom Rushworth handily placed there, the Tournament Four cart there in uh, fourth place. So uh, those four starting to uh, edge away as they head down the uh, exhibition straight towards the Robert Chicane for what will be the first time in the restart. And it is the GP cart of Morley that comes across the line from Sam Moss, who's starting to close in. And I think we could see a move from Sam Moss getting into the slipstream of the GP cart as they head down towards Regate. Not quite close enough this time, but uh, it's Moss. It's the one that's looking racy. Third place there is the 84 of Matt Robinson. Then it's Rushforth from Carl Hume, uh, Lee Harpham there in sixth place, the one cart. And he's side by side with uh, Carl Hume, the 19 cart. But uh, it's Moss and Morley. And I would uh, stick my neck out and say, where is the pass going to come from the Morley? Jack Tritton there dicing with the uh, 68 of uh, Mark Edwards. 
And looking further back, it's Lee Plain, the 101, that leads the uh, 251. As all Moss runs it out onto the curb, but uh, Moss is uh, these two breaking away at the front as we come up with uh, what, eight minutes to go. So uh, Moss looking the, uh, the fast of the two. Yeah, he's certainly looking very racy out there. And uh, I did notice going into the chicane, a couple of attempts to get to the apex for our race leader. So whether he's feeling a little bit vulnerable or his tires aren't quite up to scratch, but he managed to survive that one. The gap equal this time as it was before one quarter of a second with a further uh, five tenths of a second behind to Rushforth in that third position. So Rushforth is uh, up a place into third place, but uh, yet yeah, uh, Sam Moss, uh, Ran it wide on the grass in that earlier race and lost that second place he had before to uh, Matt Robinson. And slowing is the 17 cart of Gary Popkins. So a retirement in the early race and now another retirement in race two. It's, uh, it's not working out well for Popkins, but um, uh, quite the opposite, um, quite the opposite here fortunes Morley. here for Morley, who's uh, managing to stretch away now a little yep. bit. And, and Moss looking good, but it's the 26 who is trying to get out of his cart. He's uh, spun at, right Robert, in the middle of the Robert Chicane. Chicane. That's yes. a horrible place to so be that's stationary. The 26 of Roman McClintock, and I suspect that uh, if he can't shift that very quickly, we're going to see another. We have a yellow flag at least. He's managing to push ready, it, but he's pushing it if he can get it. I think he's going to try and get to loop. the loop, yes, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great effort. Great Got effort. Yellow flags and the leaders have, have, have um, done nicely with the yellow flags. They've slowed the pace. They've called the safety car, unfortunately. called the safety so car. So unless there's an, an accident elsewhere. Uh, well, the safety car hasn't left the pit lane yet. Liam Morley has backed all the pack up. And, well, there's drivers going full at different speeds. Oh, uh, no. Well, it's green flag, you see. It's, it's yeah. gone green. And, and the leaders have, have been caught out. So that uh, Morley was trying to back up the pack and the, the green flag was thrown and uh, certainly guys at the front uh, didn't uh, see the uh, change of uh, colour and it's now the uh, 84 car that looks like it's Matt Robinson from Carl Hume and Carl Kinsey. They've got the jump on the rest of them as they head down through uh, the old airpin and, Mo and Morley and Moss now uh, trying to make up ground. But uh, Robinson anticipated and so did uh, Hume and Carl Kinsey. So it's the five part of Kinsey in there in third place. So uh, with, uh, what, five and three quarters of minutes on the clock, this is super kart racing has been turned on its head this weekend so far, Andy. Yeah, and um, there's also cars slowing. Is that, is that just out of class being lapped already? Well, there's people slowing on the exhibition. There is a, there is a big difference in, in what, what the drivers are expecting to be the race instructions here. Some are racing, some clearly are cruising. Well, Kinsey has just moved, made a move on the inside of uh, Carl Hume, but it's Robinson that leads across the line from uh, Kinsey, Carl Hume there in uh, second place. Then it's the four cart of Andy Gulliford that's uh, competed in the uh, French Championships this year, and Morley now trying to make up ground there in fifth place. Taxis onto the back of the four cart of Andy Gulliford as they head down through Craner Curves, a 26 stricken car of Roman McLeansock safely out of the way with uh, half race distance, five minutes done already. And we pick up Steve Burton being chased by uh, Luke Clemson. Now those two came together um, at Redgate in the earlier race. Uh, they were running fairly close together on circuit. So let's hope that uh, they don't have a repetition of their earlier incident as we so picked up. Somehow or other, it's, it's ended up with Robinson from Kinsey uh, and Holm then Gulliford, and then Liam Morley down in fifth and uh, presumably feeling a little bit hot and bothered under the collar here because uh, he's had his lead taken away by, um, by uh, a confusion, a confusion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on the confusion. way into Redgate that time well, because the safety car was, was crawling forward. Yeah. It was safety car on my timing screen and then we got a green flag. Yeah, I mean, he was doing the right thing to back up, yeah. the, uh, the, back up the pack and, and obviously was in anticipating that the safety car was going to come out just in front of him. So uh, that's... Uh, Mark Edwards and Tom Rushforth running side by side. Now, Mark Edwards down in uh, Lovely ninth move place, there uh, from Rushforth as well. Going well, through. Rushforth was obviously in fourth place and was another one of those drivers that got a little bit caught out at yeah. that uh, restart, just ahead of the 87 of Jack Tritton. The Jack Tritton down in, what, 11th place, not having a particularly good day for him. But, uh, it's Robinson from Morley, so uh, 84 and... Uh, and it's Ingvar Berger just in front of them. So Ingvar Berger, the Swedish driver there in uh, the 93 cart, holding eight spot, being chased by the uh, former sidecar European champion. That's the 68 of uh, Mark Edwards, and it's Tom Rushforth and Jack Tritton. Nice little uh, quartet there having a dice away. 
as we come up to three and a half minutes left on the clock. Is there time, do we think, for Moss to regain that position under his own steam here? The uh... Well, where has Stan Moss gone? Because uh, Robinson's gone through ahead of Morley, so have we lost Sam Moss? He's dropping down, now he's dropped back to third place. Carl, uh, sorry, Lee Harpen, the one cart a long way back, but uh, ahead of uh, Berger as he comes under pressure from Jack Tritton as two by two into uh, Redgate and uh, Edwards gets a move done on Rushforth as Tritton gets past uh, the Swedish driver as the 17 cart of uh, Gary Potter is still circulating very slowly at the side of the circuit. And as they come through there, Robertson holds on by a gap of three seconds to Morley and then a further five and a half to Moss. Uh, it seems, sorry, a, a total five and a half to Moss from the lead. Uh, then it's Holm and uh, Gulliford, Kinsey, Harpen, Rushforth, Edwards and Bjerger who are uh, your top ten at the moment. So just come up for uh, two and a quarter minutes left on the clock. So time for another two or three laps as... Uh, Robinson crosses the line to uh, complete another lap and uh, Morley now but he's got three carts between him and uh, Robinson as Robinson dives into Woodcote and uh, such so the red gate when we talk about Woodcote as Morley gets past coming with the back markers goes past the uh, 59 I think of uh, Nick Flint and heads down to Old Herpin so uh, picking up is that the 12 cart of uh, Kevin Ridley leading I think the uh, 450 category. And Morley hot on the heels then trying to get that place back he'll be feeling very aggrieved I think um, in the cockpit um, but he'd uh, love to, uh, to to get the pass done as he sides through the field past the uh, 69. 69 car of Costa Grizzly so you'll see in action tomorrow because he's driving in the Euro car race. Oh excellent okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I recognized the name I must have read it twice uh, in preparation today but uh, down then they go towards uh, to start that they're, they're currently circulating at 104 at the fastest um, 104.4 was the best, most recent lap from That's Morley. 107 on the clock as Robinson, I don't know whether the last lap board went out, but it would have been touch and go. So this could be the last lap, we'll keep an eye on, but uh, Robinson gets another two carts between him and the leader, one of them being the 99 cart, the 125 of uh, Aston Baker, and the next one that Morley's going to try and get past is the 161 of Richard Connick, who's racing in the 250 mono category. So Morley looking Morley for a way to through, the tail yeah. of Robinson all of a sudden. So as Mo Robinson, oh, and Robinson's got a problem. His hands up. His hands up. Yeah. Arms up at, uh, on the 84 car as he exits the old hairpin. So Morley gets back into the lead on this what could be the uh, last lap as the clock ticks down to uh, 27 seconds. I think I think we have had the last lap. Um, indication at least on the timing screen so we'll keep our eyes Moss is uh, typically slightly sideways uh, over the uh, over the crest there that time uh, and uh, looking exciting is Moss in that potential um, second position then here comes down the hill towards the uh, Robert chicane it's uh, it's the GP it's it's Morley this time uh, to cross the line and he picks up the checkered flag at the very final moment there so it, it is Morley who wins uh, Moss comes in second place and how far down the order will Robinson end up uh, as we well, it's come Carl through Hume that crosses the line the now the 19 two. car yes so uh, yeah so it's uh, it's uh, home uh, from Gulliford we're still waiting on Robinson because I think we're going to have Rushworth and there's Robinson through. now and crossing, Robinson the, line. crossing yep. the line now in the 84 so he will finish down in ninth position from a potential uh, uh, challenging for the win there I suppose he had the lead I'm not sure whether there might be some investigations afterwards about the um, about the confusion we had uh, on the um, safety car, not safety car situation, but there, there, then you have um, the uh, the finishers coming through. We'll take you through those class leaders as well. We've got um, we've got Tom down in the pit lane, who's going to try and catch um, some of our podium. Uh, podium scorers unless Gary goes and takes over which uh, we'll see how that one works out but it's Morley Moss, Holm, Gulliford, Rushworth, Harpham, Tritton, Kinsey, Robinson and Bjerger in Division 1. F250 was won by Plain in uh, in 11th overall in the 101 and back to Division 1 for Edwards, Pask, West and Goff down to 15th. In 16th in F250 was Hatfield um, in the uh, in in second in class and then we have guest in the division one next up in 18th overall third in class clemson from baldwin then we go back to division one for lawrence marks faulkner newton um, 
Esperton and Barton. Then into the class leader of the F450s, we have Ridley, Foster, Connick, Busby, and Critsis. Um, and then falling down the order outside of the top 20, I can see the F125 was won by Holmes. Um, and uh, second in the F125 was Baker, some several places further back down the order. Um, but there you have your, uh, your overall results. Morley Moss, Holm, Gulliford, Rushford, Harpham, Tritton, Kinsey, Robinson uh, with that late failure and Bierger. And then in 11th, Lee Plain, Mark Edwards, Mark Pask, John West, Michael Goff, Tom Hatfield, Glenn Guest, Luke Clementson, Thomas Baldwin, and Will Lawrence. Liam Morley did pick up the fastest lap. I think that's a new lap record of 104.188 uh, for the series. Uh, and we will wait to see as the drivers come uh, down into the pits. We're looking to see who, uh, who uh, our, uh, our interviewers, plural, can get hold of now. And you can see at the moment we're just trying to hand our radio, I think. It's, uh, is that our, uh, our trackside radio? Hand it back to... Our winners, or are we uh, are we holding something else there? The number 19 um, of uh, of home who uh, has managed to uh, to finish um, in third position overall. So we'll wait to see if we get um, get those interviews. Looks like Gary has um, picked up the microphone at least, uh, and uh, I I'm fully anticipate we'll have um, we'll have Tom coming back to the the comms box with me uh, soon to come. Uh, but there you see, pulling up for our uh, our podium interviews come our different classes, and I think Gary is so uh, is with uh, one of our podium sitters. We'll let the sitters. noise die away, and uh, so we can get some interviews. Unfortunately, uh, Liam Morley and Sam Moss have already dived down the pit lane, but I've got with me the uh, third place finisher in the uh, Division One category. Now, that was a bit of a mixture in the in the restart, Carl. It certainly was. Yeah, it's. Um, I was in fifth, I think, fifth place coming around the corner, and I was expecting. The, for the lights to go out or whatever and then suddenly the safety car lights just then turned to green so I was off and then I thought what am I meant to be because nobody else is and I overtook a few and I thought actually yeah sure it must be the green you know and then sure enough obviously I got uh, swallowed up by a couple of them uh, three of them I think and then Matt obviously had uh, a bit of an issue so uh, I I'll take that third yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, a great driver. I got a bit confused. I think Liam was doing the right thing to back the pack up because obviously the safety car was ready to go, but then it didn't go. So well, he didn't obviously wasn't watching the light, was he? <laughs> <laughs> old, old, old head on, on young shoulders. Yeah, pension his head, mate. <laughs> well done, Carl. Okay, let's see if we can uh, catch. Uh, let's catch Ollie first of all, Ollie. So, two starts, two wins in the uh, 125 category. Uh, you must be pleased with the day. Yeah, it's good. The wind played a lot in that. I could feel it all over, shaking about, but yeah, something cracked off with the safety car. I never deployed it, so I think that put a different mix in, but oh well. But you're enjoying driving this AK? Yeah, it's really good. Dead lively, dead light, throw it about. It's good. And I mean, your dad drove one of these as well, didn't he, in, in period? Something of that shape, yeah, mid 90s, so a bit of a father son thing, if you like. Stuff. Well done, Ollie. Let's have a quick word with um, Lee Plain. Now, Lee, um, all your opposition decided to take each other out on the opening lap up at McLean, so uh, it was your race to lose, really. That's right. I saw more, uh, uh, Sam, Paul, and uh, Kirk in the in the gravel, and I thought, bloody hell, what's going on here? And um, well, it was my race to lose then, really. So uh, I just had all my fingers crossed that the uh, car kept going to the to the line, basically. So, um, no, it was really good, actually. It's vital points that I needed, basically. Well, it is, because coming into this race, I think you'd moved up to second place. So, obviously, with those three uh, not scoring, I think that puts you back at the top of the points table. Yeah, hopefully. Um, obviously, it's still early in the season yet, so um, there's still a lot to play for. But uh, the more wins I can get throughout the season, it will help me uh, retain the, um, the Super Series. Great stuff. Well done, Lee. And uh, we'll have a quick word with, uh, with Kevlar who's lurking in the background. So, Kev, uh, two starts, two wins. Slightly easier that time? It, well, no, because I got in front of Catherine and a few of the slower twins, and then they stopped the race, and I had to start behind them and do it again. And it was also quite a long race. I was looking for the last lap board to be put out on lap three. Uh, yeah. I'd rather have a ten lap. Ten minute. <laughs> useful bag of points yeah it's, it's cool it's, i've had a good day we're having a great time 
All good. All good. That's what it's all about. Well done, Kevin. Okay, that's your uh, class winners and winners from the uh, second supercar race. We've got another supercar race to come tomorrow on Sunday, but uh, back to the commentary box. Thank you very, very much for that, as ever down there, Gary. It's fantastic to get a chance to speak to all these drivers, particularly when they've just had a good race. It means they're always a bit more friendly to you as you want to try and stick a microphone in front of them. Next up for us, we've got the MSVT Track Day Trophy. This is a series that started back in 2010. And on pole is going to be the Tester and Quinn Porsche Boxster ahead of Michael Rawlings, who joins him on the front row. Row number two, it'll be Ben Grucock in the Caterham ahead of Aidan Hills in the Ginetta G40 GT5 car. Nathan McPhail will be going from the third row in his Civic ahead of Damien Trupkzalski in the, on the Civic number 88. Row four, you'll find a BMW of David Zakrus is ahead of Gareth Sockets Renault Clio and your top 10 completed by Cameron McLean's Renault Clio and Johnny Cooper's Toyota Celica. Just outside the top 10 you'll find Chris Payne going from row 6 in his caterham ahead of the first of our minis in the form of Chris Reed's 141 car. Row 7 in 13th is the second Celica in the form of Wayne Cockrell ahead of the Earl and Williamson BMW Z4. Row number eight is where you'll find Colin Wells and Alex Wilkinson Hughes. Alex Wilkinson Hughes having some issues earlier on today, so hopefully he's ready to go from 16th. With 17th spot just behind going the way of Garden and Smitherum's BMW Z4, 18th for the next Toyota Celica of Sarah Hobson. Top 20, big grid for these guys, completed by Andrew Stevens and his Mini Cooper S, and the Lundy and Lundy Mazda MX-5. Outside the top 20, you'll find McKee and Pascal's BMW and the Adams and Adams Mazda MX-5. 23rd for Nicholas Stott. We saw him earlier on. He's back in his Mazda ahead of Alistair Ezum in his Mazda going from 24th. There's a Renault Clio from 25th driven by Ollie Moss. Just behind him you'll find Dominic Bowen. Those guys ready to fight it out for 25th and 26th. 27th is David Murphy in the Ford Fiesta. 28th David Lenthal in the Renault Clio. Top 30 completed by Newman and Maingott in the Ford Fiesta. And in turn Benjamin Curry in the the Ford Fiesta. 31st is Wright and Wormhole, 32nd Chris Warwick, 33rd Chaz Allen is back out there and 34th is the Gibson and Rig Ginetta G40. 35th and presumably with some issues will be Jack Goes for Mangoes Racing. He's a lot quicker than that. Overall your grid then gets completed by a few other people and eventually Lee, Lee Forniton in his Toyota GT86. This should be a very good one. Qualifying earlier was a lot of different cars setting very similar lap times. We're expecting the race to be a lot of different cars setting very similar lap times. It should be good fun. Absolutely, yeah. We're looking uh, looking forward to this. Uh, an, an absolute mix of liveries and uh, makes and marks, which is uh, which is a lot of fun to see. And it's what it's all about here at the uh, the eBay MSVT Track Day Trophy. Uh, you can tell it's um, it's covered by eBay. You can see all the the, the, the uh, trackside uh, banners uh, along the pit wall as well. Um, but we're looking forward to seeing just how they get on. There's the 48 that we uh, that we talked about so much earlier in the Miata Trophy race, and you'll see many of the MX-5s also feature in this race, as, uh, as well as some MX-5s that don't feature, because they don't necessarily um, fulfill the criteria of the, of the uh, Miata Trophy, but they're here to uh, to, t to tackle the uh, track day trophy itself. As these guys sort out their grid positions, it's worth noting this is a longer race. This is a 45 minute yep. setup with a pit window. It's mandatory to come in and pit. Now, even if you don't change anything, you must come through, stop for a bit and then go back out again. The pit window is open from 30 minutes to go till 15 minutes to go. It's a window in yep. the middle of the race, if you like. So from about two thirds to one third left in the duration. I believe it's a 45 second mandatory stationary time as well. Yes. Uh, to allow for you know non-rushed uh, driver changes or not. And usefully for these guys, it's a stationary time, which is of course far easier to time than an entry to exit time, which we've seen in other series cause a little bit of chaos. Last couple of cars, up on the grid. Keep your eye in particular on that VW Sirocco for Mangoes Racing. Darren goes at the wheel of that one. He's green, and I suspect he'll be a bit annoyed going from the back of that one. Darren goes doing his best incredible Hulk impression green as mean. he attempts to come through <laughs> on the first couple of laps. Green flag at the back. Everybody is ready, and we shall await the lights. We got the five second board is shown. Flies 
flutter around. We've got wind in the air. We've got rain just hovering about. And we've got five red lights, which are on. They're off wheel oh. spin through the BMW. And it's going to be the Porsche Boxster that gets a brilliant start. Keep your eye on the catering. Got an initially amazing launch. Of course, doesn't have the drag towards turn one. But it will be late, late, late on the brakes. Boxster on the inside of BMW. Those two side by side. Everybody else seems to be in about fourth. And then those that didn't <laughs> qualify appropriately eventually set off from the grid right now. A whole horde of them through the first couple of corners, and they're still fighting it out at the head of the field. Fantastic stuff. There was a the, the double seven of uh, the Toyota Celica was slow away, and the, the drivers did a fantastic job to avoid him as the cars really bunched up in the midfield here as they got away from the lights. Another one is the Celica's coming under a little bit of pressure then from BMW and Mazda, but it's Porsche Boxster of Tester and Quinn at the front who attempts to make the breakaway. Then you'll find the BMW of Rawlings and eventually Grucock heads what is actually now a bit of a pack for the edge of the podium with Hills, McPhail and Chuck Korolski all attempting to close in where the Caterham is a little bit vulnerable. Absolutely, yeah. Uh the, the catering will have its strengths around here, uh, but unfortunately <laughs> top speed is not necessarily going to be one of them. Uh, and uh, at the moment, warming up the car is, is proving a little bit difficult, but it's not hard for Tester Quinn, who are uh, away here uh, at the start of the race. Down the inside goes the Civic um, of, um, let me just get that straight, was that Hills who managed to get up into th uh, the p potential fourth position and ahead of the catering. So Hills with his eyes f fixed firmly forwards on the, on the back of that yellow uh, BMW and and uh, also Grucock looking under under threat here from one of uh, one of his rivals and, and down the inside. In fact, he gets moked by two different cars. I think that was Socket and Payne who both made their way back back uh, through past Grucock. It was actually McPhail in the Civic, oh. we should clarify. Grucock losing positions hand over fist. And then in turn, Hills did make the position. He's in the blue Jeanette just ahead now. So before you knew it, they were in exactly the same order. Bottom of the hill and under braking whilst turning is where that Caterham seems to be good, but is exceptionally vulnerable whenever they're accelerating out of a high-speed corner. A little bit further back, you'll get the Celica, which sort of heads your next group, which begins to involve a couple of the Mazdas here who are well-versed after their race earlier on today. Yeah, absolutely. That's the lead of the two Celicas because we had, we had one that was slow away from the grid, and that was Daniel Lenthal who uh, lost out uh, big time from there. So places gained up, up and down the grid at the moment, but we won't get too excited because it's, it's still 42 and a half minutes left to run. <laughs> Grucock is putting his car absolutely everywhere. Ben found himself between Civic and Mini there, and he thought, you know what, rather than back out of this one, I'm just going to send it to the Apex. <laughs> and he came out ahead of the pair of them. Fastest lap goes the way of Colin Tester in his Porsche Boxster. He's, of course, got Ronan Quinn alongside him. We don't know which one of those is in the car right now. And then you get back to this incredible battle. This is playing out for the edge of the top five. Currently, it's still Ben Grucock in the catering at the head of it, but everybody else is hounding and attempting to get by. Yeah, it's uh, definitely proving to be a uh, cork in the bottle here, and, and it's only a matter of time before something pops and we end up with a bit of a mess. Um, but uh, at the moment, then, we've got the, uh, the red Mazda MX-5 defending from the white 77 Celica on the way into Redgate while the Ginetta uh, is, uh, is, is, is feeling a little bit defensive here. I was going to say, watch out for Aiden Hills there, the, uh, the, the manager of, of Hills Motorsport, um, who are so uh, predominant in the Miata Trophy. Um, and he, he, was, um, he was unstoppable in the first round of the season at Miata at the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit um, because he's, uh, he's obviously a very, very handy driver. And, and in a more powerful Ginetta, I think he's, uh, he's a hot pick today for the podium. This is the second of the catering related battles, if you like, that's happening just around about the top 10 or so. It is still catering at the head of that from many, from Renault, from BMW, from Toyota. They're all involved as they reach to cops. Tell you what, the Silica, it looks a little bit lumpy, if you like, through coffers. It's it looks heavy almost yep. as he's trying to get it rotated on the front For end. Sure. Once he's on the power, it's okay, but does not want to rotate Aiden through Hills that then, one. Very much on the back of um, of McPhail. And I think they'll be challenging as they come into Redgate. In fact, Grucock has managed to uh, get the, the get. There's a, there's a challenge definitely going into Redgate and that is, I think, the Janetta has got through past the Civic and so did Grucock on the way through as well. 
Fantastic battling up and down the order. This involves the wow. 141 Mini down at Turn 1, who gets a tap behind Whoa. from the Blue Red of Clear. The BMW's in the middle of that as an oversteer moment finds himself suddenly on the inside of the corner when he expected to be on the outside of it. That leaves him vulnerable to the Celica to attack down the hill. It'll be side by side. Oh. Who's the bravest? The answer is just about both of them, but it'll be BMW that comes out on top at this stage. <laughs> That's great racing, really thoroughly entertaining. And these uh, these liveries really helping as well. Four point eight seconds at the head of the field is Tester's lead, Tester and Quinn. But look, Brucox got back ahead of Janetta once again. Here we go then. It's not often we talk about a Janetta GT5 having the straight line speed advantage, but it seems in this case <laughs> it does. And it'll be Janetta of Hills attacking Ben Grucock for fourth oh. position. Off the road there is the 126 Renault Cameron Clio. McLean. Cameron McLean was 10th. He was involved in the battle with the Mini and oh. the BMW and the Toyota and all that sort of stuff. He isn't involved in it anymore because Cameron has found himself off the road. The yellow yellows. flags for that. And we have a slow car coming down the pit lane as well. I hope that that's not no that is the 22 that's the car you were talking about the uh, the incredible hulk car earlier on yeah mango's racing vw uh, sirocco darren goes not able to get that one moving he is very very slow and interestingly it's happened in the pitch straight too so he's got to do a full lap until he can come back around i know they've been having issues with that car this year but it's still not going their way I like the fact, I think I've only just got the name of the team Mango's Racing because I was wondering why we're referencing fruit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the driver's surname is Goes, presumably is a man, and he's yep. going racing. He does indeed. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Um, but uh, yet again, the case room there, we will still be expecting yellow flags at um, whereabouts are we think? Was it McLean's that we were uh, expecting yellow flags to be waved? Because that's where we've got the, stop, the stopped uh, car up in the, uh, in the gravel trap. So that we're dealing with this with just wave yellows at this stage, it seems. So um, thankfully, uh, as the 22 is touring incredibly slowly, and um, yeah, that, that does look to be problematic for him. He's unable to get going. Still fighting earlier on in the field, however. Here are a couple of our Fiestas. Uh, the lead of this battle, you'll find the 32 of Dave Murfitt. He's doing a very good job at the moment to hold on to 26 spot, which might not sound like a lot, but in one of these Fiestas, I can guarantee he is wrestling that thing <laughs> round the circuit. He's got pressure coming from behind, does Dave Murfitt, from the likes of Curran Moss, Dean Warwick. They're all trying to apply it. However, still Murphy has the advantage. They're slow through this section, of course, because not only do we have yellows, we've also got the Mancos racing car in amongst that one trying to get through. And before you know it, they're all through Coffice and they can start trying to attack once more. Absolutely. Uh, so 37 minutes uh, remain, and we will. The pit lane will be opening uh, in, in in due course in in the next seven minutes or so, before we then uh, can change drivers if necessary, or at least just uh, catch a breather for our drivers on the on the way through, uh, as the the race has that mandatory pit stop in it whether you're sharing a car or not and we continue with these hot hatches coming down the wheat cross straight once again and they get close but uh, yes yeah, super close moments going on here between the 81 and the triple seven the treble seven of cooper in that toyota sleeker trying to make his way past the earl and williamson bmw z4 there was no gap on the inside of karina curve so he had to back out there was no gap at the bottom of the hill there is now a small gap between the recovery truck and the renault clio so hopefully we'll get up racing over at McLean's before too long but for now that huge train has to settle and before you know it they'll be going at it again on the other side of the circuit they're currently exiting Coppice they're putting down the power it's still Celica attempting to find a way through BMW Z4 but can't do it at this stage I still think that Celica looks a little bit lazy in the quick corners absolutely yeah it, they were relatively impressive over at Anglesey the Celicas but uh, here they are looking um, a little bit lumbersome as they we got a, a, a two by two action going up into Redgate right now and it, I believe we've got some rain on the windows here and some of our camera lenses already Tom as if this race needed some extra <laughs> spice thrown into it. They're all out there. Some of these guys will be on slick the tires, are on, not yeah. all of them. We've got wipers down the Craner curves. The Mini at the front of this doesn't care. He's still no. foot to the floor, <laughs> letting the tail end come out. That is the 541, I believe, in amongst all of it. Then you've got the double eight Honda Civic, which is coming under just a little bit of pressure now, further back in the field. These guys fighting it out towards the tail end of the order, but they're doing it as if it's for the race lead. We'll check in with that 
that race lead. It is still the tester and Quinn machine at the head. Has an 8.7 second margin over Rawlings and then eventually Ben Grucock, who did gain the advantage over the Ginetta for third. Absolutely, yeah, and um, clear, clear to see that uh, that, that Ginetta um, is unable to quite live with one of the uh, one of the strengths, at least, of Grucock uh, at the moment. But uh, uh, we did have hills ahead of Grucock earlier on, so we will see if he can get back in front or not. Um, but as you as you run down the gap there, um, so 8.8 .8 seconds, nearly nine seconds now for Tester Quinn. Uh, but uh, hope, but we, we're not short of um, of hard racing here, and of course there will be a driver change uh, for the Tester Quinn entry. So we may see a mix up of fortunes here. Here comes the Celica, down the pit straight again, wipers on, attempting to gain a few positions, attempting to gain some track advantage as well, but at this stage, cannot do it. So Cockrell will have to stay tucked in behind the number 88 of Krolski. Honda Civic, Cockrell attempting to make the pass and again not able to get on the brakes late in that Celica. I'd be interested to see it with a softer suspension setup actually because it looks very very stiff at this point which just means the whole thing is turning in and then it would slip so you have to wait and wait and wait. If you've seen touring cars you almost wonder what it could do with an Ash Sutton style setup where it leans all the way into the corner. Yeah a lot of pitch going <laughs> it might be necessary but uh, we've got some uh, MX-5s battling in the midfield here as uh, one of the other Salikas is going a little bit slowly there, giving up track position, or, or I think maybe being lapped, uh, potentially, um, as, the, uh, as the rest of the MX-5 bunch all come through. And they're all, all stuck together, these ones. The 47, the 101, uh, as they come through. And of course, the 80, 86, or was it the 83? Uh, number three is, is the head of these ones. Uh, and uh, that is um, Rob Adams, or Martin Adams, in the Bora Motorsport entry there in the, uh, in the maroon number three. Up towards Coppice they come then, nose to tail, to nose to tail, to nose to tail, and some more back there. At the rear of the field, you'll find the 150 Mini. That Mini was formerly the head of the field, and that's <laughs> Stevens. So if you're trying to make a little bit more progress as they exit on towards the back straight, get on the power. Here comes the BMW on the brakes. Late, 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 can't quite get himself past the Mazda. It actually ends up being a little bit too late because here comes the Renault Clio earlier on the power, but still at a steering lock. And of course, in a front wheel drive car, there's only so much grip at the front end, and you've got to use it to either apply power or turn, not necessarily both. Absolutely. Well, the, the, the power of the BMW Z4 um, in uh, in comparison there to the Mazda getting ahead, but now the Salika getting a little bit um, a little bit quicker uh, p potentially, so um, able to live with the BMW at, uh, at this stage as the the wipers are on. I don't think the rain is, has worsened in any degree, um, and certainly we're not picking up any spray or, or standing water at this stage. Oh, a look down the inside, perhaps <laughs> that was late uh, and uh, and slightly um, slightly. Slightly speculative there from the 144 of um, of Popson, um, who uh, couldn't quite get uh, get the car stopped to the apex uh, in time, but managed to avoid contact. Hobson's car looks very good when it's going in a straight line. It's straight line braking performance, it's straight line traction is okay, but whenever it's turning, it doesn't quite seem to grip the surface in the same way. Yep. Again, in a straight line, closes up to the back of that BMW Z4, but there's nothing Hobson can do about it through Coppice. He'll now tuck in. There's a little bit of traffic to deal with. It finds the slipstream down the inside line. The question is, is he brave enough to try this on the brakes? It's going to be BMW versus Toyota, and the Toyota is not close enough to the back, so Hobson will have to sit there, try again another lap. It's onto the pitch straight for them. You'll be thinking about Redgate at turn one. It will indeed. And I think Hobson has that uh, that bone and stop combination of two MX-5s behind. So ready to pounce if there are any issues, but it's going to have to be in the twisty stuff that the MX-5s um, get the move done on the Celica because uh, once they get out of the uh, out of the Robert chicane and down the weak cross straight, the Celica just stretches away. Out they come then. It's another straight section. It's another flat out section. Celica closes. It's Hobson trying to make a route into the back of the Erlen Williamson BMW Z4. Can't quite get there at this stage. We've still got the 141 Mini attempting to pass just about anybody, just about anywhere, but still no gaps make way for him in currently. That's eighth position actually. So he's attempting to move from eighth to seventh. It's Chris Reed. Chris Reed, who has a five second time penalty in that Mini for exceeding track limits.
interesting. Okay, so um, yeah, car 141 with a five second penalty as they're um, trading around. The, uh, the white Janetta that we have, um, that we saw in Anglesey as well, um, they're still running pretty slowly uh, at this stage. Um, and I think um, down there in, uh, in towards the very tail of the order, getting lapped once again, but uh, getting plenty of practice in and enjoying their day out here. Uh, the pit lane will open in about 20 seconds time uh, and we, can, we, we will start to see drivers coming in. Um, they'll be um, cognizant of conditions and, and what they can inform their co-drivers, of, of course. But um, Tester Quinn, now the gap at 12 seconds at the head of the field. Of course, it depends a little bit on who your driver is and all that sort of stuff. But I reckon in general, conditions seem relatively constant now. And with the forecast ever changing, you probably want to come in for your pit stop early and give the driver that's about to hop in a good chance to adjust. We've just had... The BMW come in, that's the Earl and Williamson car, the number 81. I reckon he was about 20 seconds too early for a mandatory stop there. Mm. So this could end up being not only time lost in the pit lane, but also a time penalty for coming in at the wrong time. We'll have to wait and see. Ooh. They're three wide down that's, at the old hairpin. The that was your leader trying to carve through a battle. He ended up with one of them either side. It's not quite what they've been hoping for, but the tester and Quinn Boxster continues pushing through. Pit window is now officially open, but I don't think it was before. Mm, I think I think you may you may have caught that one. Um, they do look to be fairly unhurried um, in the uh, in the in the driver swap here. We've already got drivers standing out in the pit lane uh, waiting for their driver swap. Uh, pit stop to come in so we'll, we'll catch them on their way in as well but yeah some uh, some some tense moments there for Tester Quinn who uh, who was struggling to get through the uh, the lap traffic and we'll see who decides to come through and pit uh, on this point on the way through as the number three Mazda MX-5 is chasing down one of our caterums uh, down the start finish straight Big moment there on oh. the brakes for the number eight car. The Mazda getting sideways all the way through. Not quite able to make a position after it, but fortunately able to cling on to the rear of that and MX-5. 16 of Alistair Eason was all over the grass on the exit of the rubber chicane as well. Um, looks like we've got uh, some come some cars moving aside and Grucock definitely pits here. And is that our leader, Testa Quinn, coming in in the Porsche? Uh, I don't think so, is <laughs> the simple answer for that, but it, we have got a number of cars down there, it was in fact this BMW, so oh, the 24 BMW is in, that's Hannah Garden and David Smitherum, I think it is going to be Hannah getting in and David checking the tyres all around, so Hannah's there. We caught this shot just a little bit afterwards. It'll be Hannah getting out and David Smitherum going in then. So David at the wheel of the BMW. They pitted from quite a reasonable position actually for those guys. They were are sitting around about 30th or so. And of course then you drop down just a little bit when you come into the pits and you'll see how it plays out on the other side. The 81 BMW was the offender. We just saw that one out on circuit. We think he's going to have to come in again is the awkward thing or potentially pick up a penalty for not serving his mandatory stop because he's simply not done that. We have uh, further penalties been awarded for track limits to car 21 and car 41. 21 would be Wayne Cockrell uh, and 41 uh, is David Zarzeski. Um, so they haven't featured particularly high in our order, um, but um, certainly, well, actually Zarzeski was sixth. So um, that, is, that is going to affect the top of our standings as things stand. But of course, we're waiting for pit stops to uh, to. to, to work the way out. Good battle developing here between both Mazdas. The 86 is the Lundy and Lundy machine ahead of the 6 driven by Colin Wells. Colin Wells has had a couple of sideways moments at the wheel of his purple Mazda. They head up the hill as now. As has the 86, <laughs> through, so let's be fair. He has <laughs> through Schwantz curve. They get it set up under braking. Is there an opportunity on the inside? No, oh, there's no. another sideways moment and it's a massive one. He's caught it. It's slapped back round on him. Come on. He's <laughs> try and get stopped out of there. in the gravel. I don't think Colin Wells is stuck in the gravel at this stage, but it's me a case of can you we get just a restart caught away as, he, as he lit in. up the, the rear axle and it dips slightly. So I'm I'm wondering whether he's going to get out or not. And it looks like um, he's managed to engage reverse, which is probably the easier way out of the gravel if you can't do it under under first or second gear. He's trying to find his way back to the race <laughs> <laughs> race track here. But he's got to be really careful about rejoining him because you, you wouldn't want to reverse down. And this is the problem he ran into before. Every time he selects first gear, he's bedding the car down into the gravel. So it's a really, really difficult job here. Pit stop still continuing to play out. Your race leader is currently in the pits making that one. So, and good to see actually that number six of 
Colin Wells is back out there. So lost a lot of time, probably lost quite a few positions as well. But fortunately, here we are back green flag over at McLean's corner. Into the pits here is the number 54 car. The 54 is the Caterham that's been battling on the fringes of the top 10. That's Chris Payne in his Super Sport Caterham. Of course, a lot of them look very similar. They are actually quite different underneath the bonnet. He'll get the usual sort of stops. It's a mandatory stop. You don't need to work on the car, but adjusting tyre pressures is something you'll commonly see because it gains you a lot of time in the second portion of the race. It certainly seems like wheel nut um, torque check, <laughs> checks are uh, certainly the order of the day today. Uh, we've had one driver retire from a race earlier on today thanks to a loose uh, wheel nut. So whether whether everyone else has been listening to that and paying extra attention or it's just part of the part of the course when you've been circulating for so long. Michael Rawlings in his yellow BMW then currently leads the field of of course, he's still overdue a pit stop. Interestingly, the gap between himself and Hills behind has actually been coming down. So Hills was fourth on the road pre pit stops. The Ginetta, however, lapping at least half a second lap quicker on the last few occasions. Last time around, it was massive. It was about 1.3 seconds. And it continues to be that sort of margin. We're down from four seconds to three seconds now between what are your top two on the circuit. A couple of pit stops still to play out, and Rawlings has been reeled in. You can now see wow. that Ginetta in the back of the picture. That's the number 80. It's driven by Aiden Hills, and Aiden Hills has the bit between his teeth that you're trying to get into it as into the pits comes the BMW. Uh, yeah, and a slow um, Citroen Saxo on the way in of, um, of the car number 58. I think that's the right entry. Uh, George Wright and uh, Warmold uh, coming in. That was uh, that looked slow down the back straight, and I wonder if um, if there may be an issue there. The the driver is um, the co-driver is waving frantically. I'm pretty sure the current driver was planning to go round and retire the car, but we'll shall see if they get back out again. Here we have an MX-5 battle, the 86 versus the number three, and the 86 has uh, certainly given us plenty of entertainment today. Lundy and Lundy just managed to fend off the uh, the early attack from our, our purple Mazda, Colin Wells. Yeah. They've now got another attack coming, which I'm sure wasn't quite on the car. This one is the turn of the three car of Adams and Adams. So it's the Lundys versus the Adamses as they attempt to continue their battle. They're currently sat, this is for ninth position, so actually worth quite a few points out there. They'll flick it right then left through the chicane onto the pitch straight they come, and it is going to be Adams and Adams who attempt to find a way through. They'll go across to the oh. outside of turn number one. They're closing, closing, closing. They have the speed, they have the momentum, but they don't have the car on the correct side of the road. It'll be all the way around the outside, not going to work. Instead, you think about the cutback, that's not going to work. Can you now go around the outside and Craner curves? Well, uh, that is not also, of course, that's the fight for the outright uh, class victory for the Mazdas here in Class uh, D. So it is uh, certainly very, very tense between these two, and that's what they're fighting over. Still, Lundy and Lundy have the advantage in that one. They are curling their way through the back of the circuit. Both of these cars yet to make a pit stop as well, so there's a chance they drop into some more of that Mazda class when it's all played out. These guys are currently in the pits. The BMW stop is going well. Fantastic to see that race-prepared car as car as well. The Saxo will wait and see. Cut back across to your Mazdas. They're currently rising the hill in towards Coppice. Get it turned in. The Mazda does look good there. Sideways moment this time for the three car. It's going to be the Adamses who are sideways. That prevents them getting on the power and they drop another couple of car lengths further away from class lead Lundy and Lundy. Yep, so currently uh, you're outright lead. We've got a 10 second penalty for car number 21, unfortunately. That's Wayne Cockrell. I think that might be the second time we've mentioned their names. Um, in, in in this, this is, that's in the in the lead, um, Salika at the moment, who's currently running fourth, although has yet to pit, I believe. One of the Salikas, as you say, up across the start finish line. Aiden Hills puts from the current lead of the race, but of course we're expecting the uh, Testa Quinn uh, car to come round and uh, pick up that, uh, that, that lead once again as Rawlings is also on the way out of the pits and uh, back under racing speed. Tester and Quinn are still logged as being in the pit lane according to our timing, and that has been far longer than the minimum stop. Hmm. I, I've got them reading in 15th there position we go. at the moment, yes, so I think so they are it's, back. It's uh, an issue with the on-stream graphic, if right. you like, then, as opposed to the overall timing setup. Tester and Quinn gaining positions on the road. A long way back, a lot of work to do, but hopefully various cars ahead of them will simply disappear and give them the spot, effectively, when they come into pit. What is the gap? 
ahead of them. The answer is quite a lot because Rawlings is already back out on circuit. Rawlings is behind, but not by as much as he was when they came into the pit. So a slightly longer stop than expected for Tester and Quinn, nonetheless. Yeah, I think so. I think it was slightly, slightly slow, but um, they've, they've certainly got enough of a window uh, and a margin of, uh, of their current uh, their current speed to uh, to stay ahead of that BMW by by some distance. Churubskowski is uh, in first position at the moment from Zarzewski, uh, Cockrell and Socket, and then come Lundy Lundy uh, in, the, uh, in the number 86 in fifth position, but we still haven't yet seen, I think, a pit stop from the Lundys. We are yet to see that indeed. C quick update on your class then. At the front overall, which is somewhat remarkable, is the Trukolsky Civic, which we will definitely see drop down the order when pit stops play out. Your effective B-class leader then is Tester and Quinn. Your effective D-class leader are the Lundys in their Mazda. C-class going to Zakruski in the 41 car. And G-class is even further down. Another one of the family pairings lead that one in the 912. That's right, the Norobilskis. Um, are in that um, in that number 912 car. We've got blue flags out at the final corner. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure who they're for because everybody is side by side and they're all in different laps and different classes at this stage. Yeah. So we'll wait and see how that one develops. We'll see Caterham on Caterham action, but they are completely on different laps. That's Grucock regaining track position, if you like, after his pit stop. Then they'll find their way to the bottom of the hill. They've got one more piece of traffic to deal, deal with. And this is quite important for Ben Grucock because he is now out and the next car ahead of him is going to be Rawlings. Rawlings currently sat some four seconds up the road or so, but it was coming down before the pit stop. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see how that uh, that gap works out. Tester's got, uh, Tester and Quinn have got Moss and Hills between themselves and uh, Rawlings. So Hills uh, has um, obviously got himself at this stage ahead of, uh, of Rawlings. We shall see if, um, if that uh, s stays as it was um, as they come through to uh, to finish these these various pit stop cycle. We're almost complete in our pit stop collection. That is a massive effort, oh. it should be said. <laughs> We've got a little bit of action round it. Coppice, a massive effort from Aiden Hills yeah. and his Ginetta because he was sitting fourth, remember. He's now running an effective second after the pit stop. So he's managed to gain not one but two with what we could call an overcut, but in reality was just great pace around about that pit stop window. He settled into the groove and is really beginning to get on with it now. Yeah, we'll try and pick him up as soon as possible. He's in a, a baby blue um, predominantly um, Ginetta. So uh, it's, a, it's a good looking car and uh, so far it's look doing well. And here he is then. And you can see the gap he's got to Rawlings behind. Uh, his current gap over to Tester Quinn is something like 11.7 seconds, which is less than it was beforehand. Um, so uh, that's less than even Rawlings had it to Tester Quinn earlier on. So we see the uh, double seven entry Celica. Uh, currently in 15th overall, running through the order and, uh, and able to, to keep pushing hard. Is, uh, is that uh, trying to work out who, who we were just seeing crest over the hill in front? But this is the number uh, 48, and there is the Tester Quinn Boxster entry. The leader of the race come through. And we wait to see how long it takes to see the bright blue Janetta. And here he is coming through the chicane. So that gap um, may well be shrinking even further as he looks to be really leaning on the car now. He's, uh, he's not sharing this drive, is, um, is Aiden Hills. And he moves up to make that 11.4 seconds. I think that was a three, sec three tenth of a second gain on that lap. Um, so he'll start to put the pressure on with 16 minutes and three quarters to go. You've got to wonder where this pace for Aiden Hills was in the first 15 minutes of the race, if you like, because it wasn't until that pit stop window where we saw him start to close up. And maybe he was just bedding himself in, but if he had shown this from the very start, he would be with Tester and Quinn at the very head of the field in that Porsche box there. Instead, he's having to claw back this gap, which even at a second a lap is going to be very tight in terms of getting there before the end of the race. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it could be that during the pit stop there was a, a pressure change or something like that that has uh, really woken up the car and, uh, and, and allowed things to continue. Or 
uh, it could also be that um, that it doesn't handle particularly well in the rain shower that we had. And now that it's gone back dry again, uh, maybe things are a little bit more straightforward for Aiden Hills. I reckon that might be a good call, even if it's not the car, it could be driver just wanting to make sure you keep it safe because of course, we are sat here in the commentary box, we want people to be on the limit all the time, but <laughs> when it starts to come down like that, it is your car, yes. so you might just want to make your sure. Your car, and in, and in terms of Aiden Hills as well, your company uh, <laughs> that's at stake here. So um, I don't imagine the Jeanette is a particularly cheap one to uh, to run either. So um, yes, probably just needing to uh, to build the uh, build the speed rather than be uh, on the ragged edge right from the very beginning. Rawlings, though, uh, how far is he behind at the moment from um, from Hills, that's a 2.7 second gap, so it, he's keeping him honest. And it could come down actually between Rawlings and Hill. You, it wouldn't surprise you if you do that. Moment for Janetta, however, I would just like to mention in terms of cars, they are quite expensive compared to some of the other ex machines we'll see out there. But as soon as you're looking at GT machinery and the Janetta is a proper GT car, then it's suddenly on the cheaper end. They do a really, really good job of their program. Partially because they produce so many pieces because they've got the juniors and the Super Cup and everything else in between and they do so much single make stuff that the cost is inherently down a little bit. It's a brilliant model from Janetta that allows them to get people yes. in purpose-built race cars out on circuit. But comparatively to something... Um, well, like the, the Civic for the, the 88 <laughs> car we have out there, for example. <laughs> Currently leading the field, it should be said, Trip Kroski in that 88 Civic. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I suspect it doesn't cost quite so much as uh, that. But we are. How on earth have we got Trip Kroski? Um, I've got him registered as having a, a pit stop already, but how can he still be in the lead if he's had a pit stop? Um, it's confusing me a little bit because he's not that much faster. Ah, and there we go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he's just lost a position to Tester Quinn. Um, and I, uh, by my eye, at least, I didn't think he'd actually pitted yet, Cherubkowski. There's always a chance we've missed it. We, uh, we do get great view of the pit lane here at Donington, but it doesn't mean we're very good at using it. So well, now, he's, the, now he's the going down the order. <laughs> now he drops down as the time of screen updates. So Trubskowski down to at most fifth, and we wouldn't be surprised if it ends up being a little bit lower than that, but it seems like the right sort of region. Pit window is now closed. That's official. If you've not made your stop, you'll be in a lot of trouble, but everybody that's still still circulating, pardon me, is in fact having made their stop. The one we'll have to keep an eye on, of course, was when we saw that premature stop. So we'll watch the penalty warnings for anything like that. There is a very slow Mazda just climbing up yeah. over the hill. It's all silver, and it looks as if that's all it's got at this stage. We'll pull into the pits. I reckon he might just make this, you know, which will allow us to keep going. Yeah, I think that's the number 18 or 16, sorry, Alistair Eason, who's had a bit of a trouble um, getting the car um, completely right today anyway. Um, but unfortunately, it looks to be um, curtains for his uh, eBay MSBT Track Day Trophy race today. And I, uh, they won't come back tomorrow either. This is just a, uh, a one-day uh, situation, I believe. Oh, no. Yes, I think that's right. So uh, they, they only race on the Saturday here in the uh, Track Day Trophy. I think we have the Track Day Championship tomorrow uh, still to come. So some of the some of the cars will 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 um, battle in that race as well. The Track Day Trophy, of course, designed to get people from Track Days into racing. If you like, is sort of a stepping stone on the ladder. It does a great job of that. But another way that we try and keep costs down, in addition to allowing the regulations to be so open, oh. is in fact to only run on the one day. That is the number 81 BMW Z4. That's Earl and Williamson. They were in various good fights. They now had a good fight with the tyre wall. They are backed into it. They are communicating with the circuit staff at this stage. So we'll wait and see what happens. Door is open. Hopefully the next thing we see is a driver sticking his hand out or something along those lines. But we shall update as follows. The car doesn't seem too damaged from the front, but of course it's the rear of the car that's in the tire wall, so we shall have to wait and see how that one develops. I'm just trying to work out where exactly he is. He's marked as stop, stopped on the start-finish line on the track map that we have, but I think that's the exhibition straight, is it not? The track map only updates uh, when they cross when it. They cross, so yeah. they, they will always <laughs> stop at the start-finish line if you're following along on TSL timing. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to see exactly where Not quite where got the finished. budget for... Um, for satellite navigation <laughs> tracking of these cars, unfortunately, we we rely on the times. That's that is a tricky one to spot, actually. 
in amongst all of it. We'll get the slow zoom out of the circuit. Is it the inside of McLean's? I think it is. Inside of McLean's is where that car is. So oversteer on exit is quite possible there. We've been oh. speaking about it all day. It might have ended up over there. This is Rollings Here's your on, battle for second. Hills, yeah. Rollings outside of hills. It's BMW versus Ginetta. Ginetta is blue. BMW is yellow. And it is still just about going to be Aiden Hills, who has the advantage, but he's not got the grunt on the straight. Around the outside comes Rawlings. The question is, can he hold on to it when they get to the tighter part of the circuit in just a moment? Absolutely. And there is Grucock in the Caterham as well. One car between himself and Hills. Uh, but um, uh, again, I wonder about there being a, a waved yellow uh, previously on the track and then suddenly the gap shrinking um, to, to that degree there from, from between Hills and Rawlings. I, I kind of wonder how that's possible under a waved yellow uh, with a car stationary on the inside. And it's certainly Hills is back on it very, very uh, significantly already now. Aiden Hills looks racy in his blue Ginetta then. They're at Coppice Corner. To the inside comes Aiden Hills, sticks his nose in, takes his nose out because he realised all that was going to happen was contact there as the gap shrunk ever more. And all of that battling has allowed Ben Grucock to get involved. Here <laughs> comes Ben Grucock, the caterham. It doesn't often get a run on much, but it's got a run on a Ginetta here. He'll be late, late, late on the brakes. Rawlings is looking in his mirrors, thinking, this is amazing. I'll just escape up the road. Ginetta around the outside of caterham, and it's still Rawlings second, Aiden Hills third, and Ben Grucock running fourth in the caterham. Yeah. Um yeah, the, the Caterham came through came through um, Coppice incredibly well there as, uh, of course, we saw Hills have to be um, be a lot uh, a lot more shy going through the corner, have to la trying to launch a, a speculative move on Rawlings. I think Hills getting a little bit impatient, possibly, and getting uh, underneath the car um, comes the Caterham once again on those fast corners. It really does um, grip in and, uh, and, and help down through the craners. He's got the inside line. He's got the tail ahead of the nose of the Celica, and he just carves through past the 58 Saxo and actually the Janetta getting through the corner much nicer from the outside back to the inside again as they approach the next one. It's Schwantz curve then, Janetta just about out dragging Caterham on the brakes towards McLean's. I'd rather be in the Caterham at this stage. The nose looks very, very pointy, able to get the rotation, able to look for the inside, but there was a back marker there pulling out the way, so he has to tuck back in. Now they're at Coffice, swing it to the right, get on the power. The Caterham will just be a little bit sideways all the time there, dip in the nose, dip in the oh rear. Dear. We've had huge contact down at the start, finish straight. There is waved yellows, and I suspect about to be a lot more as we've got a Janetta with the front end off and a rather damaged looking Mazda. We'll hope that everybody's okay in that one, but we shall provisionally see. Further back, hopefully, we'll be able to confirm the order. So, unfortunately, that's Alex it's Wilkinson Hughes in the, um, in the red uh, Mazda MX-5 that has had a, a few problems already today um, at various points. And I think that's the Newman Mangot uh, car number 30, is it? Is it the 3-0 Janetta, um, potentially, that has had a problem there? Yellow flags then, and of course, safety car deployed. The event result, which was sort of cut short that battle, was that in second, it's still Rawlings from third place Hills and fourth place Ben Grucock. That, of course, won't change now as we're under safety car. Eight minutes left to go. There's a chance we get some racing laps out of this one. Hand out the window and red flag is the verdict, and I think that is very, very sensible indeed. So red flag. By the look of the um, the tire markings on the on the start finish straight, it does look like the Janetta went nose first into the pit wall, um, and uh, and then ended up at 90 degrees to the racing uh, direction. Uh, quite how the 101. Uh, got involved or didn't get involved in that of course we don't know we didn't see the the actual incident unfortunately but there's bits of Janetta being picked up now unfortunately and that is uh, that's that's a, a big shame because of obviously the last thing anybody wants is contact and damage uh, when they turn up to uh, to race here red flag with eight minutes on the clock then the cars will queue up out of the final corner and I suspect under normal conditions we try and get this going again, but we are already a long t way behind schedule as a result of earlier incidents. So play this one by ear and see what happens, I think, is the simple fact of it. Marshalls as ever will do a brilliant job to try and get everything cleared up as quickly we as were possible. At 82%, we've just been marked as 100% complete on the timing screen. So I, I think the decision has been made um, there to um, to completely stop the race and uh, and declare it as it finished at 82% with Tester Quinn uh, at the head, head of the field from Rawlings, Hills and Grucock. And, and I think Hills will probably feel a little bit aggrieved about this uh, because um, 
I think um, th there may be an issue over that yellow flag and uh, him slowing more perhaps than Rawlings. I'm not entirely sure on that, but um, Hill's also had a lot of pace as it, and was getting faster and faster throughout that race, as we mentioned. Final order then will involve Tester and Quinn. They had a very nice race and were able to avoid all of that, it should be said. There's going to be quite an extensive period of cleanup with this one. So hopefully, as ever, we, we hope and cross our fingers that everybody's okay, but we'll await confirmation of that one with what seemed to have been quite a heavy impact down the start finish straight. The order looks like this, however, with the result declared. It'll be Tester and Quinn ahead of Michael Rawlings and Aidan Hills, who in turn wins Class C. Ben Grucock finished in fourth in fourth position ahead of Trubkowski, McPhail, Zagruski, Gareth Socket, and Chris Reed in amongst all of that one. Your Class D victor in all of this found himself 12th overall. That was Lundy and Lundy, ahead of Wilkinson Hughes, Payne, Adams and Adams, Stevens, Stoat, Bowen, Wells, Dean, Cooper, and Curran. 23rd went the way of Moss, Murphy was 24th, Allen 25th, Warwick 26th, 27 goes the way of Lenthal, and then you'll find Garden Smitherum, Noboliskis, Gibbons and Rig, and then McKeegan, Newen and Mingott, and then a few of the people who didn't quite make it to the finish. We're down there, we have some drivers, we have some cars, we have a podium, and we've got a fantastic commentator. I'm down here uh, in the pit lane with, um, with Ronan Quinn. Uh, Ronan, a, a, you've got a big smile on your face. That looked like a very successful day's racing. Yes, it was a brilliant race. Yeah, we managed to qualify on pole, so we set ourselves up well for the race. And then Colin did a great job at the start. He managed to hold off the Beamer just about. They were side by side at the start there, but he held it off, got a lead, and then I managed to carry on with it um, despite the changeable conditions and a, a lot of uh, backmarker traffic as well, which kept it interesting. There was a moment that we saw, actually, where you side in between two back markers. That, that must have got the heart rate up. Oh, for sure, yeah. You're never quite sure which way they're going to go, so you kind of just have to be patient and wait. But, uh, and the yellow flags, kind of, you had to be really careful of those. Um, so it was definitely, you know, a lot of strategy involved in passing those, but, but good, good, good challenge. Everything felt good with the car today. Um, it looked like everything was going very smoothly. Yeah, the car was brilliant. Uh, the tyres started to go off there towards the end, so it was getting quite a bit loose. Um, but yeah, the car's brilliant and Colin does a great job preparing it, so I can't recommend him enough. Fantastic. Well, congratulations there to Quinn and Tester for the win at the uh, eBay MSVT Track Day Trophy. Let's go and see if we can find, uh, find Rawlings here. Um, Rawlings, let's, uh, let's have a chat, if we may. Uh, second place, uh, and it looked like you went, um, you, you were third, you were second, you were third, you were second. That, that would look like a, a really uh, enjoyable race from our perspective. Yeah, it was, it was a battle. The Gen Jeanette's got some pace, so yeah, it was really good. But this, is, this thing's pretty, pretty quick as well, so yeah. It was, it was a good race, yeah. And when the rain came, it came a little bit, bit of a challenge, but uh, a little bit. But it was all right, yeah, it's good, good race. That's ex excellent. Where was the car feeling particularly good for you uh, around this circuit? Uh, Craners is pretty good. F flat out into it for a crater, so it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you've had a, a really fun day. Was was the start your best opportunity to to, to, to get to, to get this car on our right here? Yeah, I think so. But to be fair, that's got some legs. I don't think I was going to keep up with him. He's a pretty good, good pretty pretty good peddler anyway. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to come second. It's good. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, well, congratulations to Rawlings there, and I'm going to try and get a word here um, with Aidan Hills. Aidan, congratulations on the third place, but I, I sense you might be feeling like it may be a second that might have got away there. Uh, yeah, uh, after qualifying I thought I, was, I had the pace to be top two, um, and great pit stop. I, my in-lap was really good and, and the out-lap was good, so I managed to pull about four and a half seconds, I think, uh, for the lad in third. And then, I was coming up to a couple of lads who were battling in Class C, and I don't know whether they thought I was in the race of them, and they started defending, and I literally lost four seconds in one lap. And we haven't quite got the straight line speed, obviously, being a Class C car, so, uh, yeah, he just got the run on me down into Turn 1. I couldn't quite get him back, and then, obviously, we 
unfortunately with the red flag, I hope everyone's all right, because that looks like quite a nasty crash. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then that must be said, that's, that's chief among all of our minds, of course. But Aidan, uh, you've, been, uh, you've been kind of, this is a fairly new uh, exploration for you, the, uh, the, the Ginetta. So how have you found the conversion? How, how have you found the, um, the, the, the step into this car? And um, we, we did seem to, find, uh, seem to see that it certainly had some weaknesses out there in this class. Yeah, uh, it's just straight line speed, you know. Um, it's only got 130 horsepower at the wheels, so it's, it's massively underpowered for, for stuff like this. But it, it stops so well and turns so well that it's, you know, compared to the Mazda, is is hard to get your head around. You know, I was in a Mazda yesterday and then jumped back in this today. Um, I haven't been in it in over a year, so it's a little bit rusty this morning. But I think by the end of the 45-minute race, I got got back into it a little bit. That would explain why we saw your pace getting faster and faster and faster until, of course, that, that, that back marker experience. Well, hopefully it's the start of, um, of, of more good things to come. Yeah. So where, when are you next to me racing this one? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest, because I'm run, running the Miata Trophy team. So if there is opportunities, probably uh, October at the end of the year at Brands, I'll definitely do track day trophy there because we're there anyway with the Mazda. So I may as well take the old girl out and have a go. Well, good stuff. Well, it's, it's good to see you. It's a good looking car as well. So well done and, and congratulations on the third. That, that's all, all from down here at the podium uh, in terms of our uh, overall uh, victories. Uh, but back up to the comms box then to Tom. Thank you very, very much, Andy. We've got a lot of rain suddenly blowing in to the McLean's end of the circuit. It's not quite reached us in the commentary box here, but we've got a camera shot of it, which makes it look really quite unpleasant it should be said over that set of things just behind me on the melbourne loop we've got our next set of cars preparing as well this is the srcc sports 2000 championship they can i just quickly had... quickly interrupt you uh, tom up there uh, before we get going i just want to uh, talk to uh, our class um, class deed winner lundy congratulations that looked like you had a, a good a good battle out there as well with the other mx5 yeah i had a great time out there it's the first time i've actually properly battled someone on track i've come from mainly endurance stuff so it's been more of you know a procession round so i've really enjoyed it today it's great fun having a good tussle with the other cars and how have you found the mazda compared to what you were driving before um so i've only driven the Celica before once but i wasn't racing it so mainly the Mazda's the only thing I've raced, so can't really compare it to much, but I love it. It's a great car. It is a good car. I drive one myself, but yes, uh, fantastic to talk to you. And uh, when, we, when, we, when are we going to see you next time? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you on that. <laughs> good stuff. All right. Well, well done. Good, good, uh, well, good race. Well done. So, as we were saying, it is time for the SRCC Sports 2000 Championship Duratech class out there. These are the more modern machines, of course, using the, you guessed it, Duratech engine from Ford. They're already setting themselves up on the Melbourne Loop, and I think that brief rain shower is already passing, which Joshua Law from Pole Position will be very, very glad for. He set a 109.251 to put himself ahead of Michael Gibbons. Row number two is where you'll find the Tudor Sherrington car ahead of Tom Stoughton. He's been working on his machine since Silverstone earlier. He goes from fourth. Fifth place is where you find Richard Johnson as head of David Houghton in the number eight car with row number four belonging to Paul Traher and he took a class pole if you like in the 71 and finds himself alongside James Barwell's 77. Your top 10 is completed by Keith Mizzen and Steve Off in the 50 car. Row number six is home to Colin Peach. He had a peachy time earlier, and he's looking forward to quite a good start for himself ahead of Ashley Law in the 73. Row seven belongs to Roger Donnan, who had some issues earlier on today. Hopefully he's got them sorted out uh, before he can start next to Andy Chittenden. John Eiley will get on to what a magnificent man he is, no doubt, throughout the course of this one. He's ahead of Grant Gibson in the treble one with the row number nine belonging to Joshua Needham and Peter Williams. Top 20 cars in this one. You'll find John Owen in 19th and Clive Hayes in 20th. Row number 11, 21st is Andrew Butler and 22nd is David Gorston, the 103. And before you know it, that is the completion of your grid. Now, we mentioned John Eiley in that one. Any properly hardcore fans of motorsport will know exactly who he is. He's an aerodynamicist. He's been technical director at various times in Formula One. And essentially, if you name a team, He's probably been there, the Caterham, Renault, Ferrari, McLaren, he has done the lot and he's now working on one of these things with some of the guys from the university, which is absolutely fantastic to see. It's University of Wales, Trinity St. David. They've been working on the aerodynamic side of things with this and the car is slowly coming together to look like really quite a weapon. 
Yeah, um, we, we, we enjoyed watching those cars, and it was actually the teammates um, uh, of uh, of Eiley who uh, who managed to uh, to finish ahead there, the Tudor and Sherrington ones previously, uh, and were were showing very well. So, um, very pleased to see that we've been able to uh, get everything um, organised back again in time for the next race. But uh, apologies there for throwing up to you and then and then reinterrupting. I, wasn't expecting to uh, to find a driver quite that late into the proceedings, but there we are. We managed to speak to them anyway. That rain shower has passed through the circuit now. It was covering pretty much every piece of tarmac that wasn't the pitch straight at one stage. It was on McLean's, it was on Craner's, it was down the bottom of the hill as well. But notably, although of course it's not raining anymore, it does just put that fresh sheen on the surface that'll take away the optimum grip again. Yeah, you can actually see, for, I mean, even from our position here, you can see just that sheen across across the entry into Redgate. It will just create a little question mark in the driver's minds. I don't think they'll worry too much about it, but uh, it will it'll, it'll be there at the back of their minds just uh, whether to push it at 100% or keep it back to sort of 98% as we get through. But of course, they've got their green flag lap to, uh, to get familiar with the circuit. I'm not sure if the weather pun was intentional there, but I did enjoy it None the, nonetheless the amongst all of this one. So these guys are out here. They've got some races tomorrow as well. So if you're enjoying it, which I can assure you you will, they'll be back. We'll be back on the stream as well. So make sure you are all over that one, but we'll get to the details of that later on. So much wind now that we're beginning to get some of our CCTV cameras shaken about to a point whereby it does make you feel quite ill if you make that full screen. So we'll keep it on the small modulated picture instead. But a lot of gusting here. Not only is the wind speed very high, I think in excess of 20 miles an hour, it's also gusting suddenly with quite noticeable peaks. And it's always a crosswind down the notable parts of the circuit. The pit straight and in turn, of course, the straight out of Coppice, that's a crosswind. The bottom of the hill is a crosswind. The one place where you might want a headwind, of course, is Crane is for more downforce. You've got a tailwind there to take it away instead. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely going to create the challenges for the drivers. Uh, they should be just about used to it. We've uh, we've managed to um, to have this, uh, this similar situation once again. Uh, it's been windy and blowy um, all day long, um, but um, yeah, these guys um, will clearly start to uh, to wonder about it it would be similar windy conditions to what they suffered in um, in qualifying earlier on as well so hopefully they'll be okay but we're going to have those two green flag laps um, just uh, for the drivers to get uh, familiarized with themselves a um, little spot of rain on the current um, trackside camera here and i wonder if there's more rain to come or, or if it's just um, just residual rain from previously but uh, yeah, it has definitely been one of the key stories um, from today's racing has been that, uh, that uh, the changing conditions and, uh, and difficulty that the drivers have had to, uh, to operate. We, um, we, we obviously, we've saw, seen earlier on, we saw the historic Sports 2000s. Now we're into the current or contemporary Sports 2000s, the Duratec uh, models. And this is a 20-minute uh, race here uh, and uh, our sixth race of the day. Um, so two more to come after this one. We'll talk about those, of course, in due course. But um, some, some tremendous-looking machines here, Tom. I think one of the best things to look at, actually, on this machine, well, particularly Joshua Law at the head of the field, is that he's running the number one plane. I think that is amazing to see. You see various drivers go, do you know what, I've got my lucky number, or I've got my brand number, and all that sort of stuff, or I don't really want to have to repaint the car for next year, so I'm going to keep the one I've got. Joshua Law running the one plate, as is his right as reigning champion. Michael Gibbons will be trying to take it from him, and a driver that I'm very, very interested to see how he goes is Tom Stoughton, because he started the year, he's got a new car, and it was not playing ball. Pretty much anything that could go wrong or have a gremlin was going wrong on him in the earlier rounds particularly at the Silverstone National Circuit. He's now qualified fourth. The car hasn't had an issue so thus far this weekend. Hopefully that means he can at the very least stay where he starts or maybe even try and progress forwards onto the podium. Yeah, they'll be working hard. They'll be working the wheel, of course, as they go through to um, to finish their green flag laps now. Of course, they've got some of the 28 um, of I don't actually have number 28 on my... <laughs> 28 is John Owen. He John starts Owen. from 19th position. Ah, fantastic. Okay, thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, all the drivers 
finding the limits and trying to warm up the tyres, of course, as they go through here. And uh, our starters are, are ready to, uh, to get the cars lined up as well before we get underway. 20 minutes, then, we have for these Sports 2000 Duratec class. Um, the Duratec class, uh, all the com contemporary cars. Um, but um, so the Duratec A's will head the field. The B's uh, will be the ones built before 2006. And then the DB class are for any Juratec uh, car that uh, features a driver over 60 years old. So um, there's no reason particularly why those drivers might not mix it with the rest of the class uh, as they move forward through the grid. And if you look at the body shape of these in the sort of modern world of aerodynamics, you'll notice that they're almost like single seaters with cover wheels, if you like. You, you can see that central cockpit goes forwards from the triangular shape, and then you've got the suspension reaches out to a wheel cover, which n goes back down on the other side towards what would be a, a side pod on a single seater, and then back up over the rear wheel again. It's that shape that was proven to be incredibly aerodynamic, and crucially, allows you to split the air between the turbulent air on top of the floor and the laminar flow underneath, which allows you to play with that air underneath the car, speed it up, suck the car to the ground, and play with the ground effect, which particularly in coppice here, and of course, craner curves as well, makes a huge difference to the amount of rear end grip you have and means you can really floor it in places where you've got absolutely no right to be doing so. And it's pretty rare to see the back end step out on these as well with, when the drivers are really going for it. Just just uh, bearing witness to that downforce effect. Uh, the highest potentially that downforce cars that we will see, of course, uh, through the course of this weekend. Um, we've got Enduro car. <laughs> <laughs> Drivers lined up on the green. I do apologise for the, the bad and badly timed pun, to be honest. The marshals have done a fantastic job of getting us ready for this one. We shall await the green flag at the back. It's unfurled and it is waved, which means we are all ready to go racing. We've already had the get ready board from the front. We now have five lights ablaze. Who's going to get the best start? The answer is not initially Joshua Law, but he gets a good gear change and drives his way towards the head of the field. Keep an eye on Tom Stoughton. He's looking to the outside, but he's going to get squeezed all the way to the edge of the track, and he's actually going to have to bail out of that one, maybe losing two positions, three positions. Stoughton's almost off the road. He gathers it up and gets going once more. It'll be Joshua Law at the head of the field then, ahead of Michael Gibbons, and in turn, the number 40 machine is running in third. Yeah, that was a great start from the 40, uh, and uh, there's a nice uh, just positioning there um, from the blue and yellow machine that uh, managed to get uh, get his position nicely uh, secured there, going into the old hairpin, and they head up towards to uh, towards McLean's now, and we'll see if we can find uh, how the order is is sorting itself out. Brilliant for Michael Gibbons there. He's been driving this car for a little while. He knows its limits, and he had it four wheels sliding on the entry to McLean's. They're all ready through Coppice as they snake their way around this Derbyshire circuit, get it turned in, get on the power. As we spoke to earlier, it's not actually a second apex, but you almost hold it tight, hold it tight, hold it tight, then let it sweep out. Before you know it, on the brakes for the chicane, flick it to the right, get it turned into left, and absolutely floor it to complete the first lap in our 20-minute race. Across the line, it will be Joshua Law who leads from Michael Gibbons, and in turn, that number 40 Tudor and Sherrington car. Yeah, that's the uh, University of, uh, of Wales entry as well, who uh, are clearly doing a great job there up into the, 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 uh, the third place. Uh, car 34 is just running a little bit slow, but I must just mention, I don't know if we've got any fans uh, with us uh, today, but I must just mention, I believe that the circuit's in Leicestershire. So... Uh, oh. <laughs> The postcode is Darby. <laughs> yes. I just apologise. That number 34 is uh, Roger Donnan. He actually stopped on circuit at the end of practice, so his gremlins continue through to the race on this occasion. Brilliant move from the 148. That will be for 15th position. Chittenden finding a way through on John Eilie, nonetheless, at the bottom of the hill. At the head of the field, however, it's still Joshua Law who's got the lead. 25 gets a little bit of contact, and the 7 spins in sympathy as well. Synchronized spinning. Johnson. <laughs> Synchronized spinning. Hopefully both cars can make it out. I know the number 7 uh, appeared to uh, get a a good initial grip and managed to get away and there is the 25 just getting back onto the racing circuit as the fastest lap is, is uh, confirmed Joshua Law a 109.718 three tenths of a second quicker than Gibbons behind crucially so Gibbons not got an answer for it at the moment the gap between the front two up to 1.3 seconds the car to keep an eye on is going to be Tom Stoughton Tom Stoughton muscled out off the start and he's beginning to make progress back through now he was through on Barwell that lap now he's got Houghton and in turn Paul Trey 
Treyhorn to try and find a little bit of progress and pace relative to. They're already down through the bottom of the hill. They get on the power so, so early as a result of the magnificent diffusers on the rear of these cars. Then they sweep up through Schwann's curve, get it turned in towards McLean's, and it's the blue car in the middle of this pack that's trying to make progress. That's Tom Stilton. He's had gremlins all year long, but at Coppice, he looks racy. Absolutely, yeah. Very The tightest battle we have um, in the top ten, at least, uh, this Trahern Hunt and Stoughton and Barwell uh, battle going on at the moment uh, as, we, uh, as we go through uh, and uh, into lap uh, three, of course. Down into the chicane then. No one trying to make a move just yet, but Joshua Law going faster still at 109.503. Gibbons actually tried to respond on that lap. He found a lot of time, but ended up being a tenth of a second slower than Joshua Law's new fastest lap of the race. Here comes Tom Stoughton. He wants the inside. It's not available. He's forced to the outside. He was late, late, late on the brakes, and he still gets a better exit than Houghton up ahead. But Tom Stoughton, no way through because the positioning from David Houghton in the eight car is absolutely brilliant so far. So far, so good. Absolutely, yeah. And he's still looking for a, a, a move down into the hairpin, but he couldn't quite get it done either uh, and uh, just putting the frighteners on slightly trying to uh, move around in the mirrors and uh, distract the driver in front there is the seven who was uh, off spinning behind the 25 but is back under uh, under racing speed now the number seven of uh, of Hayes uh, down in 19th position at the moment just got one place up on Gorst that looked like Stoughton somewhat on his own as they came through that shot. We'll keep an eye on this one because Stoughton was surrounded by a number of cars, namely David Houghton as well. So we'll have to see how that one plays out. Another fastest lap of the race goes to Joshua Law. And again, Gibbons was quicker than his previous lap, but he can't quite match Joshua each time they come through. Here is Tom Stoughton. He's trying to apply pressure forwards, but he's actually getting a little bit of pressure from behind in the form of James Barwell's 77 car. James Barwell attempted to make progress all the way through but currently doesn't quite have an answer for the late breaking performance of Tom Stoughton which has been magnificent in the opening few laps of this encounter. Definitely, yeah, so we're under 15 minutes to go now uh, and Law's gap only 1.5 seconds but he is he is stretching it albeit incredibly slowly because Gibbons is pushing them uh, like crazy to try and catch him. Do you know what actually I stand corrected and I do apologize Stoughton has made a move on David Hofton and in doing so, they both presumably had a bit of an encounter and James Barwell passed them both. So it is in fact actually Barwell who runs six, Stoughton stays seventh and often dropped two down to eight. So they're the opposite way around to how they are on your timing tower right now. They'll accelerate their way down the back straight away. Who is going to be late on the brakes? We know Tom Stoughton will. Can James Barwell? The answer is yes, he can. They were very, very equal through that one. They both hammer that left-hand side pedal and then they hammer the right-hand side pedal as they accelerate down the pitch straight. Tom Stoughton is closing. He's in the slipstream. He's got a little bit more grunt. He's looking towards the inside. You can see the glance from his helmet, but he's not close enough to position his car to it. No, it didn't seem to be able to catch under braking there as much as you might expect. So uh, he's, he's lacking a little confidence under braking here. We have a slow car. Is that the 25 that spun earlier? I believe it is. And that's Needham's uh, entry. Unfortunately, he is, uh, is touring pretty slowly. So possibly whatever caused the spin has, has developed into something worse. Or perhaps being in the gravel has, um, has worked its way into to causing something um, terminal for him. But slowing down and heading towards the pits, I imagine. Here comes Don Stoughton still attempting to apply pressure to the 77 car of James Barwell, which I can assure you is the one ahead, despite your timing screen suggesting otherwise. That's often behind Tom Stoughton, who is still not close enough to apply the pressure. They will attempt to push themselves all the way up, and at the moment, there's just a little bit of nick and tuck between them, but Stoughton cannot find an answer to the car ahead. There's no way through at the moment. They're incredibly closely matched here. The gap at the front has gone out to 2.1 seconds, as uh, then the gap to third place, as the 40 car from uh, University of Wales, Judas Sherrington, is uh, out to 7.3 off the lead and 5.2, but completely alone in third place at the moment. 
They'll still try and reel forwards then. Stoughton down the bottom of the hill. The reason we're keeping an eye on this is because he's the car who's causing the battles, if you like. He's out of position considering how quick he is. At the front, Joshua Law has control of this one. He's quicker than Gibbons behind in terms of fastest lap, and he's quicker lap by lap as well. The gap reaching 2.1 seconds now before you get back to the 40 car in third position, which is a further five seconds away. So one, two, and three pretty much set. And in turn, you're speaking about Tom Stoughton and how far through this field can you get? He's got Hofton, Treyhardt, and Johnson ahead of him. And they're all looking a little bit vulnerable, it should said, relative to the maximum pace of Tom Stoughton's 26 machine. Lots of, um, lots of frantic action going on further down the grid as well, as we watch um, right now. That's the Meisen car at the, uh, at the tail of this particular battle with O, Peach, and Law ahead in turn. And they've been, uh, they've been stuck together for some time now. As we see a move here, it's going to be a, an attempt down the outside, down the inside, but it's not quite going to be uh, making the move. Uh, and that is, uh, I think that's Peach in the uh, appropriately coloured um, orange, uh, uh, peachy orange and black livery. And he's going to have a little look down all the way up towards Redgate. He's got the inside line ready and he, he may be able to outbreak the 73 entry of Law. Uh, Law whose namesake is leading the, 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 the race at the moment, but it looks like Ashley Law just losing that position, and that puts Peach up into ninth place. Still to now attempting to apply some pressure to Paul Trahern in the 71 car. They have caught Trahern for what is fifth position. Now, obviously, Trahern's in a different class, so there's an argument that if Tom gets a little bit of angsty behind, he should just let him go. But they're all racers, and you know he's not going to do that because he wants to fake position. He wants to make sure that he's ending up with not just as many positions as possible, but as much fun as possible from his day here at Donington Park. Those guys are currently on the back straight, and it is by far the closest battle because Hofton is sitting there lurking behind. Here they come across the line it is still Tom Stoughton in the middle of Trey Hearn ahead and Hofton behind despite time screen still suggesting that Hofton's ahead of Stoughton there's something odd happening with the transporters looks like Meisen just got ahead there of um, of, uh, of Gibson and is now chasing down O in uh, in P11 uh, Peach has got ahead of Law as well as they head through, as we covered, and, uh, and a fairly late move on the brakes by uh, the number 73, that time of, uh, of Ashley Law, just trying to uh, stem this flow because he's got overtaken by, uh, by Peach, and now they're all going up on him. It's the classic, once you let one through, yeah. you're hung out to dry, you're offline, and you can't really do much about it because you've lost momentum. In order to get back online, you need to lose even more momentum. So the 50 car of off now dropping down another couple of positions. He's going to be 13th or 14th by the end of this lap if he's not careful. We've got 9 minutes and 30 seconds left on the clock, and race control is pleading with people to respect track limits. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they're not reading those, uh, those uh, live timing instructions, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, that is the message that's gone out, respect track limits. I'm not sure exactly where on the circuit um, they would be worried about that too much. Is it exit of coppice, um, potentially, or, or overcutting the chicane? It, there was definitely a hint of overcutting the chicane. There are tyre barriers there, but if you get very, very close to them, there's always a hint that you can get it. And then essentially anywhere where you can really mount the curb, in particular the old hairpin at the bottom of the hill, on the inside you can get all over the curb and cut it, and on the outside you can use a bit too much curbing and be beyond the limit there as well. So Meisen ahead of Uff that time, so um, he's up into 11th. Uh, and completing the move there. So he's just got uh, Ashley Law and then, of course, Peach, who's uh, put an, a big gap over Ashley Law this time um, on, the, on the previous run through. So we have still 20 runners, um, and uh, that's a very, very uh, good showing so far. Tom Stoughton still cannot find a way out of this sandwich. He's got Trey Hearn ahead, he's got Hofton behind, and yet, he's unable to either attack or be passed. He's sitting there, and he ebbs and flows between them. So now you'll watch, he drops back towards David Hofton. He looks vulnerable, he looks vulnerable, but watch him on the brakes. He's so, so late. He gets a good turn in. Hofton was thinking about it, but he doesn't carry quite as much momentum through the corner. Now we get to the section called the Craner Curves, where you sort of swoop and sweep your way down the steep hill here at Donington Park. Stoughton is out wide there. He did not hook up the apex how he would have wanted. It drops him away from Trey Hearn, and now he's looking 
in his singular mirror that stands up down the middle of the car. Your 80 is running in third. He deals with a little bit of traffic. Your 40, rather, sorry. And then we get this battle for fourth position. Stoughton's wide again here. His front end not responding how he wants him to. We've got a pit visitor, but it's still Stoughton holding on now, it appears, to sixth position, despite looking a little bit vulnerable on the front end for the first time in the race. And that was the 50 getting very wide on the exit of the uh, of the corner onto the curbs, but he didn't lose too much time, managed to avoid the grass or gravel. We've got a car in the pits at the moment, uh, and uh, I don't think that's a new visitor, is it? Or is that, or is that actually Uff uh, who's in the pits? I can't quite see from my position. Unfortunately, when they go past us, they all look fairly similar in the bright sunshine <laughs> from the rear. Uh, but I don't see the race number on there at the moment. Is it that 73? I think it may be. It's, I think it's Ashley Law who's actually gone into the pits at the moment. Weaving down the straight from Tom Stoughton there, not an attempt to defend, but just kind of happening, which is odd, which would imply that he's lacking front tyre temperature. However, you would have thought, having already done the vast majority of this race, that he would have been fine on that perspective. The shot on screen was of Joshua Law. He is currently 3.8 seconds clear at the head of the field and putting together somewhat of a master drive, which is why we've not mentioned him. Further back, utter chaos, and you'll never guess who's involved again. It's off, who's in the middle in that 50 car. He's dropped back another couple of positions in this fight, it should be said, and now he's looking to defend from Chittenden behind, who's applying pressure all the time when they get to the slow stuff, but in the quick stuff, Steve's actually quite fast at the wheel of the 50. Absolutely, yeah. It is uh, fascinating how equal these cars are in performance and these drivers, and how the, uh, the smallest uh, little mistakes or, or slight corrections that are having to happen create these massive knock-on consequences throughout the rest of their, uh, their touring. But uh, we have another slow car here, Tom. We do indeed. We'll wait to get a number on that one and confirm. It looks to be a little bit of mechanical, or potentially just getting out of the way of the lead cars. So we'll have to wait and see here. Because there was a gaggle of cars on various laps there at that stage. Car 50 picks up a five second time penalty for track limits. That is Steve off. He was running very, very well, and he's still in this fight in terms of the road. However, he will not be there come the end. That is Tom Stoughton, I think. Tom Stoughton off the road down the bottom of the hill. He throws his hands in the air. He's not happy with this at all. Definite contact on that front left corner as well. So wait and see how that one plays out. But Tom Stoughton is not impressed at all. I reckon he's gone for the overtake potentially on Paul Trehearn. And Trehearn has closed the door on him there, which is why you'll see front left contact. He's stuck in that gravel trap. That is not going to move. The ground clearance of these purpose-built racing machines is not very tall, if anything. And as a result, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a safety car out here. At minimum, double yellows waved until the end of the race there because he's not very far off of the track at all. Uh, four and a half minutes remain, of course, of our, of our race. And uh, yeah, that is a, a diff very difficult place. He's having a, a good inspection of, uh, of the damage. Um, and we're trying to read the body language. Um, and we, we, we saw the gesticulation red flag. Uh, to say, but there is the red flag. We did just get past 75% distance. We got to 78% distance. And so that will be the end of, of proceedings. So I will have to run down to the pit lane once again, because <laughs> it looks like we're going to leave things as they are there. So we shall confirm the results because the time screen skips to race 100% finished and it leaves Joshua Law with a fantastic victory. The number one car finishes in position one ahead of Michael Gibbons and then the 40 machine finishes in third. Behind that, we had that fantastic fight developing between David Hofton, Tom Stoughton, and of course the 21 machine of Richard Johnson. Now Richard Johnson, will probably finish where he is. The question will be about Tom Stoughton because of course he's caused this red flag, but we'll have to backdate the results to the last time we had timing. So wait and see what happens with Tom Stoughton is the gist of it. Then in turn, Paul Trehearn dropped a few positions in recent laps to find himself in seventh overall, but he is at the lead of class DB, which is of course for drivers over the age of 60, I believe. James Barwell finds himself in eighth position in the 77 car. And in turn, you'll find a little piece of Mr. Peach in <laughs> ninth. Top 10 completed by the 111 of Grant Gibson. 11th 
is where you'll find Peter Williams. Ahead of 12th place, John Eiley. 13th goes the way of Keith Meisen. And 14th, Andy Chittenden, who takes the victory in Class B as well. Steve Off will finish just behind him. And before you know it, you're down towards the non-finishers, Joshua Needham. And a continuously miserable day, it should be said, for the 34 car who Roger Donnan had issues in practice. He retires from the race with issues once again. We've got drivers, we've got cars, and we've got Andy down in pit lane. Hey, and uh, yes, yeah, so congratulations. It's Josh Law receiving uh, receiving uh, some congratulations himself from uh, from the 76 behind. But Josh Law, uh, very, very good. Uh, uh, congratulations, very good race. That looked really dominant from you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, it, it felt fairly controlled, which is nice. Um, a lot of oil at the end there, which made it a bit more stressful because, uh, you know, you don't want to make any mistakes and stuff, especially when you're in the lead. Uh, it was brilliant, yeah. Just got a good start and then managed to build a little gap and then I just stayed consistent and, yeah, I just tried to not make any mistakes. Anything challenging out there for you today? Any problems passing back markers? Anything like that? Uh, not really. Uh, the only problem was the oil. As I say, there was quite a lot of oil down all the way from coppice through to the chicane. So uh, that, that made things tricky when that came about. But um, other than that, it, yeah, it just felt great. Car was great and it, yeah, it was brilliant. Fantastic. Well, congratulations. Uh, brilliant stuff. And uh, you'll be back out again in the next race? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. yeah. OK, well, we'll see, we'll see Josh shortly. Um, and then I think we've got next up, uh, uh, who came uh, in second. It's Michael Gibbons, who was, in fact, um, who, they're giving his congratulations to Josh Law. So very sporting of you. Do you, do you know each other well? Yeah, yeah. I like to think we're, we're good friends. We haven't fallen out yet. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased for him. He's, um, he drove really well. And um, fair play, he's quicker today. Yeah, and how, so let's talk about your race then. How was it from away from the start and, and throughout the, the, the course of the race today? Uh, I made an absolute meal at the start um, and that's sort of where any opportunity to attack Josh went um, and yeah from there like the uh, this something without well, the handling wasn't brilliant and then like oil and stuff doesn't help with that but um, uh, we can make some changes we'll go a little bit quicker tomorrow and hopefully give him a slightly harder time yeah so uh, you think you've, you've, you've got what it takes to get up and, uh, and start competing uh, on, on the track uh, with uh, with Josh Law Absolutely, it's the, the, the first one we haven't won this year, so um, uh, yeah, I, I prefer being in that spot, so I want to get it back. Well, congratulations all the same. It's a, it's a terrific run you've been having. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm going to try and find, uh, is it Tim Tudor? It's Paratine Sherrington. Did you have Tim in the car earlier on, or are yeah, you yeah. doing it all, all alone? Fantastic. Yeah, we're sharing the car, so we're sort of splitting the qualifying, splitting races, one race each. Fantastic. So, talk to me about the car. Talk to me about how, how it's handling for you today. Yes, the car's run by the uh, University of Swansea Motorsports team. Um, and we've been working together just to try and get that last little bit of performance out of it. And this weekend, we've actually got it to a place where it's doing really what we want it to do most of the time. So, it's, it's good progress. It's good fun. Fantastic. Um, and did you, have any, did you manage to get any battles there at all? It looked like you were on your own in third today. Yeah, I mean, I got ahead of Michael at the start um, and he did a great job. He braved it around the outside at Redgate. I thought he was going off because he had a huge opposite lock all the way around and we were nearly touching and we didn't. And then after that, I didn't quite have enough pace to really push it. And when the oil came down out the back of McLean's and into the um, into the chicane, I was just, it's not my car, it's the university's car. It's Tim's racing tomorrow. Let's bring it home and keep try and keep the pace. So that's why I dropped off a little bit halfway through. Well, congratulations all the same. That must be a very satisfying day's work. Yeah, superb and great, great for the students because they're all working really hard all the time. So well done to them. Well done, the students indeed. They're giving themselves a round of applause right now. I think we're going to try and speak to Richard Johnson if he's if he's around. Can anybody point out Richard Johnson for me? Here we go. Um, Richard Johnson, uh, congratulations. I'm just to make sure that our camera can, can can get hold of you and make sure you're centre centre frame. But uh, congratulations today. How was it out there? I didn't think you interviewed this far back down the grid. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite an um, interesting race. The last few laps, there was a bit of oil down, as obviously they've already mentioned, and it, uh, it did make the next few corners a bit challenging. But um, I just, just, just couldn't catch the front guys, and unfortunately, I had a bit of an electrical issue on the last lap, and I don't know whether I lost a bit of power, but uh, unfortunately, Paul uh, slammed into the back of the car, and we both went off. Um, hopefully, everyone's okay. It's just a little bit of bent metal, but uh, we'll get it fixed for the next race. 
Oh yes, hopefully, hopefully that is a you will get it fixed. Uh, indeed, it's a good-looking machine, so hopefully you can uh, you can take it forward for tomorrow's race. Let's hope so. Thank you. <laughs> well, good to talk to the uh, all these drivers uh, down here in the podium ceremony, and of course Richard Johnson as well. But back up to the commentary box to you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. We are already getting ready for the next one because we've ended up a little bit behind schedule. And as a result, we're getting on with the race meet. This one is going to be the Clubman's Sports Prototype Championship. Always produces good action. The cars are brilliant to look at as well. And another thing brilliant to look at is a, is a Mr. Pete Richens. I bet you weren't expecting that as the intro. <laughs> you are heavily involved with the clubs, let's put it that way. Until recently, you would have been out there with them. Now you're joining us in the commentary box, and it's fantastic you have your expertise here. Well, thank you so much, yeah. So until the end of last season, I would have been uh, competing in this and have done for about the previous 40 years. So, uh, but yeah, now I'm uh, just acting as the coordinator for the championship now, and uh, or chief cat herder, as I like to call it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's going to be uh, a great race. It looks like the weather is going to be kind to us and stay dry. And um, we've got 27 Clubman's cars on the grid for this afternoon. We've lo we lost a couple in qualifying this morning, unfortunately, with mechanical problems. But, um, but I'm sure we're still going to have a, a really good race. And uh, we've got at the front of the field, Steve Dickens is giving uh, our sort of runaway championship leader, uh, uh, James Clark, a really good challenge in qualifying. Let's, let's see if he can maintain that in the race this afternoon. He has done in previous events, to be fair, which hopefully, as you say, he'll be able to, to classify that. The one question I've got for you, because we see varying responses from drivers at times, the slipstream in these, is it a big effect or is it a little bit more minor? Because they go quickly, but they, they've got a nice shape to them. You, you, you can certainly pick up a good toe in, in them because, you know, they, uh, they've got quite big wings, as you can see, so they create quite a, quite a wake. So uh, it, it's certainly possible to get a tow, and uh, the place here where we'd see it is is down from um, from Coppice into the into the chicane. That's the main place you get a good tow, and perhaps do a dive bomb into the uh, into the chicane. That's where they look out for. Is that one of your favourites? The 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 late break, as you as you called it a dive bomb. I, that wasn't our words. That was yours. It certainly was my, always my favourite <laughs> place here. Yeah. We're very much looking forward to this one. The wind's still gusting as well, Pete. The the wind in these, it slicks and wings, we'd expect to have an effect. Is it really, really big or is it sort of, you would rather not have it, but it's okay? It, I think it's more more subtle in these cars. I think uh, this morning in qualifying, what the guys were telling me is that it was quite a strong headwind into, uh, into the chicane and into Redgate. And uh, so what they were finding was they could break pretty late and um, get a fair bit of grip into those two. Um, other people thought it was unsettling the car a little bit in some areas. Other drivers said they didn't notice it. James, James <laughs> Clark, who's on pole, is one of those people who said to me he just didn't even notice the wind at all. It hadn't occurred to him it was windy. So He gives that impression, doesn't he? The kind of driver that he will just get on with it and he will be quick and it doesn't really matter what's going on around him. You mentioned as well, when we were just spoken a moment ago, we do have multiple classes in this. We've got the CSP1s, the CSP2s, the A's and the B's. Could you talk us through what they are, what the difference is? Because to somebody who's uninitiated, let's say, they could look relatively similar. The cars, the cars do look quite similar. You're absolutely right. So CSP1, which is the cars running at the front, the uh, James Clark and uh, Steve Dickens and the like that we talked about, those are cars with uh, 200 horsepower production-derived engines. So they're the, they're the very quickest cars in the, uh, in the category. They'll be at the front. The CSP2 cars, uh, use a, 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 a MG a K series engine limited to about 130 horsepower. It's a sealed engine, um, so that normally gives pretty close racing. Uh, then CSP A and CSP B are the two what we call classic classes. They're for cars built before 1981. The CSP A cars with um, Kent engines, 1700 Kent engines, delivering about 190 horsepower. And the CSPBs with Formula Ford engines so giving about 100, 110, 115 horsepower. So, um, in the previous races, we've had all, all, all four classes often are quite hotly contested, and get, we can get good battles all the way down the field. So, it uh, can make for quite entertaining racing. Your grid will look a little bit like this, however. It will be James Clark on pole. He's the man to beat, and he was the man to beat in qualifying ahead of his 
let's still call him championship rival Steve Dickens. The second row of the grid is where you'll find Adrian Lester and Jared Lester, both stalwarts of the championship in recent years. And row three belongs to Spencer McCarthy and Alan Cook. Seventh place is where you'll find Ben Malik in his Malik, ahead of Michelle Hayward in her fam in, in the Phantom, uh, going from eighth spot. Ninth is Matthew Gauthier Thornton in the Phantom P94, where your top ten completed by Graham Wilson. Row number six is home to Paul Masters and Ian Crombie, going from 11th and 12th respectively, with 13th and 14th going the ways of Sean Hurley and Will Freeman, who tops his class in this one. Barry Webb goes from 15th ahead of Samantha Evans in 16th position, both having very good qualifying sessions between the pair of them, wherefore you find Tommy Ware and Tom Muirhead. Tommy and Tom, that'll be a good one for us to try and stay on top of during the opening laps of this. 19th is Roger Watton, and you're Top 20 competed by Steve Littler in the 56 car. The grid keeps on going. It's a big one for these guys today. Really good to have such a great turnout. It will be Gareth Salter and Mike Upton going from 21st and 22nd. 23rd is Peter Begley and 24th is Trish Hunter in CSPB. 25th is the 46 car of Colin Ralph. Just behind him, you'll find the 26th place car of Brendan Hurd. And that completes it. 26 cars on the grid. A fantastic showing from you guys. I think it's safe to say, you were talking about it earlier, Daunton is quite popular for, to be driving a clubman around. It is. It's a, it's, a, it's a lovely circuit. Lovely flowing track. And, and any circuit that's got some change of elevation is uh, always a favourite with the drivers, I think. So, uh, But it is a, it's a fast circuit with fast corners. Lovely flowing uh, rhythm you can get into. So it, it, it's... I think amongst our drivers, it's one of, one of the favourites that we come to. Talk to me a little bit about Schwantz Curve as well, because this is a corner that in some cars almost doesn't exist. You take it flat and then you're in a straight line braking for McLean's. In others, it's quite an obstacle because you're braking turning left, which could lead to you locking the left front, which of course is then the tyre you want to lean on as you turn right for McLean's. I think um, in these cars, Schwantz Curve is relative, in the dry, anyway, relatively easy. Um, Different cut the fish if it's if it's wet, <laughs> yes. and a, and and also a place where if somebody's actually having a run at you out of old hairpin, and can get alongside you. It can get quite exciting. There, I remember one occasion when uh, another driver and I managed to sort of uh, fill the same bit of road going through Schwann. So it, it can get exciting. But if you're on your own and running uh, running sort of clean in dry weather, then it, it's it's flat and uh, you can get the car lined up okay for McLean's. I like that very neutral way of, uh, of stating you came together and going for the, <laughs> the same piece of road. That sounds to me like the steward gave you a penalty you didn't agree with in that one. That's the, that's the impression I'm getting. Weather-wise... Oh, no, go ahead. No, I didn't get a penalty, no? but I, I, did, um, I did take a valve out the tyre and had a flat tyre. So <laughs> I see. It did I ruin see. my race. <laughs> Weather-wise, we've had all sorts of showers throughout the day. It's still very windy, but we're not expecting any rain now from now through until the end of the day. We've got two more races. After this, we've got the return of the Matt uh, Trophy to try and round out the day's proceedings. But for now, we'll stay focused on the Clubmans. The cars going round on their lap to the grid are actually getting really quite close for a moment there between Steve Dickens and Adrian Lester. I'm not sure they'll have enjoyed that as Dickens almost squeezed Lester onto the edge of the circuit due to his tyre warming weaving. I think that uh, the, the drivers are quite used to coming and forming on the grid and then starting the green yeah. right lap. So it, it may be, although they got told what was going to happen in the driver's briefing this morning, maybe that was that was a few hours ago. Perhaps one or two of them have forgotten what they have said since then. They've been on track in some quite difficult conditions as well since then, so a lot to think about. The tyre warming, we speak about it relatively often from the commentary box, about how important it is, the fact that you need to have the temperature everywhere other than the engine, but of course the energy comes from the engine, so you've got to try and use some of that. But in terms of the technique, is it all weaving here? Or are you trying to heat up the brakes to try and radiate into the tyres as well? Well, the tyres the tires that the CSP1 and CSP2 cars use uh, is, uh, is a control Hankook radial tyre. And uh, it does require a bit of, uh, a bit of warming to get it uh, to work well on the first uh, racing lap. So different drivers have different techniques for warming them up. I mean, weave, weaving is the sort of the fashionable. <laughs> but, but actually, putting a bit of uh, putting a bit of energy into the tyre by getting some speed up and then braking and accelerating is was always my favourite rather, rather than weaving. Do you ever have any nervy moments where you've hit the brakes and suddenly someone wasn't expecting you to on a formation lap? 
it, it's certainly possible. But, uh, <laughs> you, you do need to keep. Uh, you do need to have some peripheral vision in those circumstances. Yeah, yeah the the mirrors of of God of good use. I noticed some of the drivers as well. You spot them when you're watching along on the stream. Some feel not exposed, but their heads out. You feel like they've got a good range of motion. There's a couple of cars out there, particularly a Malik or two, where you're really nestled down inside it, and you you've got the mirrors, but it, not going to have great view of them, so to speak. Yeah, there's one particular driver, a very old friend of mine, Barry Webb, and we, we always do wonder from certain angles whether we can actually see out the car at all. <laughs> look, for, the, for those people of the right age, uh, remember Arturo Mazzario, who was a very short driver as well, and uh, he was, used to disappear into a single seat. We always think Barry's our sort of Arturo Mazzario who disappears in the car, but actually the visibility at these cars is, is, is pretty good. Surpri it would surprise you how, how good the visibility is. Barry Webb in the in the 54. If you get a chance to spot him, he he might not spot you. Is <laughs> the, the takeaway from all of that? The car is just pulling up onto the grid now. To confirm, it will be James Clark from pole alongside rival this year, Steve Dickens. James Clark in that wonderful dark green, almost British racing green, and then Steve Dickens in the the silver and blue car alongside. And behind him, you've got the pair of Leicesters who they both have luminous yellow. Adrian's got a little bit of blue in there is what you're looking for to keep yourself in check, whereas Jared's got some green. So green for Jared, blue for Adrian. There's absolutely no link there, but you'll just have to remember it, I'm afraid, to keep in track with the second row of the grid. The last few rows are just beginning to form up now. We've got a hole on the grid, actually, between the 82 and the 47 cars. That's where Matthew Gauthier Thornton should be, and he's not there. Yeah, that's a. In fact, I can see Matthew right at the back of the grid, so he must have been very late coming out. And uh, I think the rules state if you drop to the back of the field, then you have to stay at the back of the grid. So uh, he's given himself some work to do from uh, pole position in CSP2. He'll have it all cut out ahead of him then, but I'm sure he'll be fired up for this one because he just spent a formation lap at the back of the field. So he'll have been thinking about his task ready for turn one and beyond. We've got the get ready board shown out of the gantry and before you know it we'll have lights on five of them are ablaze engine notes rise and we go racing for the clubmans here at donnington park good getaway from steve deckens james clark looks a little bit average but begins to pull himself now towards redgate as they shift up the gears here comes adrian lester he wants up the size the nodes is twitching but he's got the turn in the thing looks alive and he looks ready to try and make positions up towards the run of Hollywood and Craner Curves in turn. They'll be running themselves down the hill now, swoop from one side of the track back to the other. James Clark is checking out. Steve Dickens did hold on to second from Adrian Lester. Then Jared Lester is coming under a lot of pressure from pretty much everybody behind him at this early stage. Yeah, Matthew goes here, so he's already overtaken six cars from the back <laughs> of the field, so I think he's on a mission, as you said. Good start then from the front Fury on the head. That was Steve Dickens off the road on exit of McLean's there. He was just running a little bit hot and he scoops up a little piece of gravel or two. He'll have a rattle, but no more as a result of that one. He's also dropped a position to Adrian Lester as he couldn't get the power down. And he'll also uh, get a little uh, fix in the box for track limits, I'm sure, <laughs> as well. It's a very topical subject, isn't it? Yes, one of, one of three ticked off, if you like. Quite a, quite a simple way to lose one in amongst all of that. So at the end of lap one, James Clark crosses the line with a humongous margin because we wait, we wait, we wait some more. And now it's Adrian Lester who crosses in second, followed by Steve Dickens, who will want to make up for his own mistake. Jared Lester is sitting in fourth position and fifth is the number 30 car of Spencer McCarthy. A great start from Spencer to gain almost a whole row off the line. Yeah, Spencer's certainly certainly flying. He's a very quick driver. He hasn't done so many clubbing races recently with us, but he's a very quick driver. And in CSP2, it's uh, Will Freeman who's leading that class. Uh, but Matthew Gautier is already up to third in class. <laughs> so, uh, Will, Will's uh, it's his first season of racing, so his fourth ever meeting, so he's, he's been doing remarkably well. He's not finished lower than second in class all year. So uh, keep, keep an eye on Will, but I think Matthew's uh, intent on catching him. Here comes McCarthy around the outside of Jared Lester then. He'll have to do it again at Coppice. Is he brave enough? Yes, he is. Has he got the speed? You know what he might do as he hangs it out to dry all the way along the wrong right-hander. He's not quite going to be able to keep the power in, however, so he'll tuck in for a slipstream and try once again as the time they reach the Robert Chicane. He's not close enough at the Robert Chicane, however. 
is McCarthy. So he'll have to tuck in, try again as they get a good run onto this straight. It is still James Clark out front by a humongous margin of 10 seconds now after two laps. But behind him, it's all to play for. Adrian Lester has the edge on Steve Dickens, who's third ahead of Jared Lester. And in turn, Spencer McCarthy, who's just had to ease his assault for a little bit at the end of that lap to allow them to get through the chicane in a, a safe and controlled manner with 12 minutes still on the clock. Yeah, this is beginning to remind me of this year's Formula One a little bit, so we're, <laughs> where James Clark is playing the role of Max Verstappen and everybody else is scrapping in the long way behind him. It's a surprisingly good uh, assumption <laughs> in this case, and they don't look dissimilar either. We were just saying, at times, some of these cars, they're almost shaped like single-seaters, but with wheel covers on, if you like. That's the way the aerodynamic trend tends to go. Steve Dickens has managed to find a way through on Adrian Lester. That was done down at the old hairpin, and he's immediately attempting to check out from that field and put some progress, not necessarily back towards Clark, but away from everybody else. Yeah, Steve had a really bad first first lap, and um, he's now making amends for that, but a bit late, I think, to think about catching James. So Barry, Barry Webb, who I mentioned earlier, has just come into the pits, which is, uh, which is a real shame. He's having a, having a pretty good race up until then. It is a big shame. He pulls in, and I think it's going to be straight through for him. He doesn't show any shine of stopping thus far, but hopefully, even if they can't get the car out competitively, get it out and make sure everything's okay and use this as a, a truncated test session. If you like a little bit of contact down at turn one, that is not what you want. No, that was uh, Graham Wilson and uh, Michelle Hayward actually sharing a bit of track there, so uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of tire smoke came up. But, uh, looks like they've both been able to continue. Shell was still showing a little bit of tyre smoke as she attempted to lean on that tyre, so the bodywork is a little bit out of kilter, and as a result is rubbing on the tyre. That shouldn't do too much because it looks like it's a very light rub, but again, just something you'd rather not have to be thinking about all the time. Absolutely, um, but uh, in, unless it slows the car down, I can promise you Michelle <laughs> won't let it put her off at all. She'll just keep her foot down. There's been a little bit of a chop and a change behind them on the behind the leaders rather on the fight for third position. It's still Adrian then Jared, but in turn McCarthy's dropped back and it's actually Alan Cook who's looking to get involved now. He finds himself in sixth position on the road and it looks pretty racy in an attempt to make progress up the order. Yeah, and, and Ben Malik's come up well into fifth place, hasn't he? So uh, it's, I mean, that's probably his best race this year for Ben Malik. McCarthy has found a way back through on Alec Gook, making up for whatever mistake it was for him. It was a very slow lap, actually. A 1.13 is around about a second and a half away from what he would have hoped to have done on that particular tour of the circuit, hence explaining why he's dropped so many positions. Yeah, and Matthew Gauthier Thornton has now got onto the tail of Will Freeman for the battle for the lead of the CSP2. We'll see if we can keep an eye on him then as he attempts to get that one done up the inside. That's absolutely wonderful from Freeman. He looked as if he was going to have to yield, but eventually found something on the brakes and he was able to hold it down and towards the bottom of the circuit. Yeah, he's trying to put uh, trying to put one of the CSP1 cars between him and Matthew and Kutu <laughs> so, uh, and which he, which he succeeded in for a little while, but of course he and Crombie in that car has got back past him in the straight line again. And Matthew's trying to join in as well as they go up to the coppers. Here comes Gautier Thornton then, and that is pretty much the textbook's manoeuvre. He got a good run out of McLean's, had his nose alongside Brooke a little bit later, block pass through Coppice. Freeman won't quite back down from that yet, however, I suspect, because he'll get the slipstream and he'll have a good attempt at it all the way down the back straight, running in towards Roberts. Here is your podium battle. It's Adrian Lester from Jared Lester from Ben Malik, who's putting in a very good effort. And then McCarthy still dropping back, actually, now towards the clutches of, is that great? Graham Wilson running just behind him. Uh, Alan Cook is uh, directly behind him, and then and Graham Wilson behind him. Yeah. But Ben Malik is the, uh, the guy who's really uh, catching the other two Lesters. Malik making good progress. What was his last lap like? The answer is a one. Oh, it's a long way away, a 112.9. So he was quicker than the cars ahead of him at this stage, and now he's attempted to make the move. This is the run towards Coppice. He's on the outside. He's not close enough to make that work, but what he can do is rotate the car earlier, tuck himself 
right underneath the gearbox of Jared Lester, the first of his targets as he attempts to wind himself up towards the podium. Adrian's clears some traffic, but just behind him, Jared is going to be very, very defensive. He covers the inside line. Ben Malik swoops by with him and stays tucked up underneath that little bit of slipstream. They're on the start finish straight with seven and a half minutes to go. Ben Malik in the blue car, attacking, 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 an attempt to find fourth position at the expense of Jared Lester. Yeah, this is certainly, uh, as I said, ben, Ben's best race, and he's really sort of uh, getting stuck in there. And uh, I, uh, I know he's done a fair bit of work on the car. I don't know, uh, I don't know if he's done any aerodynamic development because Ben's day job is, is an aerodynamic yes. for the Alpine Formula One team. So um, he may have some clever in there. The underneath it, you go all the vortex generation. Then he's Nick from Enstone, is the is the idea amongst all of that one. Ben still making progress, however. The gap between himself and the car ahead, just four tenths of a second at the line. You never know. I doubt he's got the vortex generation, but a little bit of that wing technology. Make sure you got the plane the right depth and all that sort of stuff. You, you never know. Well, he won't be able to forget what he learns at work, will he? So, no, no. There's been a lot of conversation about that in Formula One as well recently, yeah. with with Aston Martin in particular That's taking right. a lot of engineers from other places. Yeah. Uh, and the CSP2, although Matthew Gauthier Thornton got into the lead, uh, I see that Will Freeman's hanging on to him pretty well. He's only just uh, only just a little bit behind him, so uh, he's doing a, doing a good job to try and hang on there. Here comes Adrian Lester. Jared was having pressure applied to him by Ben Malik. Ben Malik, however, has now dropped back behind McCarthy, so they chop and change all the time, but it's still Adrian Lester with a train of cars behind him, all nose to tail in the form of Jared Lester, McCarthy, Malik, and Alan Cook is there or thereabouts. Yeah, Alan Cook's closing in as well, so it's, uh, I think, I wouldn't say that Adrian's slowing all down, but it's, it's uh, they're all banking up behind him, aren't they? And it's interesting how it's evolved over the day, because Adrian was third in qualifying, on pace, he had that merit, but as you say, he now looks to be around about the sixth of the seventh fastest car out there and could quite quickly come under pressure. It's going to be a case of he needs to hold the inside because as soon as he's on the outside, there's going to be a river of cars running right next to him. Yeah, and, and, and as, as you see in so many races, if you get overtaken in the wrong place when you've got a train of cars behind you, you can, you can lose more than one place. You can lose like two or three places in one go. Through they come then. This little battle is occurring at McLean's. That is going to be the 10 car, and it's Thornton, isn't it? Gautier Thornton attempting to make a little bit of progress through traffic because he knows that Freeman is still there and thereabouts, actually. So if he gets held up, if he makes a mistake, if he dips a wheel onto the grass, the jeopardy is still there for Gautier Thornton, despite how quickly he carved his way through the field. Personal best lap that time through for Adrian Lester in third overall. That's exactly the kind of response he needs to the pressure coming from behind. Yeah, so, and, and Adrian is certainly having one of his best races, uh, certainly this season, so he's, uh, he has had his problems with reliability, but this time, I'm touching wood, it's all hanging <laughs> together for him and he's putting in a really good race. Spencer McCarthy, it should be mentioned as well, we've been speaking about him a lot with reference to this kind of top five overall battle. He is, of course, leading CSPA, so a good effort from Spencer. Oh yeah, Spencer's got a good lead. Uh, his closest challenger is Paul Masters, who's a, who's a few places further back. But uh, Paul going well too, but uh, but Spencer, yeah, well well ahead of CSPA. And Tom Mew ahead, uh, back in 15th overall, is, is in a good lead in CSPB as well. Uh, Tom, Tom has won he could almost be as dominant as James Clark is in not won one race this year, so uh, James has won every race this year. James Clark is absolutely dominant here as well, it should be said. He's lapping at least a second, almost two seconds a lap faster at times throughout this one. And this is now like for like against Steve Dickens. Mind. Dickens has freed himself of the traffic. He's making good progress and he cannot match the pace of James Clark. Here comes a run from Ben Malik. He's going to be put to the outside of Spencer McCarthy. Malik's late on the brakes. So he'll swoop round. He's got his nose ahead. He's got his door ahead. He's almost got his head ahead around the outside of Redgate. Brilliant from Ben Malik. And now eventually he can try again at the Leicesters where he's been attempting it one or two times throughout the race up till this stage. Yes, it's, it really is a cracking scrap, isn't it, for this, uh, this third place. So, uh, Ben's really getting stuck in there. Coming, coming back to James Clark, I did ask him why he left it until the last lap to get pole in the qualifying. And it, what he told me was that uh, he was having a job getting a clear road, and also they got the car set up for the wet, and they just put the slick tyres on at the last minute, so I didn't didn't have the good feel for the car, it was clearly set for the dry now. And, uh, it's what, uh, huge, isn't it? Huge. Yeah. Yes. 
good pass there from actually that was going to be I think Ben Malik getting up the inside of Jared Lester at Coppice we'll have to wait and see whether he's managed to hold on to that by the time they get to the end the answer is no of course he hasn't he must have run it in a little bit deep as he was late on the brakes McCarthy's lurking all the time as well and Steve uh, not Steve Dickens Alan Cook rather in the 17 machine he's there or thereabouts at the back of this he's got those wonderful martini colors at the front of his machine but he's not quite quick enough to get involved with all of the scraps that are happening meters from the front of his machine. Yeah, it looks like he just could get in on the action in the last lap or so, doesn't he? You know, he's yeah. pretty close to Spencer. He's lurking, if you like, that's what we say. He looks ominous. <laughs> lurking. I'll tell him he's a lurker later. <laughs> <laughs> well, do not put my name on that. That's, I, I'd like to be able to arrive at the circuit tomorrow without, with my windows down. That's the idea. Uh, up, once again comes Ben Malik. He's still attacking. And you can see he wants to apply pressure to Jared Lester. However, he's aware of Spencer McCarthy behind. Because McCarthy, at every corner, positions his car as if he's about to try that that late breaking manoeuvre, it's not quite a dive bomb, but it's there and thereabouts, and as a result, that has to be respected, so Ballant can't all out attack Jared Lester, and Jared Lester does the same with Adrian Lester, and they stay bunched together with under two minutes on the clock. Yeah, at the moment, Adrian seems to just keep tied a bit more of a gap, doesn't it? From the behind him, he's, he's uh, allowing him to just get out of their uh, clutches. James Clark was 30 seconds clear at the line last time through, which is absolutely astonishing. This time through, I think it could be even bigger, if we're being honest. I think this is going to creep up by a huge margin. Here comes Ben Malik, attempt number 322 at getting past Jared Lester. He's trying the outside at Redgate once again. He's trying the outside at Hollywood, and he's going to make that one work. Carries the speed. Ben Malik finally threw on the first of the Lesters. Now he has his eyes set ahead. He's going to have to cover off potentially in towards the Old hairpin. He's aware of that one and immediately onto the tail of Adrian Lester. He's got the opportunity now with a minute on the clock to make the move, but he has to catch Adrian Knapp and he's got to get him quickly. But Jared's not giving up either. He's getting no. uh, getting up alongside him as they come into McLean. Oh, no, but Ben's, Ben's actually got alongside Adrian now. I think he's oh, there's always a bit of a touch there. There's some smoke coming up. They rub, oh, they yeah. rub tires, they rub bodywork. Yeah. And <laughs> it's Jared Lester who's come through on the pair of them. Yeah. Ben Malik. I'm not sure that car looked very healthy at Coppice. I hope we get another shot of that before too long because that was a long rub. You, there was an initial touch and then they just glued together, which is rare to see in this sort of car. It, it, very unusual and uh, it, 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 like you, I, I've got a suspicion that Ben sustained a little bit of damage there and uh, had to drop back. Across the line comes what remains of that battle for second, for third rather then. It is going to be Jared Lester at the head of it from Adrian Lester. So the pair of them survive, but we still wait eventually for Ben Malik, who comes across the line in seventh position and doesn't look quite so racy as he did a moment ago. Where is your race leader? He crosses the line and takes the checkered flag here. So it'll be James Clark who takes the checkered flag. He wins the race with a humongous margin and will try to find this battle for second on circuit because it will be playing out all the way to the line. Third, rather. Yeah, I think um, James's objective now is to win every race in the uh, championship, which is apparently something which hasn't been done for 20 odd years in any championship in the UK. So uh, the last person to do it, I think, was Johnny Molam in the Porsches. So, so, <laughs> so that, I've told everybody that's his objective now, so he's got to try and do it. Steve Dickens crosses the line second, and we had enough time for a whole conversation between first and second getting to the line. Then we wait for Jared Lester. Jared will approach the line in the 68 car and takes third overall. A very good performance for him, despite, let's be honest, being involved in a couple of scuffles throughout that one. Adrian Lester is fourth ahead of Spence McCarthy, who takes his class victory in CSPA. Alan Cook is sixth overall ahead of Ben Malik. We'll have to wait and see what's happened with that car because his last lap was actually not so bad. But it didn't look overly healthy and he, he wasn't attacking, which is maybe what we would have expected to see. No, and, I, and I think Adrian sustained a bit of, dam bit of damage as well because after that rub, he dropped behind uh, his son Jared too. So I think that, uh, that probably didn't do either of them any good. Confirmation of your order will come in just a moment, of course. We're waiting on the last couple of cars to come round. It also gives uh, Andy a good chance to leg it down towards the Park Fermi area where he'll be acting as a, as a human stop sign to try and get some cars in for interviews. Has he managed to get James Clark? 
I think he has actually. Clark was a little bit slow in noticing, but he's pulled off eventually, so we should have some interviews in a moment or two. But first, confirmation of the result. James Clark takes the overall victory in his Phantom PR22. And of course, with that comes CSP1 class victory. He was ahead of Steve Dickens and Jared Lester to complete your overall podium. Adrian Lester was just off of that after his scuffle on the final laps, ahead of CSP A winner Spencer McCarthy. Then you're looking down at Alan Cook, Ben Malik, who was involved in the scuffle. He lost out a lot. And Mathieu Gauthier Thornton, who wins his class as well, of course, that being CSP2. Then you've got Wilson and Masters. Crombie taking CSP1, just outside of the top 10 at the flag, actually, which is a little bit of a shame for him. Then you'll find Freeman. He put up a good fight against Gauthier and Thornton, but Will didn't have anything to offer come the flag. Where Muirhead takes CSP B honours as well, as well as 14th on the road, which is quite good for a CSP B car, I reckon. That's a very, very strong effort from Tom Muirhead. Watton, Hurley, Upton, Salter, Evans, Littler, Hunter, Ralph, and then those that didn't reach the finish. Begley, Hayward, and Webb, who we lost to a mechanical, which is quite a shame. I can see that Andy is down there in pit lane. I can see James Clark's car, and I presume James Clark is standing right next to you. I'm down here, yes, indeed, with uh, James Clark. Uh, the, perhaps the only thing you've done wrong so far today, today James, is missed the podium uh, place to park. But congratulations, what a great win. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, just sort of, we knew this would be a good track for us because the car's so good in the high speed stuff. and. Um, he yeah, had a little bit of a drama with um, starter motor in the uh, in quality, so the team did a good job to get that fixed um, and get get a couple put together to sort that. And um, but no, it's mega. Just sort of tried to go hard at the start, try and get a bit of a gap over them, and then once you've got that gap, you can sort of save the engine, save tyres, brakes, all that sort of good stuff. So um, but no, absolutely brilliant, and just a lot of fun to drive drive these cars around such a, such a great track. Cause it's, you know, it's all all top gear almost. Absolutely, of course it is. It's a fabulous track here, but um, it's not as if this is a new thing for you, though, having a track suddenly suit you. This has been a tremendous uh, start to the season. You, you've been unstoppable. I see Top Cat on the back of your uh, race helmet, but you've, you've absolutely been top dog so far. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, no, it's been a great, um, great effort by the whole team. Um, that's, I think, the biggest thing of it is that, you know, it's great that, it, obviously, it's my name and all the trophies and that records that we keep seeming to get, um, but it's you know it's testament to not just how good the car is and how well designed it is and how well built it is but it's just they keep everyone in the team whether it's obviously boss man alex chris ian engineers like sam everyone they just they never put a foot wrong so when everything's always going well when the car's always right it makes it you, you have the confidence and it just snowballs so you can you know, you keep the, the first race in the year, Don, um, Silverstone was the hardest because you don't know where you are and then you just keep building confidence, you keep getting more used to the car, everyone gets more settled in and it just keeps sort of, you know, it's clicked and um, I know it's a cliche but it's just sort of one of those runs at the minute and just got to enjoy it while it lasts. Absolutely, I mean you're the freshest looking driver I've seen so far today, not a bead of sweat on the brow and congratulations, another win, uh, you're unstoppable so far it seems but uh, hopefully uh, more of the same later on in the, in the championship. Hopefully that's the plan. Yeah, try and keep the run going. And um, yeah, it's a lot a bit of talk about. Obviously, we haven't we've won every race this year so far. So um, yeah, it'd be amazing if we could keep going. But just got to enjoy the moment while it lasts and see what we can come up with. Absolutely. Well, well done. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot for, for, uh, for talking to us, uh, for James Clark there. I'm going to try and get a word here with Spencer McCarthy, because unfortunately, most of our drivers have gone on past the podium interview uh, stages. But Spencer McCarthy, uh, a good race for you overall? Very hectic, yeah. I mean, the class was a little bit underpopulated this week, or this weekend, but um, yeah, managed to have a really good race with some of the CSP1 cars. Um, it was very hairy at times, I must admit. There was uh, tire rubbing and and a little bit of bodywork flapping around. Um, but yeah, no, obviously the the strengths of the CSP1 or A car are, you know, we've got. Yeah, we're lighter, I think, ultimately. So we've got better on the brakes, maybe a little bit more better pick up at the corners. Um, and they're obviously being heavier, they've got to sort of park it and turn it in the corners. So, yeah, no, they've got a bit more power, but it was it was a good balance out there. It was, I was, I think if I got past them, I could have made a gap maybe, but I think my ultimate pace probably improved a bit from qualifying, but they were, yeah, parking it and driving away in the straights and I was just trying to battle around. But there were four of them around me, it was great fun. That's good. It's great to see you smiling as well. So hopefully that smile will stay throughout tomorrow and we'll, we'll see you again uh, to talk to you tomorrow, maybe. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, uh, fantastic stuff. And we'll go back to Tom up, up in the commentary box. 
Thank you for the hard work as ever, Andy. We look forward to having you back up here with me, actually. There are a total of one recovery, I think. I was expecting to see a second in amongst all that, but they must have got themselves back to the pits rather pronto. So just the one recovery happening out on circuit. And before you know it, we'll be ready to go with our final race of the day. It will be, don't go anywhere, it's the Miata Trophy, and it will be very, very exciting. They had a race earlier on, which was amazing from start to finish. We're set to have another one, which ought to be, you guessed it, amazing from start to finish. Now, there will be a little bit of new with respect to this one because we will recall we didn't have podiums after the race earlier on and we didn't actually um, want to confirm the order for you guys that was with let's say a uh, good reason let's, let's put something like that in there because it did end up being amended it put Alex Miller as your victor from John Langridge we thought there was an instance of overtaking under safety car there very much was and so they will start from the front row of the grid in this next race Daniel Parron Smith goes from third ahead of Steve Kite who's very very quick in qualifying Xavier Brook goes from fifth ahead of Declan Lee dock those positions because of overtaking under safety car conditions. Fourth row is home to Simon Fleet and Drew Fletcher in the 26 car. Ahead of the fifth row being Reese Warwick and Chung Chong Ip going from 10th position. Martin Heath, he will start from 11th in his 61 car ahead of Raymond Worley in the number 40 with 13th. Unlucky for some, hopefully not for Jack Hargreaves, who starts from that grid slot, ahead of Alistair Ezum in the 16 machine. Row number eight is where you'll find Steve Rollison with Chaz Allen, who's had a somewhat tumultuous day, but hopefully this one finally goes nice and calm for him. Row nine is home to Alex Wilkinson-Hughes, who's also had a couple of issues throughout the day, and Rowan Lundy, who dropped it of his own accord in the first race. Row 10 completes your top 20, of course, Nicholas Stott and Liam Cochran, and then our guest star, Colin Wills, on his own on row number 12. It will actually be 13 due to the difference in classes and all that sort of stuff. But the 10th the row, the 12th row, row um, with cars on it, if you like, in amongst all of this. Our Miatas are out there. And our very own Andy is back in here. Andy, how are you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Had to uh, had to run after James Clark there, who, uh, who was uh, <laughs> slow to uh, to realise that we wanted to talk to it, to talk to him. Uh, didn't get any of the other podiums, it is sadly. But yes, um, this is um, this is obviously uh, one of the highlights of my day and uh, watching the Miata Trophy. Uh, so can't wait to see uh, how this works out. And um, definitely got to keep that win. Um, but he was docked those places and it wasn't necessarily an overtake more of a lapping situation as far yes. as I understand and the safety cars are slightly less serious but serious all the same of course to, uh, to, to be passing another car albeit uh, not competitively there so um, but it does give us a really, really mouth-watering prospect here to see Declan Lee, who dominated in the first race, starting back, just as John Language had to do in the previous race. It's, it's just this yo-yo effect of these two's championship stories so far. Yes, the uh, the issue with Declan, if you like, it's not phrased as overtaking on a safety car because the car was a lap down. So it is more phrased as a misinterpretation of the yellow flag rules, if you like. It's a bit more grey area, but what essentially what he did was pass a car behind the safety car, which is not allowed, and hence why he will be starting from further down in this one. A little uh, bit of smoke there's a burnout coming. actually from Declan Lee. He is very much ready to get racing. <laughs> He's doing a little pre, um, pre, uh, pre gridding b uh, burnout situation there. Uh, very, uh, very unusual to see at this category of racing. But he clearly thinks it's going to give him something over the, uh, off the line. We'll wait and see. For, from row three here, of course, for Declan. The knock-on for all of this is actually that John Langridge. He was worried about the weekend. He doesn't like the wet conditions. Suddenly, he's got himself a front row start. If there was ever a way to turn around a day of racing, John Langridge may well have stumbled upon it here. A little bit of fortune. We know he's got the pace in the dry. It is dry. We're not expecting rain. I'm not going to say it won't rain, because then you know it will. So mm. we'll say you're not <laughs> expecting rain through this one as the cars pull off onto the grid for what I'm very, very much looking forward to. Langridge on pole. Oh, no, that's wrong. Miller on pole alongside John Langridge behind them. Dan Parrin Smith and Steve Kite, another two potential contenders we for the win. We actually don't have Steve Kite in position. Um, so Steve Kite, I think, has failed to make the grid uh, today. So um, Dan Parrin Smith has row two all by himself. 
A little bit more space. Lights are on, lights are off, and we go racing, get it underway nice and quick here. Great start from John Langridge. He wanted the dry conditions. He's got almost his full car ahead as they run down towards turn number one at Redgate. He'll have to be late on the brakes from Alex Miller. He's going to try it. He's got the inside line. He's got most of his car alongside, so Langridge has to respect that as Alex Miller attempts to pull himself back up, of course. He started from Paul. He wants to lead of the race. <laughs> yes. They're two by two by two. Not onto the arc. Down the crane of curve as they swoop right then left oh. cold rear tires language is sideways Miller is sideways this still side by side language is laces on the brakes he takes the lead into the old hairpin and Declan Lee that burnout clearly worked for him up to third position of uh, passing down Paris Smith as well out, uh, out of the box so um, yeah, these are both Miller Motorsport cars at the front of the field but your your uh, your Erst your your um, championship leader coming into this race meeting and there's the, there's a touch there's a snatch of the brakes from Alex Miller tags the back of John Langridge and that's just going to bring uh, Declan Lee right up into it as they go up the hill and uh, start to turn they're going to try and do this three wide and Declan Lee from row three on the grid is in the lead of the race already I think he's been watching some clips of Ayrton Senna here a few years ago as he attempts to storm his way through the order he does have the lead but he's also got the hounding pack behind him it's a queue of five for the lead then as we get towards the Robert chicane for the first time of asking very very late on the brakes slightly further back I reckon that might have been fleet attempting to make up positions but across the line for the first time from sixth on the grid Declan Lee leads the field it's then John Langridge behind and Alex Miller completing your top three he's got this one hooked up no doubt today Declan Lee and it's Lee versus Langridge uh, round four I think overall yes Fleet did get up there but it looks like Brooke um, is going to be uh, is going to get the nose ahead going into Redgate and Dan Parent Smith has been demoted unfortunately down to sixth place at this stage here we go then, down the Craner curves. Lee has one chance to try and make this advantage stick, and it is no, because the moment there's a slip up, he's going to have Langridge and Miller on him, snapping at his heels, attempting to make the overtake. Further back in the field, there is a brilliant battle developing for fourth position as well, as sideways to the 61 car, and eventually he manages to catch that fantastic from the 15th place driver. That's Heath, and he's done Martin. a great job. <laughs> very sideways um, it turn, turned a, um, a defensive situation into attack just by virtue of sliding the car in uh, managed to avoid contact as well and uh, very very well held knows how to handle these these little mx puppies Parent Smith has dropped a few positions on this. He's sort of the inverse of Declan Lee out front. Parent Smith started up the order. He's dropped three positions, and you're not going to believe this. This is absolutely devastating. Chaz Allen pulls off. John Langridge pulls to the inside because he wants the overtake, and he's got it. John Langridge threw into the lead of the race. He came in as championship leader. He wants to try and reclaim that now as the top three cross the line all as one. It's Langridge from Lee from Miller. Yeah, and that's Alex Miller moving to the outside as the two fr the front runners defend to the inside. Will Alex Miller be able to make a, a, a run around the outside? He's got a good line going here. They'll go hip to hip as they go through the exit of Redgate and into Hollywood. I think Alex Miller might be able to get the nose ahead here. In fact, he's almost challenging his teammate once again. He'll be nervous that he doesn't hit him on the brakes once again. But Alex Miller makes the move in. But it looks like Declan Lee's going to lean on those brakes, lean on the front side. Axel going down into the dip and manages to get that place back again. Again. Definitely has a huge amount of confidence on the rear end here because normally you're worried about that stepping out there that hard on the brakes and turning and downhill but Declan Lee mighty able to get that car stopped he's now trying the outside of McLean's he wants the lead of the race John Langridge says no that means he's wide and Alex Miller says hello he's up the inside is Alex Miller he's pushing 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 he's late on the brakes he's through he's into second <laughs> Declan Lee's back down to third tremendous stuff we thought we had we were spoiled at Anglesey with a uh, two-way battle for the lead we've got a three-way battle for the lead going on here and there is Cochrane moving uh, his 94 and a uh, class car forward as well ahead of the 61 it looks like the 40 um 40 uh, is it the 48 of charles allen is back running again so he had a, a slow moment but he thinks i think he's okay now Maybe some issues finding gears. Oh. John Langridge has got some issues finding the track. He's all the way off onto the grass. Somehow he's recovered that. It looked like he hit a pond at one stage as he tried to get himself onto the black stuff once more. Langridge weaves around to try and find some grip in the tires. Lee weaves around as he tries to defend from Miller, who's still trying to put the nose up the inside into Redgate. Now they sort themselves out and run towards Hollywood. This is going to be a massive lap from John Langridge, else he's going to get dropped by the two ahead. He needs them to start fighting. It's Declan Lee at the head, taking advantage of chaos. Then Alex Miller, John Langridge 
Langridge now a slightly more distant third, almost a second, if not two, back from the race lead. Then keep an eye, actually, amongst all of this on Simon Fleet. Simon Fleet is there in the 55 car in fourth, and he's clawing himself back towards the lead group. I think he's actually just, um, yeah, and, and Parron Smith has just passed Brooks as well. Um, going into reggae, as we saw all of that happening, he managed to uh, to complete the move going through there. But uh, uh, we need to be watching um, these uh, this front battle of the top five because those those three at the front are absolutely pinned to it today. Langridge is clawing him back in, you know, actually. He is slowly hauling that gap back. It looked to be up at about two seconds. It's now maybe one and a half, and we know he's good off the brakes into the final chicane, so it could down, oh. come down more. Your leaders are side by side. It's Miller to the inside. Declan Lee to the outside. Surely he's going to have to yield. Wow. He does. He'll get a better swing, however, through onto the pitch straight, and all of this means that Langridge, one lap after his huge incident, he's back on that lead trio. Absolutely. I uh, was masterful from, uh, from Miller that way through. He managed to, uh, to break really late into the chicane and get a good exit as well. And he, but he's still defending going into Redgate uh, as Declan Lee tries to, uh, to position the car for a cutback. But I think Miller uh, is doing a great job here. And then John Langridge behind him also uh, starting to chase down as, as Declan Lee tries to get the nose in through Hollywood. Not quite a gap there. He looked for a moment as if he was going to force one. It wasn't available. Now, however, lunging, scything through on the brakes. Here comes Declan Lee. He's got his car alongside, but he doesn't have the momentum because Alex Miller, he'll hold it all the way through on the wide, wide line at the old hairpin. It means he's on the curves. It means he's on the power. It means they're still side by side when they get to McLean's. Declan Lee is the inside. Surely there's no way to make that one work for Alex Miller. He'll think about it, and he's not quite able to. So he tucks in behind millimeters between these cars. Here comes John. Language. Here comes Simon Fleet in the blue car with a pink roll cage. Oh, this is just fantastic racing once again. Uh, you've, got, you've got Alex Miller. Did, did such a, a precise un, uh, switch back that time. He actually touched the tow cable on the back of, um, of Declan Lee's car. So um, absolute precision. Declan Lee defends on the way into chicane once. Will uh, Alex Miller see that mo movement and, uh, and think that maybe there's an, an opportunity for a dummy coming in next time through? But as you say, Fleet is right onto this one, making it a four-way battle for the lead of this Miata Trophy race two. And Dan Parron smith has gapped the, uh, the field behind and is catching to try and make this five. At a rate of about half a second a lap as well. Good lap from Dan Parron smith Notably, Alex Miller was deep into the chicane on that lap, so he drops a couple of car lengths back, meaning the lead gap is now six tenths of a second between Declan Lee and Alex Miller. John Langridge wanted to apply the pressure, but thought, you know what, if I ease off, we might just close back up onto the leader again, rather than fighting each other and allowing him to get away. And that's exactly Exactly what's played out around about three or four corners later. It's one, two, three, four, and now five with Parent Smith for the lead of the race. Heading into the old hairpin, several cars getting the tail happy. Our leader amongst them, but also the number 70 of Brook, who are both getting very, very lively going into the old hairpin. Alex Miller has closed back in, though, as they go through uh, McLean's corner, and uh, he'll be uh, trying to push for another overtake opportunity as they approach the chicane at the end but getting the undercut here on the on the corner is the 88 uh, and that is our um our lundy car who uh, was only just recently out um and, and winning in the in the other series but he's managed to get himself up ahead of brooks as well and we wait to see what's going on at the chicane and miller down the inside going for another move here and uh, Managing to get that one tucked in once again. Uh, Declan Lee still all over the shop round behind him, but he's uh, managed to go side by side. He's got the better exit just, but he does have the outside. He's going to try and push Miller to the inside, but that opens the door to a move potentially from Language right round the outside. Language is going to have to, to uh, break super late. He tries to cook back, but he finds the bright blue MX-5 in his apex, and he can't quite make that move stick, but Declan Lee back in front once again. That was almost opportunistic and almost disastrous for Simon Fleet, actually. <laughs> and he put his place. nose to the inside. He ended up having to stamp on the brakes, and he loses the place to uh, Parent Smith. So that's down to fifth now for Simon Fleet. These top five are opening a gap behind as well. It's almost, what's that, six seconds or so between themselves and everybody else led by the, the Lundy car, Rowan Lundy. The leaders are next to each other again. This time it's at McLean's corner. Here comes Alex. He's up the inside. He's deep. So and is John. Declan. John Langridge is going to make it three wide on the run towards Coffers. It's one, two, three. Dan wants involved. Simon Fleet wants involved. Langridge on the inside. Miller on the outside. And it's going to be Declan in the middle. They're all somehow making this work around Donington Park. Park Park Smith, and it's third as well. Langridge who comes out on top. Wow. 
Uh, we'll try and catch that one as they approach the chicane as well because uh, Language managed to get ahead. Dan Parham Smith up to third. This is, um, this is just changing every lap as Declan Lee almost touches the rear of John Langridge that time, but they, so far they've kept this battle super, super tight. We've picked up a penalty here for Colin Wells in the number six, who's uh, in the guest class. Uh, but as they go down uh, and back up the hill towards, uh, towards Redgate, it is... Uh, John Language holding the middle line, and that's a pretty smart place to be. It is. It doesn't defend the overtake, if you like, because there is still a gap there if you want it. It just discourages it. It says, look, if you want this, it's going to have to be aggressive. We're both going to get held up. Do you, do you really care that much, given we're only at halfway? And often the opponent will say, do you know what? No, I don't think that's the best idea. Declan Lee, however, he contemplated the move down the inside of the old hairpin. That wasn't available because Language is late, late, late on the brakes. Then they'll accelerate their way through towards Schwantz Curve. They're past the remains of Starkey's Bridge. Up the Schwantz Curve they go. Try and get yourself set up for McLean's corner. Is there a gap on the inside? There is. If you lock up and send one, he's licked the stamp and it's gone a little bit too far, which is not what happens often with your mail. And before you know it, Langridge cuts back. He's on the inside. He's going to try and pin Declan Lee to the outside of Coppers. Declan Lee says, I know what's coming here. I'll get on the brakes a little bit early. Before you know it, my nose is on the inside of Coppers again with that lovely old switcheroo. They'll be neck and neck, side by side, door to door. You name it, they're doing it on the run towards the Robert Chicane. And down. Paris Smith as well has got great momentum uh, coming up towards the corner here. Declan Lee down the inside. Alex Miller on the inside of Dan Paris Smith as well. And he gets a little bit out of shape on the curb. Paris Smith has to take evasive action. He just holds on to third, but here comes uh, Fleet as well to, to try and get into the mix. But Declan Lee back ahead and in, in front of this race as they go three wide down the start finish straight once again. Three wide then. It's Miller on the inside, Paris Smith in the middle, and Simon Fleet on the outside. Who's the bravest? The answer, of course, it's Miller. He's been doing that all day long. Alex Miller up into third, but now with a significant gap, he's got almost two seconds to close before he's back in that slipstream for the lead pair. Is that the moment where it just begins to split? The other man to keep an eye on here, actually, is Rowan Lundy. Rowan Lundy has put in a good couple of laps, and he's half the gap between himself and this battle for third position as Miller's sideways again at the old hairpin. Yeah, they're just throwing these MX-5s into that old hairpin, and, uh, you know, I think... Uh, one time out of every two, someone is, uh, is, is, is a little bit sideways. Miller perhaps potentially holding up Paris Smith and Fleet slightly here. And Paris Smith launches one down the inside into McLean's and a brilliant, really late move that time. There was actually a hand in the air there, mid-quarter, because I think he was apologizing for just how aggressive that was. He ever so slightly overdid it. But everybody, let's say hello to the number 88 car. That is coming a long way through the grid in this one. And it is, of course, Roan Lundy. Roan Lundy wants to get involved. He's now there in that battle for third. You battle for the lead. Don't worry, they're still nose to tail. Nothing's changed there. It is just about Declan Lee, who has an advantage of, let's say, approximately nothing ahead of John Langridge. It is absolutely tiny that gap but uh, yeah it looks like uh, Parent Smith has let Fleet uh, has let um, Miller back through um, it looked like he was just uh, blending out of the throttle going down the exhibition straight and now as you said before Lundy is right on the uh, on the on the offensive going around the outside of Fleet this time oh and Lundy with the tail way out on the exit of Redgate will have to seed into Hollywood and, and just to try and um, make that move later on but that's not the first time we've seen that car going sideways today. Rowan Lundy is <laughs> putting a mega drive he started 18th Ron Lundy started 18th in 13 and a half minutes. He's found himself sixth and challenging for the final spot on the podium. So a great effort from them. They already find themselves on the run towards McLean's where Langridge is trying the outside for the lead. That's not going to work. He'll have to cut back as Baron Smith got an answer. He did it aggressively one lap ago. This time, smooth and clean. Brilliant from Dan Baron Smith. He's up now into third position. Miller will want to fight back immediately into Coppice, but there's no gap available. Baron Smith driving very, very clean and very, very well. Well. Absolutely. So Parent Smith's results so far this season, a sixth place, a DNF, and then a fourth and a fifth. So he's desperate to get himself onto that podium. And he's now in the provisional podium and clear away at the moment uh, from uh, Alex Miller. Uh, he's trying to unlock a little bit of pace as well and try and, um, and gap Miller and try and secure that podium position. But this race has uh, waxed and waned, but it's back to Lee versus Language again. 
it is. They slipstream down towards turn number one. This is the second lap in a row where their lap times are within a tenth of each other, essentially. It is remarkably close at the front. Here comes Simon Fleet. He was passed by Rowan Lundy just a moment ago. He wants up the inside. Rowan Lundy says, no, you don't. He tries to hang it around the outside. Then the rear gives way. No opportunity for that. Simon Fleet back into fifth, where, of course, he started last lap, and then he's been squabbling with Rowan Lundy all the way through in their attempt to be within the top five. Absolutely. Um, so that's uh, Wells coming through there um, and dropping down the order, at least uh, on our screen. I think that that's incorrect, though. I think Wells, we, we're watching him on screen. He's not going slowly and he's not losing places. So I think that might be a little transponder issue. We'll try and then pick that back up again uh, shortly. Um, but uh, Lee leads from language. Parron Smith ahead of Miller at this stage. Uh, but Parron Smith has not been able to get away from Miller now. Miller will be thinking about this again. He knows that the move into Coppers is available, but it slows you down so much as a duo that it's a last lap or nothing move, really, else you just bring other people into the fray. The one that will be available, however, will be on the run down towards the chicane, because that is exactly what Language is trying. He's been put to the outside by Declan Lee. No opportunity. He'll carry slightly more speed through the corner because he's opened that line up. He's able to take the full racing line, but he can't quite get there. Off the road again, Chaz Allen's day goes from bad to worse. He continues to drop down the order. Slipstream City for John Language. He's on the way towards Redgate. Is there an opportunity? No. This is an impeccable drive from Declan Lee thus far, but you can't help but suspect at some stage Langridge is going to chuck one up the inside. It's just when. The pressure just it will just continually mount here. Whether John Langridge, who uh, will potentially be the slightly more experienced, uh, a slightly uh, sager head on, on his shoulders, will just think, well, if he can pressurize uh, definitely and think that the move's not coming for a few laps and then launch one it'll catch him by surprise but um, I'm not sure Declan Lee's in the mood to be looking in the mirrors today he's been absolutely mighty and monstering this circuit three and a half minutes left to go then as they curl their way through McLean's already still the pressure comes from language they've got a four and a half second gap behind them surely at some stage you've got to go do you know what I reckon that's enough to start a fight here because they're not going to get many laps out of this one it'll probably be two to go by the time they reach the line but it's going to be very marginal between two laps and three laps so keep an eye on this one as they slipstream behind one of the back markers now language will go to the outside oh. Declan <laughs> Lee's almost blocked in he swoops himself back across that was a very, very awkward manoeuvre. Somehow they both get through it, however, and somehow they are still nose to tail. That was very, very smart from John Langridge to, to pull, pull aside and almost, as you say, box in Declan's options, but Declan was just not going to have any of it and said, I'm having this race track. This win's mine today. Two minutes 47 to go as they're crossing the line at the moment, and Dan Parent Smith swoops around the outside. I thought he was opening a gap there slightly, but uh, it was just Miller on the inside. But no, Parent Smith does run wide on the exit of Redgate, so losing a little bit of, of uh, time to the car behind. 10 second penalty goes the way of Colin Wells in this one. He was out of position on the start. And yes. a five second penalty goes to the 73. That is Parron Smith, your podium oh. third place man. He's got a 10, five second penalty rather for, you guessed it, exceeding track limits. A five second penalty for Parron Smith drops him a long way down the order as well. He's going to be at best fifth, potentially even further. That will really hurt, but we did see him wide on the exit of, um, of Redgate. Not under pressure, just, uh, just an unforced error potentially, and that must have been his third strike. Your leaders, they're already through Coppice Corner. Then you get this, well, no longer really bat of the third, but I don't think Miller will be aware of the penalty. It'll pop up on the gantry and that fantastic light board. So you can read it, the option's there. However, you're going quite fast and there's another car meters away from you. So it's unlikely that you'll do that. The leaders now come through the final chicane. The clock is ticking. We're at one minute 30 left in this one. I'm looking for a last lap board, and I don't think it's been shown, so we sh might get two left in this one. Well, our timing screens are saying zero, which does usually indicate that the checkered flag is going to come, but we will, we will uh, keep a close eye on what's happening because uh, it is uh, slightly unclear. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we can barely see the checkered flag from our <laughs> commentary <laughs> position uh, up here, but at the moment, it looks like Lee has just unlocked some pace in this final, in this final uh, section of the race. Language backing out. Maybe it was a mistake. It's not sure, but that gap, as you say, has opened up quite starkly in 
the space of about one corner. So whether conscious or not from Langridge, he is not challenging for second as it stands right now. I think it might have been a mistake because John is immediately back on it. He knows that he has to try and make the progress and he's got to do it now. They're already at McLean's corner. They'll be getting on with this one all the way towards the line now. We'll look and try and spot whether the checkered flag is coming out this time, but it is going to be very, very close. I don't think it's prepared as it stands right now. So keep an eye on this one. Across the sort of back straight is what they're navigating right now. There is 20 seconds left on the clock. The leaders are nose to tail. Declan Lee from John Langridge. Late on the brakes, then nose to tail. It is a fight once more. Langridge showing the pace that he's got. The checkered flag is not there. This should be beginning the last lap of the race. Through we go. Two seconds on the clock. We've got one more, ladies and gentlemen, and it's <laughs> going to be an absolute cracker. Lee at a language as language was able to close in a second in the space of half a lap. Lee looking, of course, for a perfect day here with a double win, um, which would leapfrog him up to the head of the championship, no questions asked at all. And having done this from a from a five-place grid penalty as well will give him massive satisfaction. He looks like he has got the legs on language. He just needs to avoid any mistakes as they as they come through into the second sector. Bottom of the hill then. Oh. Huge moment, Paren Smith. Paren Smith is sideways, he's still sideways, it flicks back the other way, Paren Smith is in the gravel. He wasn't going to finish very far up the order in this one anyway because he's had that penalty, but now he'll find himself stuck and going nowhere. Leaders are at the top of the hill, the lunge is coming from Langridge. Langridge at McLean's, he's alongside this contact, they're both round. Declan Smith is in the gravel. Langridge is on the runoff here. There is going to be repercussions for this one, the first of which is Alex Miller through to take the lead of the race. Somehow, Lee has dug himself out of that one. Langridge is already going. This is not going to be settled until a long, long time into the night. Langridge finds himself now up over Coppa's corner. Where is Declan? Declan sits behind Lundy and Fleet. So he's down in sixth position right now. Your race leader, however, suddenly he was fourth at the beginning of the lap. One crash, two and three crash. Alex Miller through the final chicane. He'll come up towards the line. The checkered flag will be prepared. A brilliant you try for the seven car to pick up the pieces and win. Astonishing, absolutely astonishing. It's Langridge across the line in second. Declan Lee is trying to get himself back up, but Rowan Lundy is on the podium from Simon Fleet and Declan Lee fifth come the line. Andy Webster is going to run down and try to get some interviews, and I would keep the microphone away for the first 20 seconds or so because there's a chance that there's some uh, choice language on the cards out there down in Park Fermi. Everybody else is now coming through to take the, the checker flag, of course, and will confirm the results in a little bit still sideways is Colin Wells. Colin Wells has been enjoying himself out there in his purple Mazda Miata, and before you know it, he's across the line. I reckon every time we've cut to the six car, he's had a sideways oversteery moment. He's had them on turn in, he's had the mid corner, he's had them on the power as well. But what a finish to that race. Alex Miller from fourth position. The leaders, the championship leaders touching each other. That one will go on quite late, I suspect. But here it is, Alex Miller, confirmation of the, the race win. Averaging 83 miles an hour through that one, which in an open top Miazda, I think is absolutely brilliant. The Miata Trophy never fails to amaze, and it never disappoints either. Absolutely fantastic from start to finish. And in just a moment, we shall get confirmation of the results up on the screen. What a race. It's not often I'm left somewhat speechless, but to, right now is one of those days, I think it's fair to say. The race eight of the day, the Miata I had, Trophy. I had no voice at the end of the uh, previous round as well, so uh, don't feel bad, this is Miata Trophy all over. The results look as follows then. Alex Miller is the winner by 5.6 seconds from provisionally John Lackridge and Rowan Lundy. Simon Fleet finished in fourth position ahead of Declan Lee before he found the four car of Nicholas Stott who came from the back of his class grid. Then it was Brooke Worley and Warwick with Dan Parent smith eventually being classified in 10th position. Behind him, it was Fletcher, Chun, Wells, Heath, Hargreaves, Chaz Allen who did take the flag in the end to be a positive end of the day ahead of Cochrane and Rollison. What a race that was. We'll pass down to Andy to get some interviews there. And well, I think a few of the drivers will be very happy, a few of them not quite so.
Thanks for that, Tom. Yeah, um, as you say, an utterly breathless, uh, breathless race. I'm just trying to watch with everybody's body language. Uh, I think it's a bit fair to say I'm pretty sure I know how Alex Miller's going to be feeling. He's just getting the balaclava off at the moment. But Alex, um, what an what a, uh, absolute spectacle that race put on for us. Great race, great race. Really, really enjoyed that. I felt like it was a great start. We had a lot of to in and fro in, a lot of side to side action, a bit frantic, more than I'm used to. So. Love being part of that, but then I got away a little bit. I kind of got back into it, but I was a bit fortunate on the last lap there. Dan, Dan threw it off in front of me, and I didn't quite see what happened to Declan and John. But I saw them both pointing the wrong way, and thought, "Thank you very much. I'll take that." So, Absolutely, you're not feeling bad for John at all, then, as your as your teammate. No, he's had plenty of wins. He'll be all right. <laughs> well, uh, congratulations. I mean, that was an absolute thriller, as as usual here at the Miata Trophy. But um, you'd say slightly fortunate at the end, but you've got to be there to make these opportunities count, no doubt. I'll take it. I'll take it. Put it that way. Absolutely. So. All, week, well, today, all day has been really good, really enjoyed it all day. Great event and uh, yeah, can't wait to come back. Yeah, you were right in the mix as well. So congratulations, uh, Alex Miller, your race winner from the Miata Trophy. I would love to get a word with uh, John Language. Are you willing to talk? <laughs> John, um, John gives me the nod, so I'm pretty sure we're all right having a chat. But John, um, that was a ding dong battle once again. And um, you, were, you were in front, you were behind, you were in front, you were behind with Declan Lee. But talk us through what happened on that final opportunity. Uh, yeah, well, the race as a whole was really, really fun. It's typical MX-5 racing, a bit of pack racing. And then there was a bit of a shake up about mm, halfway through, I think. And then suddenly Declan and I had a lead. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll sit in behind and, and see what I can learn. And I had a big go into the chicane with three laps to go. I thought it was only two laps to go and I lost a lot of space. So I um, had to work quite hard to catch back up. And then on the last lap, I had a good old look into McLean's and then we just came together and, and round we both went. And uh, it's a bit, it's very unfortunate really. We were giving each other a nice amount of space all the way through and uh, that was happened. But the car felt a bit weird after that, but Alex was gone and we just had to get across the line and you know, come speak to you. Absolutely, yeah. Well, look at the pro with his uh, sponsor hat on as well. <laughs> Fantastic stuff, John. Um, I must be slightly disappointing because you were in the mix for the win, but a, a second place is good for your championship at the moment. Um, what, what are your hopes moving on to Snetterton next next time? Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a great series and uh, it's very, as you can see, very competitive. So my hopes for Snetterton are to, again, be in the mix, you know, and have some... Uh, have some close racing and hopefully some success. Oh, tremendous stuff and thanks for the entertainment, if nothing else, but a great, great second place. And let's see if we might talk to Rowan Lundy as well. Uh, Rowan, uh, congratulations. A, a third place a little bit out of nowhere perhaps for you. Yeah, I wasn't really expecting that. Um, DNF in race one, I've got quite good at throwing it off in these races. Um, but yeah, I don't really know. So I got through the, the first gaggle of cars and then I could see them up ahead. Um, and then, yeah, just stuck with them and then went Declan, a bit of luck at the end, but um, yeah, has a lot of fun. You did look like you were having probably the most fun out of anybody out there. I, I think if we were giving out style points in this championship, I think they belong to you. Yeah, it's quite a lively car, or the way I drive it is anyway. Um, but yeah, we were saying before the race, the top 10 was the goal, starting from the back. Um, so yeah, podium's pretty special. Oh, fantastic. Well, congratulations, and we'll see you again in Snetterton. That's Rowan Lundy. That was the Miata Trophy, and uh, all, all of our Saturday racing is done now, today. So join us tomorrow. Uh, I think I'll hand over to Tom in case he's got some results to finish off for you. Thank you very much. We are, as you say, all rounded up for the day. But just before you go, let me remind you of what's happening tomorrow. If you're here at the circuit, there'll be cars on track from 9 a.m. with the Enduro Cat qualifying. And we'll be back with the online stream from quarter past 10. Because from there, it's racing all the way through the day. We've got the clubs back. We've got the Sports 2000s back. We've got the super carts back. And then the Enduro Car 5 Hour. It sounds like something you're not going to enjoy. I can assure you it will be absolutely brilliant. There's laughs, fun, and a brilliant community around that series. It's one I always look forward to. So join us tomorrow from quarter past 10 online. And from around about 9 a.m., you'll have cars on track here at Donington Park. As it stands, however, we say thank you to everybody that's been watching, listening, viewing, spectating, all those sorts of things. Thank you to everybody working at the circuit. And with that, thank you, Andy. We will see you tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody.